and ammo for the station's rifles. He also made it seem like their need for sniper hunting calibers was greater than their need for tactical calibers like the 556 rounds. Here's the kicker. Four panels isn't enough to really do anything. We really need eight panels to run in series, according to the research I've done. Also, I have no fucking idea how to hook them up. However, there are people at the Stig plant who do. Brian also said that if we were willing to trade goods for services, he could have some of the technicians come over with the four extra panels, install them for me, hook them into a building system, and then wire up some batteries in series so I could store electricity from the panels and the generator. Sounds yummy. I'm a little queasy about letting strangers into my home, but I felt that way when a plumber came over to fix my hot water tank at the condo. The other thing is this. I might know the technician that'll come over. They're probably from town here, and there's a fairly good chance I already know them. I'm much more comfortable letting people I already know into the hall. So, noon on the 25th, we meet, and hopefully everything goes well. We said our goodbyes, and everyone here felt it went well. We were all super tired from the long day and night, and we decided that tomorrow we'd get together to figure out what our plan was. Everyone shuffled out in short order, and now here I sit, recording this. I'm excited, for real. I think this is on the level. Tomorrow I'm going to make a few runs down to the gas station and top off all the barrels. We're not low by any means, but I've got nothing else planned, and I'd rather have the fuel on hand in the event we need it. If I can build up the nerve, I might take a jaunt all the way down to the intersection where we're meeting to make sure that it's clear of zombies. After that, we're getting together to hatch our plan for the meeting over an early dinner. Tonight, I think I'm going to say fuck it. I found a bottle of Ambien digging around in the pill stash, and I'm taking one. I'm so fucking tired from trying to listen to that radio all night every night, plus all the shitty dreams when I finally do fall asleep— I just want to black out and get some fucking rest. I hate being skittish and irritable all the time. Pillow, meet head. Later, Mr. Journal. Adrian. January 25th. Well, that could have gone better. Of course, it could have gone worse, too. Ambien might be my new friend, although I really can't afford to take a whole pill. I was a zombie all day yesterday, and I don't want to risk getting mistaken as the real thing and get shot by my friends. Half a pill should be more than enough to put me down. I also realize that chopping it in half will probably fuck with the pill and make me sick or something. I should just not take the pill and sleep like a relatively normal post-apocalypse survivor. Hilarious that I even have the option to take a sleeping pill. Can't even imagine how many people in New York or Paris or Shanghai that are trapped in apartments and or eating rats and drinking leftover toilet water to get by. I eat well, sleep reasonably well, and feel pretty safe for the most part. I need to man up and quit being a bitch, I guess. I up your fucking diaper ring. Yesterday, after I came out of my ambient coma, I made two trips down to the gas station. Patty wound up riding shotgun with me. I decided it wasn't the best idea to go alone, and she said she wanted to get out. Abby stayed behind to take care of Chuck. It was horribly cold out the last two days. The thermometer's been reading in the negatives, which is cold enough to hurt. If you take a deep breath, your lungs literally flare up with pain. It blows goat cock. Patty was nervous about the upcoming Stig meeting, and she was sick of dealing with Chuck's gimpiness. I can imagine waiting on him hand and foot gets old rapidly. Granted, his arm is pretty fucked up, and it's a painful injury to move around with. I believe getting her out helped rebuild her patience. We cleared Auburn Lake Road with the plow on the way down, gassed the truck and all our empty gas cans up, and then we got brave and swung down to where Route 18 meets Main Street. It's a T-intersection with a single building near it. That building is a daycare, which, to be honest, I had no interest in checking it out. The idea of a daycare filled with undead children is just too damn much for me to wrap my head around right now. And you know what? Between you and me, Mr. Journal... I can guarantee that building is filled with undead kids. Whole new definition of terrible twos. I might just burn that one straight to the ground before I go inside it. Zombie children on fire, for whatever reason, scares me less than adult zombies on fire. I know. I'm strange. Patty and I checked around to make sure things were quiet and clear, which it was. 
A quick glance down the main street area told us there were no walking undead, so as long as we made a quiet exit, the meeting tomorrow would be all set. Famous last words. We made note of the places where snipers could hide and double-checked our exit strategies, and then we headed back to campus. Patty was freezing to death, so she called it a day. I refilled all the gas barrels until they were maxed out and went down to the gas station again. I refilled all the gas cans so everything was full again the way I like it and then headed back to campus once more. Fuel supplies have been low enough to make me paranoid. The rest of yesterday was lame. The furnace ran on overdrive all evening and through the night. So fucking cold out. I wound up keeping the heat low and hanging out under a few blankets on the couch downstairs. Watched more Trigun. Thank goodness one of the kids here on campus was into anime. I'll be neck deep in poorly dubbed Japanese cartoons for a year. I guess that's cool. Otis wound up crawling under the blankets with me to stay warm, and he never does that. No ambient last night, and no weird dreams. Two for two. This morning when I got up, I felt pretty good about life, and was pretty excited for the meeting at noon. I ate a good-sized breakfast and assembled all the goods that we were planning on trading at the meeting. I was also feeling generous and threw in a can of green beans, French-cut style, top-shelf green bean, the Cadillac of canned vegetables, if you will. At 10.30, we all gathered down in Hall A. Gilbert wound up showing up at 10.45. Over an early lunch of cereal and reconstituted milk, we went over our oh-shit plan should the meeting go south. I told them all I would rather take Abby and Patty down with me. Randy and Charles are obviously useless right now, and I said that I wanted Gilbert back up here in the event this was a clever ruse to get us out of the campus. In reality, I didn't want him there because if he was trying to fuck me over, I didn't want to give him more opportunity with allies present. Gilbert put up a little protest, but conceded. Charles and his painkiller-fueled days actually put up a pretty big stink over the fact that I was dragging his two women to a potential firefight. He was beaten into agreeing with us through belligerent logic, though. That, and the fact that he was lit like a Christmas tree on Percocet. Thank God for that. He was fucking steaming at me. I grabbed some spare blankets in case we had to cover shit in the back of the truck. I wasn't sure how they were going to bring the solar panels. At 11.30, Patty, Abby, and I headed down Route 18 to the intersection in two separate vehicles. Patty and I rode in the plow, and Abby drove the tundra. Fucking cold again. We had to let the trucks run for 15 minutes to get them warm. My face hurt just walking from the hall to the friggin' door of the truck. How pathetic is that? It's fucking cold this year, and it's been snowing like a bitch. Mother Nature is a mean broad. We left with the same combat loads as if we were going down to the police station. I had the M15A4 and the ladies had their 22s. I wasn't expecting trouble, but there was no reason to not be prepared for it. Of course, with my whopping 100 rounds, I wouldn't be able to accomplish much if the shit got thick. I shouldn't say that. I could do a lot of damage with just 10 rounds if given the chance. Anyway, negative Nancy is done now. We drove the plow truck all the way to the intersection, and Abby sat back about a hundred yards in the event she needed to make a fast getaway. Patty and I parked in the middle of the intersection and waited with the radio on. I think we got there at 11.50 a.m. or thereabouts. It was 12.30 when we heard the rumble of their truck in the distance. Brian came over the radio and let us know they were incoming, and we got out of the truck and waited. They pulled up in a diesel box truck, looked like a 20-footer or so, and had the Stig Company logo on the side of it. Following behind it was a large 4 by 4 police cruiser that used to belong to the department. The cruiser parked about a 100 yards behind their truck, just like Abby was parked behind ours, and the meet was on. Brian and Jason hopped out of the semi and were all grins. I mean, they looked so damn happy. I was grinning too. We shook hands about as vigorously as you can. Patty was nervous as balls, but she was pleasant, and I think after a bit she warmed to the idea of them being here with us. Brian and Jason looked very slim. I think they've both lost 20 pounds easily. You can see it in Brian's face. He looked stretched out and tired. Jason was always a slim guy, but he looked out of gas. It was especially apparent because he's young. I don't know if their thin figures were because they're strict on food rations or if they're lower on food than they've let on. Mm. The front of their semi was covered in goop, bits of flesh and chunks of hair and bone. 
Most of it was still fresh and unfrozen as well, which told me they'd just recently driven through a real mess downtown. That was our first topic of discussion. The icebreaker, if you will. They confirmed that the roads right near downtown were a fucking mess. They took a wide route off the main street going through residential neighborhoods. They were fairly sure that once they were off the main road, it'd be less populated with the dead, and I guess it was still pretty thick with roamers. Luckily, their semi is a beast and has a good ground clearance. The 4x4 cruiser followed behind in the wake the truck made, and they made it all the way to the meat site with problems no more serious than frayed nerves. I thanked them for making the trip out. After that, Brian asked me about why we were downtown the other day when they heard all the gunshots. That was the day we were on the grocery store roof getting the guns. I told him the truth. I told him that we were down at the grocery store to get the guns off the roof of the store and to possibly try and get any remaining foodstuffs out of the store. Of course, with the impending horde heading into the parking lot, we bailed before going inside, but we did get the guns. He and Jason got a kick out of that. Brian was actually laughing and pissed at the same time when he realized that he and his group had totally forgotten to try and return to get the guns. Of course, when they had their huge firefight there, things were pretty messy at the time. And after they left with their food, there were still survivors there shooting at them, as well as a growing population of undead from the recent deaths and whatnot, so I'm sure they didn't have all the information I did. When I got there, everyone was dead except for, what, two or three people? The irony is that if I hadn't killed that shooter on the roof, they probably would have been killed by the three dead friends that I found as zombies up there. Weird stuff. Brian thought we made the best choice by getting the hell out after getting the shit off the roof. Then it got weird. He asked us how we got in, got on the roof so fast, and got out. I told him we'd raided the municipal station for the fire trucks and radios. He did not like that. At first, he was all like, what did you do? You took the trucks? And thought I was joking about it. But I told him we needed the ability to fight fire, and I knew I'd need the ladder truck to get on the roof, And plus, I wanted the radios to communicate with, and that sent him into a little bit of a temper tantrum. At one point, Patty and I backed away he was steaming so bad, and Jason had to pull him aside and calm him down. He didn't get aggressive or threatening, but he was pretty clearly pissed we'd taken the fire trucks. After a ten-minute relaxation period that was as flat-out awkward as a fifth-grade dance, Brian came back and apologized. He admitted what I'd done was smart, and he was a little pissed he didn't think of it first. He also said it was a little straight-up asshole of me to take town property. His line of reasoning was that the equipment was town property, and with so few people at my location, it made more sense to leave the fire trucks in town where they were more accessible. And don't fucking think for one second that I didn't catch his with-so-few-people line. Starting to think he knows exactly how many people we've got fucking Gilbert. I see his logic. I just don't agree with it. I agreed that, yeah, it was a little greedy of me, but he had to realize that up to that point, I had no idea there were survivors anywhere near here. Plus, as I'd mentioned earlier, we'd had negative interactions with what few survivors we'd seen, and I was worried we'd be firebombed at some point. Plus, and this almost set him off again, I flat out told him this. Brian, This town is dead, deceased. There is no more town. There is no more state, and there is no more America. It's like the clock got rewound back to the 1100s, man. We're feudal lords fighting over land and resources again. It sucks, but that's the fucking reality. Only the strongest survive, right? He got pissed again, but he knew I was right. I also told him that, without him and his men, who knew what would have happened to the people at Stig? Without his expertise and leadership skills, those folks might have died a long time ago. He was a good person and had a lot to be proud of. I told him that eventually we might be able to get the equipment back into town, or maybe someday we could figure out a way to stage the equipment again so both groups could have access. I didn't want to fight over this. He was fine after a bit. I think he isn't an intellectual and hadn't put it in perspective. Plus, being a town official, I'm sure for years his guiding principles were town, town, law, law, order, order, you know. He's upheld the law for so long, it's his first instinct to preserve the old ways and to hope everything goes back to normal. Naive, really. This is normal now, and 
We have to adjust to it or die. We made the swap for stuff. I handed him the rifle, the ammo, and a milk crate with all the food. I even made sure to point out the extra can of green beans to him as well, which got a laugh. He said they'd had plenty of the Cadillac of canned vegetables. I laughed. It definitely helped with the tension. He and Jason got the solar panels and the boxes of 556 out of the truck. The panels were still packed in the shipping boxes, which told me they still had a warehouse full of them to trade. I made a mental note to make sure that any trades involving just panels would be done heavily in my favor. If they aren't using them and they have so many left over in their warehouse, then I don't need to give up an arm and a leg for them. Now, expertise on installing them, that's valuable. We got them in the back of the plow truck, and that was it. We'd spent far too damn long outside in the cold already, and we knew it was getting too dangerous to stay here. He suspected they'd led an army of undead in this direction, and he wanted to get turned around and back before the horde reached here. I shook their hands, Patty shook their hands, and I think there was genuine satisfaction on all parts. Other than Brian getting steamed over the fire trucks, it went perfect. We agreed we'd talk every other day at 6 p.m. and that someone would leave the radios on at all times in the event something went wrong. We also tentatively planned that we should start doing face-to-face meetings once a week where we could do trades or share a lunch or whatever, basically just building up solid diplomatic relations. Two kingdoms breaking bread, right? And that was it. We got in our plow, they got in their truck, we turned around, they turned around, and we all left. Abby followed us home, and when we got back to campus, we had another mini-celebration. Gilbert was positively elated we got the solar panels and that we'd kept it civil after hearing about the argument. He patted me on the back quite a bit for keeping a level head. I wanted to snap his arms and call him a traitor, but I didn't. I still need to figure him out. Gilbert and Charles decided that they were going to make us a dinner, so we went to the cafeteria and got some extra food for the occasion. Abby and I got the solar panels stored in there as well, as it seemed as good a place as any for the moment. Randy and I threw down some serious Xbox action, and the two elder statesmen got us a decent meal together. It was an early dinner, but it was nice to celebrate again. Seems like we're doing less and less celebration, and more and more arguing, bickering, and potential backstabbing. Maybe I'm just bitter. Look, Mr. Journal, it's Negative Nancy again. Can't get rid of that bitch. After our late lunch, early dinner meal, we called it a night. I felt we had had enough socialization for the moment, and I headed back to Hall E. You know, it's weird. After getting some decent sleep, I noticed I wasn't skittish at all. I even started to think I was a weirdo for the whole watch-tapping zombie thing. I mean, shit, it could have been a complete coincidence. Spasm or something in the zombie's hand, right? Plus, the zombie would have looked up when it noticed me anyway, right? Right? So, for the first time in a long time, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow or the next day. I just redid all the fuel tanks, so that doesn't need to be done again for a few days. I don't have anything to do here in Hall E other than maintain my flourishing little indoor garden. I think I'm two or three weeks from some decent tomatoes, by the way. I'm actually feeling like we should clear some more houses on Route 18. I know they're spread pretty far apart if I head west towards Westfield, and it might be a good idea to just get them clear and empty. Peace of mind. Plus, who knows what the hell might be in the houses. I noted earlier today that the cafeteria food supply looked pretty well beaten up, so I definitely think we need to obtain more supplies. We're not even into February yet, and the food is looking like it might be a problem. The more I think about it, the more sense it makes. I could even use it as a training opportunity for Patty and Abby. They could probably stand to see how I do it in case I die. Man, that's heavy. Haven't thought about dying in a long time. Changing the subject. Um, might do some house cleaning tomorrow. We'll see. Plus, I think I might start making detailed maps of the area, so I have a better idea of what's where, so I can keep track of shit. We'll see. Adrian. January 27th. Busy as a beaver, Mr. Journal. Feeling positive about things the last couple of days. Strange, eh? (laughs) I guess negative Nancy got her eviction notice, and I hope that bitch doesn't come back anytime soon. Uh, 
Yesterday morning, I awoke having had no terrible dreams. Very nice. I also managed to get a solid eight hours sleep despite not taking Ambien. Really don't want to get addicted to those things. I wound up getting up early, like 7 a.m. or so. Took a quick campus patrol on foot with the bow again and encountered nothing. My paranoia about zombies and watches seems to have faded with a few good nights rest. The temperatures have gone up about 25 degrees. It was in the negatives pretty much straight for about five days. And yesterday morning, it seems to have gotten more tolerable. A balmy 32 degrees in the last two days. After checking and finding that the campus was clean of danger, I swung over to Hall A and knocked. Patty let me in and I sat down in the kitchen. They were getting together a breakfast of some form or another. Chuck's arm looks about the same, but this break is a slow healer, so that's to be expected. Randy was actually reading a book, which floored me. Of course, it was manga, but hey, it has words, and it isn't the Xbox. I asked the family if they felt like going on a jaunt with me later to check on and possibly clean out some of the houses on Route 18. Chuck had just taken a painkiller, and he was in and out, so he put up no fight. Patty and Abby were both kind of on the fence, but I sold them on the fact that it's like 30 degrees warmer outside and there might be food or supplies in the houses. The icing on my cake was that I wanted to take them out shooting with a new set of guns, specifically 9mm handguns for them. They were fucking all about the gunplay. I told them to meet me at our middle-of-the-road shooting range in half an hour and we'd get some trigger time in for them. I hoofed it back to Hall E and scraped up the two most appropriate 9mm for them. I grabbed the new Beretta 92F and the Smith & Wesson 952. Decent capacity handguns with a little more stopping power than 22s. I wanted to get them into handguns we had spare magazines for. I didn't want them to bite it when they were putting bullets in an empty clip. I grabbed 40 rounds of 9mm and headed down to the range. The girl showed up just as I was putting up new sheets of colored construction paper for targets. We went through the same basic instructions, skipping the draw and fire one-shot deal. They're experienced enough now to just load the magazines themselves and start up. We did, however, work extensively on magazine swaps once the girls picked the handgun they liked. They both wanted the Beretta, but it's a little lighter than the S&W, and plus Patty would be using the TAC-22, so she had more magazine changes available to her with that. The Beretta has three magazines, and the S&W just two. Man, that was rambling as all hell. Abby got the Beretta, Patty got the S&W. Short version right there for you. They performed as I'd expected, which was very well. Once they got over the slight fear of firing a bigger gun, they were fine. Most people don't realize there's damn little difference in the lower calibers in terms of recoil and muzzle lift. The girls could probably even step up to a heavier forty-five soon. We've got spare clips for the Colt 1911s now, and if 9mm gets really low, then we'll think about it. I gave them the guns, the spare clips, and a box of 50 rounds of 9mm to load their magazines with, and we agreed to meet at the plow truck at 10.30, and we'd head out to find some trouble. I got my standard load for gear, plus the 12-gauge master key in the truck, and we packed into the bench seat, trucked down to Auburn Lake, and dropped the plow blade to make a path to the houses we wanted to check out. Maybe half a mile down Route 18 headed west, there was a house on the left. After that, we saw four more houses within another half mile, then a pretty barren and empty stretch of road that winds its way up into the hills. That's the direct route to Westfield, where Sean and his fuck rags came from. We started at the end and worked our way back in the direction of the gas station. The end house we started at was a raised ranch similar to the style of houses on Gilbert's unfinished cul-de-sac. About two or three hundred feet down the road were two more houses, directly across the street from one another. We made a deal that we'd clear those three houses and call it a day. I showed the ladies how I'd been clearing the houses, park, honk, holler, wait, etc. I gotta say, having the two women handy made things go much faster. We could clear out the exterior and check windows for activity much faster for one thing. After we did our honking and noise-making, we checked the outside areas for movement and checked all the windows as well. We saw nothing in the house windows, and after a few minutes to make sure, I kicked in the front door of the house. All three of us worked house-clearing tactics together. I was on point with the 12-gauge, and girls came in behind me with their 9 millimeters. It was nice having my back covered. 
House was a split ranch, with one big floor up a half staircase, and the basement lower floor below. Abby held the foyer on the stairwell while Patty and I cleared the basement. All was clear there. When we returned to the stairwell, Patty took the door, and Abby and I cleared the upstairs. Fortunately, the house was empty. Freezing cold, of course. The basement was a wreck due to the pipes busting from the cold. I suspect we'll be seeing a lot of that right now. Once we had the house safe, we proceeded to clear the bastard out. Of course, I'd forgotten that the back of the plow was filled with snow, so as the women searched the house for supplies, I dug a shovel out of a closet in the house and shoveled the truck bed empty. By the time I was done, the girls were finished tossing the house. Mr. Journal, there is a downside to bringing women on a house cleaning duty. They take everything. I mean, everything. They took the drapes, the throw rugs, the shoes, the rubber gloves under the fucking sink they plan on using to clean out the toilets later on with, and the dish drainer. It was like they were moving and didn't want to leave a single thing behind. I literally laughed out loud as they took armload and box one after another to the truck. Just laughed. I suggested that we didn't need to take all that shit right now. People wouldn't be stealing drapes and dish strainers if they were scrounging for food and necessary supplies. Just more shit to store for the meantime on campus. Once we got all their fat loots loaded on the truck, we drove down the street and parked in between the next two houses. We knew we had trouble as soon as we got out. The house on our right was an L-shaped ranch. The house across from that was an old-school colonial box house. Must have been a hundred years old at least. It had a huge driveway with about six cars in it. When we got out of the truck, we could see in the windows of both houses there was undead scratching at the windows. Two undead per house, actually, and all four were beating on separate windows. We made a quick plan to take down the undead right through the windows in the ranch first, but when the girls lined up to take their shots, we heard glass breaking from behind us, and we started scrambling. I told the women to take their shots, and I'd deal with the glass situation. I took a quick look in the colonial's yard from behind the hood of the truck, and I saw there were two zombies stuck in the snow. They'd managed to break the ancient-ass glass in the house and tumble out into the snow. Now, mind you, we've been just shelled with snow this winter, so the snow is easily two feet deep. The two zombies were about thirty feet from the road, so I knew I had some time. I unslung my rifle and rested the M-15 on the hood of the truck. One loud crack later, one of the zombies was poofed into the snow, and just the one was left. I put the rifle on the hood of the truck and got the sword out of the cab. I heard about four gunshots from behind me as I sat and waited for the zombie to get across the yard through the snow. Honestly, it got kind of funny when Abby and Patty came around to watch. We stood there as this emaciated old man zombie trudged one inch at a time towards us, skinny arms extended, teeth snapping away. Once the schleppy Methuselah was about three feet from the edge of the snow, the girls backed away, and with one giant-ass sweep of the sword, his head got chopped in half across the bridge of the nose. Dude was so old, I swear I saw dust fly from his brain pan. He went down into the snow like the first zombie. Here's where it got hairy. We'd spent so much fucking time watching George Burns come at us, not one of us was paying attention to the ranch behind us. A third zombie from that house had come through a broken window and made its way all the way around the truck, and it tackled Patty. She screamed bloody murder as this teenage girl zombie took her down into the snow. I wish the fucking dead people made more noise, Mr. Journal. Irritating that they're so friggin' good at being sneaky. Patty's a pretty tough bitch, and with Abby right there, too, we managed to grab a hold of the shoulders of the zombie and yank the motherfucker off her and toss her into the snow. I dropped the sword when we rushed to help Patty, so I went to pick it back up to finish off the zombie. When I turned to deal with the ambush, her Abby was already standing almost over it, and she put one round into the teenage girl's forehead, executioner style. <laughs> Hardcore kid. I got Patty up, and other than a nasty bruise on her elbow and a shit smear in her panties, she was a okay. Crisis averted. We decided to clear the L-shaped ranch the teenage zombie had just came out of. Due to the slightly more violent situation, we were extra cautious. Patty and Abby stayed behind me, and I cleared the ranch solo. It was pretty much open concept, so there were lots of clear lines of sight, 
and the likelihood of getting jumped was mitigated. I found one more zombie in a back bedroom in the ranch. I hate to say it, but it was another little kid. Judging from the size of his body, he was about five years old, and he was skinny as a rail. Distended belly and bulging eyes, too. Looked like he'd starved to death a long time ago. I got to wondering how that happened, and I think his parents and sister might have been bit, and they locked him in the bedroom to keep him safe. No way of knowing. That's one thing that pisses me off about all this. I never get any fucking answers. Just more and more questions. I wound up having to blast some buckshot through the door to kill the kid. He had the door barricaded, and when I knocked on it, I could hear him scraping and scratching on the other side. One blast at belly button level, and I'd ended his threat. Once I'd checked everything, I started to head out, and just as I started to leave, I heard more gunfire from outside. Patty and Abby were engaging a small handful of undead coming out of the windows of the Colonial. I think the count was about nine zombies. I sprinted the fuck outside, putting a fresh shell on the Mossberg, and announced my presence behind them. Abby and Patty were standing at the truck using the hood for stability, and were calmly and cleanly taking their shots. Luckily, actually smartly, Abby had been facing towards the Colonial, and Patty had been watching the door of the ranch. They had plenty of warning when the undead started to come out, so they were able to stay ahead of the front edge of the pack. I think they took about an even number of shots between the two of them, and I wound up just watching from the flank, making sure they weren't attacked from behind. The girls handled all nine zombies about as perfectly as you could. I was like a beaming father. Once they dropped them all, I waded into the snow to make sure they were all dead. A little nerve-wracking to head into two feet deep of snow with zombies hidden in it. However, I walked slowly, and the bodies were all successfully shot in the head. Definitely proud of my girls. Before we ransacked the ranch, we cleared out the old colonial. I tell you what, giant fucking place. Two very large floors and a full rough stone basement. Solid twenty minutes of narrow hallways, locked doors, cobwebs, and the nasty-ass smell you get when too many people try and fit into one place for too long. Judging from the dozen of undead we had, it was probably an extended family that had tried to batten down the hatches to weather the storm. God only knows what went wrong. Once everything was clear in that house, we tossed the ranch. This time I told the ladies to calm the fuck down and only take important or immediately usable shit, not just taking shit because it was free. They didn't listen. Not one word. Too many neat things to take, and once you teach a woman how to shoot with a 9 millimeter, there's no telling them anything. <laughs> Team Vagina has asserted itself. Oh well, I covered them from the street as they took everything out, and they took everything. I was surprised to find that, despite having ten-plus people in it, the Colonial had a really ample supply of durable foods. In their rickety stone basement, they had a lot of mason jars filled with jams and preserves that looked homemade, which was really nice. Too bad we don't have any fucking bread to put it all on. They did have lots of soups, tuna fish, peanut butter, and spam, and all that other shit, so in terms of food, the Colonial was well worth the trouble. The ranch had next to nothing in it worth taking. I think those people lasted some time, and they depleted everything we would want. We did get some new movies and music, though, which is good for maintaining morale and keeping our boredom in check. There were no weapons other than melee weapons, and no tools to speak of other than a new chainsaw in the colonial shed. Oh, they did have a five-gallon gas can with fuel in it, which was pretty cool. We called it a day after that, leaving the last two houses for another day. Our original plan was to hit them today, but we wound up tuckering out after we got everything back to campus and unloaded. As I said, the ladies took everything. It looked like the Beverly Hillbillies when we were coming back up the hill to campus. Abby said she wasn't feeling well at all, and she rubbed her tummy and said she had cramps. <laughs> ruh -roh. Makes me think about how many feminine hygiene products I've left behind. What happens when all the tampons and pads go out of date? Should we start looking for wine corks or spackle or something? I let Patty take a bunch of the new food as a trophy into Hall A. Didn't need to store it all in the cafeteria, and I think it really did help her confidence as well as Chuck's when she came in with a big armload of food. It's a tangible reward for the risk, and having Charles know that what we're doing has benefits is important. Plus, as it turns out, 
Chuck is into fried spam, and we got several cans of it. The rest of last night I finished watching Trigun, and I cleaned the weapons. I've been doing all the gun maintenance myself. Eventually I'll have to teach the girls how to do it so I don't have to clean their shit, but like I said the other day, I do enjoy cleaning the weapons. Slept fairly well, had a bit of a hinky dream about Cassie. She was being all weird and standoffish in the dream. It was another one where it was like she and I were living together in Holly, like I'd saved her that day or something. It wasn't a bad dream per se, but it certainly left a strange taste in my mouth. As I said, we decided to shit can going out today. That was fine with me. I did my two campus patrols on foot with the bow and even got up the gumption to make some trips to the gas station again. The plow fuel tank was low as well as the tundras, so I made sure that was all topped off. Such a pain in the ass to drive off campus. I've got the vans parked forming a blockade, and every time I leave, it's back up a van, get out, back up the other van, get out, drive truck through, get out, move van back, get out, move other van back, get out. Such a pain in my ass. I wish I had something a little more effective and easy to move. I might want to find a single semi-truck to use as an obstacle or something. I also took the time to check out the heating oil tanks for Hall A&E. They're definitely getting low, and we'll need to address that within a week or two. Luckily, there's a shitload of home heating oil all over the place. Almost every house has like a 250-gallon tank in it, and I bet I can get a shitload just on Auburn Lake Road. Siphoning it might be a bitch, but I'll figure it out. Brian and I had our official radio call a few hours ago at 6 p.m. again. First thing he said was that he was sorry for acting like an asshole at the meeting the other day. He admitted he was wrong and that we had just as much acclaim to the fire trucks as they did. First come, first serve. He actually made a good analogy with hunting. If I come on your land and kill a deer, I deserve to eat it. Whether or not you have five people, ten people, or a hundred people, I did the work and it's mine now. I told him I understood, and we dropped it. I think he was genuinely sorry, too. We bullshitted and exchanged some stories about the good old days before the world shit the bed. You know, when he arrested normal criminals instead of fighting off hordes of the living dead. It wasn't long before we got on the subject of doing another trade. He approached the subject, asking if we could spare more food. I knew right then and there he and his people were probably not as well off as he'd like us to believe. I had him by the short hairs. I told him we could spare some food only for one or two things. We needed more solar panels and the expertise to hook them up to the batteries. We also needed ammunition and more food of our own. If he could pony up those things, we'd be more than willing to trade food. Since it doesn't make sense to trade food for food, really, we wound up settling on the following. Six more solar panels delivered here. 12 batteries to put in series to store electricity and the cables, regulators, etc. to use them. Two technicians along with the panels and batteries and the time to hook up the gear so we have a battery system. As long as the sun shines and the panels and batteries last, we will have electricity. 12 rounds of 12-gauge buckshot and 40 rounds of 556 millimeter. Now, that's what he offered up to me. Here's what I offered back to him in return. Four jars of the jam jelly we'd just gotten out of that colonial house. Four cans of spam. Thirty-six cans of assorted vegetables and soups. Four bars of soap. Two tubes of toothpaste. Four containers of shampoo and one bag of dog food, which I'll get tomorrow from the farm on Jones Road. I remember seeing the food in a closet the dog couldn't open. That or any of the houses I saw dead dogs at, really. And that's it. Didn't seem like a huge price to pay for what amounts to permanent electricity and a pretty big bump in the 556 stocks. 40 rounds is almost a magazine and a half. I'm thinking they got an adult-sized fucking ammo dump out of the police station when they emptied the arms locker. So they're coming here on the 29th to complete their trade with us. We made strict and mutually beneficial rules for how they'd arrive and how many people they could bring, etc., I'm starting to feel good about all this, starting to get the genuine impression we might be able to have a long-term relationship with these people, especially after we get the agricultural thing going in the spring. If we can plant different crops and actually get them to grow, we'll be golden. After the radio call, I ran down to Hall A and talked to the Williams clan. They'd been listening on their radio and were stoked. 
although they thought it was a lot of food to give up. Patty, however, pointed out my little garden was coming out good, and so was hers. We'd be growing food in no time flat, and anything we traded, we could replace eventually. We also agreed that tomorrow we'd hit the last two houses on Route 18, as well as stop and find that dog food somewhere. Come to think of it, that's actually good news. If they need dog food, that means they have a dog. If they have a dog, that means they haven't eaten it yet, so I guess they can't be that hungry. Or it was a bluff. Busy day again tomorrow. Exciting stuff. Talk to you soon, Mr. Journal. Adrian. January 29th. Man, what a whirlwind. We've been super busy here on campus. Yesterday started out with a nightmare, but it turned into a bit of a good thing. Abby and Patty wanted to head back out to hit the last two houses heading west on Route 18 yesterday. I was all for that. The girls were feeling good about themselves. After all, we'd cleared three houses in a day, gotten a really substantial amount of food, and they dropped what? Ten, twelve zombies to boot? That's like a positive on almost every level. I mean, yeah, Patty almost died, but honestly, we had it handled. <laughs> Sounds funny. The girls actually came over to Hall E and woke me up early. Well, they did, as well as Otis, sitting on my chest, slowly kneading me with his little paws. His purring vibrates my rib cage. That's his subtle way of telling me that his food bowl is empty. I think the girls were excited. They were banging on the door something fierce and hollering up for me to wake up, lazy pants. I mean, it's nice to be woken up by two ladies, but I was getting some decent sleep for a change. I skipped the morning shower after letting them in, and I downed a cup of instant coffee. Still not using the super fancy coffee maker I got out of that house on Auburn Lake Road. Seems stupid if I don't have milk to steam. A few snacks later, and I was geared up and we were headed out. I think it was 9 a.m. Just as we were getting into the truck to head out, we heard this terrible smashing noise from maybe a quarter mile away down the Auburn Lake Road. The girls held fast, and I drove the truck to the bridge. Gilbert came over the radio asking what the hell was going on, and a minute later Brian came over the radio asking if we needed help. I told him to calm down. Once I got to the bridge, I saw what happened. Remember those trees we pre-cut for the Westfield ambush? It was a little snowy on the night before the, what, the 28th? And the trees were chock full of snow, and when the breeze kicked up, it took one of them down across the road. Fucking tree falling down. I radioed that we were fine and that a tree had fallen down. I zipped back to the ladies, told them what happened, and we scored a chainsaw and went to the tree. After an hour of chopping the limbs off and getting it cut down to size, we got Randy and Gilbert on moving the fresh firewood back to campus for splitting. Crisis turned into supplies. <laughs> Yay. Although, that does make me worry about the other tree we prepped to cut. Shit, I don't even remember now how many we did. I'll have to check that in a bit. Kind of cool that Brian responded so fast from across town. Does seem to say something about his character. We made the trip down to the last two houses and started the house-clearing process. I let the girls do more of the work while I watched and pulled security. The only thing I really wanted to do myself was the actual door-kicking and room-clearing with the shotgun. They don't have trigger time with a shotgun yet, and they're not quite ready for going into a house solo. I did bring Patty inside with me on one house and Abby the other, so we're getting them good experience. Both houses had no undead, but one did have dead bodies inside. I wound up getting the back door open and dragging the corpses outside so the women didn't hurl all over the place. One house was a double-wide mobile home and the other a small cape with an addition on the side for a new family room. The mobile home had a suicide in it, which is a mixed blessing. The person did it with a 20-gauge pump shotgun, and where there's one gun, there's usually a few more. We picked up the 20-gauge, another 20-gauge pump, and a pair of muzzle loaders. Good thing about that is the black powder. They had 24 12-gauge shells and 24 20-gauge shells. Nice haul, all things considered. Fair amount of food, too. Well, there were eight cans of clams, which is... weird. Not a huge fan of canned clams. They were probably chowder enthusiasts. 
A few good supplies. More gun cleaning stuff there. The cape was empty of people, dead, undead, or otherwise, and had a reasonably good supply of food inside. I think we salvaged about 24 cans of food out of it, which was nice. I did notice the back door was already kicked in when we did our search, and the house was completely devoid of valuables. By valuables, I mean electronics, jewelry, cash, etc. I bet some asshole from one of the houses nearby stole it. Come to think of it, one of the next houses down the road is the house where I got my Xbox and PS3 and the big TV and all the movies. I wonder if that guy was the one who broke in there. Food for thought. At least whoever did it left a lot of food behind, mostly soups and broths, but those have their uses. No clams, either. Win. I think we were doing the house-cleaning thing for three hours when we wrapped up. We'd lost time on the fallen tree that morning, and we'd taken our sweet-ass time getting those two houses done. I actually showed the girls some basic CQB tactics and explained the idea of violence in action. It doesn't really apply versus zombies, but it's still valuable to know. I also showed them how to slice the pie, which scared the bejesus out of them. Fuck that shit up, Mr. Journal. Savage way to end someone's life. We jaunted back towards campus, and I decided to take a short detour to see how many houses we'd skipped over heading east, and we found three just between the gas station and the log cabin that the assholes who attacked Gilbert were living in. We made a plan that within a few days we'd head to hit those, and that seemed to excite them. We stopped at two houses I thought I left dog food in during the clearing out process. I was wrong about the first house, but we went to the Jones Road farm, and there was definitely food there. We hadn't plowed that road out, though, so it took forever for us to push all that snow out of the way. Two feet of snow does not give up the ghost easily. We got back to campus around 4 p.m. Time flies when you're having fun. We unloaded our hall into the cafeteria like normal, and I decided I'd relax and hit the books. Felt like it had been forever since I sat down and read. It's at least been three weeks. I wanted to investigate solar power and electricity, and wouldn't you know, our science section in the library had a few books on the subject. (laughs) Yay for the green initiatives. On my way back from the library, I stopped in at Hall A and harassed the Williams folks. Everyone was in great spirits. The girls were really enjoying the fact that they were getting out and being profoundly useful and important. I even think Chuck felt good about it because he fed off their happiness and... He also was home spending some decent time with his son. Long time, I think, since they had time to relax together. We went over our plan for how we'd deal with the presence of the Stig folks here on campus, and once everyone was on point with the plan, I headed home to Hall E. I spent the remainder of the evening reading the solar power books and wondering what the hell I was going to do with eight tins of minced clams. I woke up this morning super early, I had sexy dreams of unlimited electrical energy and hot water fueled by the power of the sun. Seriously, though, I did. I dreamt about solar energy. That's what I get after I read through two dry-as-hell science textbooks. Wasn't the worst dream I've had, that's for sure. I was up with the sun, which was a little unusual. I usually sleep in until 7 normally, and the sun has been rising around 6.40. It felt early as hell. I did a patrol of campus and got my gear set up. My logic for the solar panels wasn't entirely popular with the Williams clan. They wanted the panels installed on Hall A. I wanted Hall E. They said, well, there's more people here and blah fucking blah. My logic was that Hall E was larger and only had heat if it had electricity. Hall A has the wood stove, so if they lose juice, they're still fine. If I lose juice... I got to relocate, and Hall E's windows were already boarded up, and the back deck has the steps removed, so in a last-ditch situation, we'd come here anyway. They gave up. I think having the Glock on my hip helped. I can be very persuasive when I'm armed. (laughs) Seriously, though, they were on board with the idea once I explained it. Plus, it wasn't like we couldn't get more panels installed. Stig radioed us at 8 a.m., saying they were en route. The plan was to arrive at 9.30. If they arrived earlier, they'd radio before pulling up. At 8.45, they radioed, saying the trip to here was almost entirely devoid of trouble, and they were at Jones Road waiting for our clearance. Abby was going to be outside patrolling campus, and Patty was going to be at the vans with the TAC-22 in case they made a run at the bridge. 
Gilbert was to stay at his house and only come down if something were to go wrong. I told them to roll the truck to the bridge. Once the truck pulled up, I saw Brian and an unknown man in the cab. Brian hopped out and we shook hands. He seemed excited to be here finally. We bullshitted for a bit, mostly about their trip over. He said there were all of maybe five zombies on the way here, which was awesome. They ran over as many as they could, and they had the splat marks on the truck to prove it, and got here in what amounted to almost normal travel time. As per our agreement, Brian opened the back of the truck for me. He had two more people bundled up in there holding the solar panel boxes still. I recognized both guys as Tim and Tom Murphy. I knew they worked at Stig before everything went down, and man, was it nice to see them. Tim and Tom were as Irish as you can get. Skinny, pale as hell, hard drinkers, and they loved to laugh. They reminded me of my buddy Kevin, something fierce. They were brothers from my side of the town that I knew through some of our other friends. Townies, to say the least. I greeted them with a mile-wide grin and knew this day was going to be worth it. Once I was sure they didn't have a Trojan horse to bring on campus, Patty and I moved the vans off the bridge and let them drive the truck over to Hall E. As we agreed, only two of their men would be armed, and that turned out to be Brian and the other guy in the front, who turned out to be a guy named Daryl. He was a bearded, burly ex-logger that found his way to Stig after that day because his wife worked there. He had a police-issue 12 gauge and held like he knew how to use it. I was instantly envious of Brian for having so many able people. I was also a little concerned that Brian had so many capable people. Here's how it went down. The techs were not to enter Hall E until the panels were installed on the roof. I drove the ladder truck over to Hall E and got the thing raised for them. They said it was the easiest roof work they'd ever done. Tim and Tom did these installations for a living, and they worked fast as hell. The panels they were putting in were strictly electricity generators. They could put some in that just heated water, but electricity is far more important than hot water at the moment. They brought their own tools and had the panels installed in three hours. During that time, Brian and Daryl were to hang out with me outside, watching to make sure the techs were okay. They wound up running some heavy-duty cabling down the side of the house and had to drill a hole in the wall to get it through. Fortunately, where they had to drill to patch the solar energy into the hall was near the basement fire door, which I'd almost entirely forgotten about. I never used the damn thing. It's on the side of the hall where the deck is, and I never go out that way, really, so... Once they had the panels in and the cables installed... I let Tim in through that bottom door, and he installed the batteries and paneling and hooked everything fully to the hall's power grid. Abby came inside the hall and sat on the stairs to make sure he didn't try to get upstairs to sneak around. He was inside for about two more hours. By then, it was about 3.30, and the sky was getting dark. Clouds were drowning out what little sun we were going to get that day, but Tim showed me the energy being generated on a voltometer, or voltometer, or whatever it's called. Point is, the needle was moving. He explained how much energy could be used for what and how much it'd help out the drain on the generator. After my instruction on how to operate the panels and batteries and circuits and a whole bunch of shit I don't recall, he handed me about five manuals and we walked out. They were packing up to leave and I got their stuff for them. I had it all in a large sterilite container that the kids in a dorm room were using as an impromptu hamper. Brian counted everything and... Then he handed me a box of 556. I shook everyone's hands and thanked them, and once the trade was complete and they had the stuff in the truck, you could see the tension left. Just from body language alone, Daryl looked so much happier. I'm betting he was completely sold on the idea that this was an ambush and they were walking into a trap. But it wasn't. If anything, I'm pretty honest. Mostly. I'm in business, folks, and it went smooth as a ninja ship being pushed down the drain by a toe. Oh, yeah, boy. <laughs> I'm mature, I know. It's something I struggle with day to day. When they left, Brian and I agreed that we'd talk again on the 31st, and he mentioned that if we came across anything useful or had spare of things, to let him know. He mentioned that 150 mouths are a lot to keep fed, and any spare food would be traded for immediately. I told him I'd keep an eye out for him. I mentioned that my plan is to clear out more and more houses one by one, and as we came across food and supplies, anything extra, I'd be more than happy to share. He said they were waiting for spring to do the same on their side of town. He also mentioned that he had some spare police-oriented equipment, like tasers and pepper spray, which definitely got the saliva flowing. Good to know we're on the same page on multiple levels. 
We shook hands again, and they drove their truck across the bridge. Patty and I got the vans back into position, and once Gilbert arrived on campus about 15 minutes later, we knew the coast was clear. Gilbert was our rear guard to make sure they didn't bum-rush the campus. He said the police 4 by 4 stopped exactly at the end of Prospect and sat there, waiting for something to go wrong. He said he saw four people in the cruiser, which makes sense. Bringing a vehicle loaded with armed folks was against our rules for the meeting, but then again, so was Gilbert's rear guard action. Now, I also left Gilbert out of the equation to make sure he didn't talk to Brian again. So far, they haven't met yet, and I'm trying to keep them apart to increase their tension disorganization. We'll see how it pans out. Of course, it occurs to me now that Gilbert easily could have waltzed down to the end of Prospect and shot the shit with the cops in the cruiser all damn day. So yeah, a little bit of the juice. Nice. Tomorrow, we're going to hit the three houses heading east between Auburn Lake Road and the log cabin. More than likely, they'll be empty, but I'm hopeful we'll find something. My guess is the cabin folks cleaned them out already. We'll see what happens after that. Hoping for sunny days ahead. Adrian. January 30th. That motherfucker. They hit my gas station. Sean, wherever you are, I hope you're real fucking happy tonight. I'd like to think you have no idea I'm coming for you. Adrian. January 31st. If one more person shits in my cornflakes, I will tear every last human being I encounter apart. I fucking had it with people. Absolutely fucking had it. The human race deserves to rot. I'm gonna go punch holes in the wall now. Adrian. January 31st. Second entry. Better now. That's a complete lie. I'm not better now. I'm calmer now. Definitely not better. At about... Nine o'clock last night, I was getting settled for bed, and I heard a loud boom from outside. It sounded very far off, though, and I thought it was another one of those trees we pre-cut for the ambush falling down again. I went to a window facing the bridge to see if I could see anything, but when I went past a window facing north-ish, I saw light on the horizon. I did the geographic math in my head and realized it was somewhere near the gas station. Just as I was putting two and two together... There was a huge flare of light and another booming noise shortly after that, and then I knew it was the gas station. First there was rage, then some worry. I got my ass dressed as fast as possible and headed over to Hall A, weapons in hand, expecting a full-on assault. Of course, I didn't get there fast enough, and Patty came over the radio asking if I heard that explosion. A few seconds after that, Jason over at Stig came over the radio and was asking if we were okay and if we needed assistance. I was happy to hear that they were keeping an eye on us, but I was pissed that it got to them that something bad had happened. I didn't want them to think our survivability was damaged. Then I started to think that they answered so fast because they were awake and about to hit us, having just been here to campus. Made sense, right? I radioed back to him that we'd heard some kind of explosion in the distance and that we were checking it out. He said to let them know what was up and that they were able to head over if we needed help. By the time I got to Hall A, I could hear a snowmobile moving in the woods nearby. I made sure the M15 was ready to rock, and I hoped to God it was Gilbert coming and not the Westfield people. I took cover in the snowbank and watched the machine pull in. It was Gilbert. He hopped off the machine, and I hollered out to freeze. He stopped immediately. I don't know why I did it. I was so pissed and sick of all the bullshit, I called his ass out immediately. Gilbert, what were you and Brian talking about on the radio the other night? I leveled the M15 at his chest. My heart was pounding in the cold moonlight. Gilbert slowly lifted his hands and extended them out to the sides. He didn't want to get shot, and I didn't want to shoot him. He said this back to me. I've known Brian for years, Adrian. I was friends with his father. He and I have been talking for months now on the radio I have in my basement. His voice was laced with concern. He must have known I was in a bad place mentally. I literally could just pull the trigger. I said this back, and arguably it was not my finest moment as a human being. You fucking asshole. Why didn't you tell me this from the start? 
We could have been talking to them weeks ago, a month ago, or more, you fucking dink. And I turn on the radio in the middle of the night, and lo and behold, I hear you two talking about me. What the fuck, man? You have any idea how fucking betrayed I feel? Why the fucking game? Son, you lied to him too. You told him we have more people here than we did. You told him you have less food than you actually have. You were, you were smart, and you told him just as much as you had to. The only difference between you and me is that your feelings are hurt that I protected myself, and mine aren't. Man, he could stare. I felt my soul shrivel. Fuck, Gilbert. You're like the first person I've met that didn't try to fucking kill me. I thought we'd be on the level, man. You know, you gotta trust someone sometime, right? Not gonna lie. Started to cry. Not cry like a bitch, but... My voice was breaking a little, and my eyes were watering. I'm going to blame the cold air. He shook his head. Adrian, I have never lied to you. I have not told you things a few times that made my situation better, son, but at no point have I bald-faced lied to you. God help me, but I believed him. I lowered the rifle a little, and he lowered his hands. He spoke again. Look, son, this world is fucked. There's food, ammunition, fuel, and trust. Anything else doesn't matter, and off that list, trust is the hardest to find and worth the most. Now, if your feelings are hurt because I don't trust nobody, then tough shit, son, but I can tell you this. I could have thrown in with Brian's men long before I met you, and I didn't. I'm right here, right now, and you gotta trust that when it gets thick, I'm here for you, son. The damn cold really started to irritate my eyes again. I was still angry over the explosion, but I wasn't angry at him anymore. I realized then that Abby and Randy were on the porch of Hall A beside us, watching and listening. They had no idea about any of this, and Abby's face spoke volumes. She was practically scowling at Gilbert. I nodded slowly at Gilbert. He started walking into Hall A, and I followed after him, wiping my face. Abby patted me on the back, and I thanked her. Inside, Chuck was on the couch, trying to keep his arm elevated, and Patty was stalking up and down the hallway with her 9 millimeter, waiting for an impending assault. Once inside, I calmed myself and told him I was going to head down on the snow machine to see what happened. Gilbert said he could show me a trail that dumped out down the road from the station. I agreed, and we were off. The ladies stayed behind and held down the fort. Gilbert watched as I ran back to here and snagged up my Kevlar and the Savage. I wanted the scope for vision purposes. I slung that in the M15 across my back, and I trotted over to our snowmobile. I met Gilbert on his machine, and together we dragged two of the plywood sheets with nails back out onto the road. It was a bitch to get them past the bridge, but we did it, and pretty fast, too. Adrenaline's a wonderful thing. After that, he took me to his place. He pointed out how to get to Route 18 near the Piss and Lemons house, and he said he'd take a route that came out on the other side. I shook his hand, and we zipped off. It was fifteen minutes before I got to the road. I drove very slowly as I got closer to the road, so the machine was quieter. I actually wound up parking the machine right near the garage that Gilbert took cover behind the day we were attacked by the cabin folk. I ran down the road toward the gas station, about three or four football fields, then dropped low and slow-crawled until I got a reasonably good view via scope of the flames coming from the gas station. It was roaring on fire, like raging. It had been torched, and not only that, but there was a large truck parked in the road that had been set on fire as well. The wreck was just on the east side of the garage, so we couldn't drive downtown without letting it burn out. Now, through the scope on the ground, I could make out two people moving, backlit by the fire. I knew right then and there they'd die where they stood. It was a long shot. I guessed it at 500 yards solid. I prioritized targets, estimated the range, guessed windage, adjusted the scope, slowed my breathing, thanked McGreevy for his excellent choice in hunting rifles and optics, and killed the man facing in my direction. I threw the bolt to reload as the other dork started spinning, looking for the shooter who'd just killed their friend. They were about to die for cover when I killed him too. Both were dropped with shots to the chest. Easily the best combat kills I've ever made, and I've made some good ones. I displaced on foot about 75 yards ahead in the road as fast as I could smash my way through the two feet of snow and low brush. I was moving in solid cover, and 
Even in the decent moonlight, there was no way they'd see me. I dropped to the ground again and watched the scene through the scope. Rushing to the aid of the assholes I'd just dropped was another figure. I readjusted my scope with a twist and sent one more round down range with a swift kick to the shoulder. Whoever it was went ass over tea kettle and managed to fall on the burning truck. I could hear him screaming for a few seconds while they bled out and burnt up. I waited there for two solid minutes before I saw the flash of headlights, then the vague light of vehicle taillights moving away from me from the other side of the fire. I sat there for another minute and then started to slink slowly through the snow and brush to get closer. I switched to the M15 when I was a hundred yards out and I started to jog to the wrecked truck in the road. By the time I got there, all three dead bodies were sitting back up as zombies. Pisses me off that every time I kill one of these assholes, I wind up having to do it twice, unless I can shoot him in the head the first time. I dropped to a knee in the middle of the road and snapped off two shots. One killed the zombie that was on fire from falling on the truck, and the second shot killed the male zombie that I'd killed first. I got closer and went to draw my sword, but once again I forgot the fucking thing at home. I drew the Glock and blew the dead woman's head apart. I vaguely remember hearing her body sizzling as it burnt. Incidentally, after seeing a zombie actually on fire, I find myself emotionally detached. I checked around the area and found no one left alive. The gas station was a flat-out raging inferno. There were tire tracks on the snow heading west. I stood there, watching the flames gout up from the underground storage tanks for at least five minutes before Gilbert rode up on his machine. He ushered me to fuck off out of there, and after I grabbed their guns and searched them for ammo, he gave me a ride to my machine. <sighs> and then rode back to the campus. Hall A's inhabitants were walking on pins and needles. Chuck was fucking furious about this, and Patty was stressing big time. Abby, as usual, was keeping it together and keeping Randy surprisingly calm. They'd heard the gunshots and knew something bad had happened. I told them we killed three more people at the station— and I showed them the lone wallet I'd collected off the bodies. It had a Westfield driver's license. Shocking, right? I radioed to Jason at Stig, and Brian answered. I told them we were all right, and that there'd been an attack on the gas station near here that we used. I told them that we'd been attacked weeks ago by people from Westfield, and that we fought them off. This was apparently their attempt at revenge. Brian immediately asked if it was Sean's group of people. Huh. Not cool, Mr. Journal. I told him, yeah, and waited for him to tell me they were coming to kill me because I just attacked their allies or something. Surprisingly, he laughed. Apparently, this Sean asshole was a state senator before the world shit the bed and was well known as an asshole. According to what Brian said, I guess back when they were still in radio contact before the state signal repeater shit the bed, Sean had all these grandiose plans to relaunch the state under his guidance. Brian said they broke off contact before the repeaters died because he was a grade-A giant bag of douche. Hearing that pleased me a great deal. Brian said if we needed support, he and a few of his men could get there in less than an hour and call. He said they had men on the radio 24-7 monitoring in the event something went wrong, so just holler. I thanked him. Gilbert spoke up then, too. He said, Brian, this is Gilbert. I told Adrian that we've been talking, so he knows everything. Don't feel like you have to hold back anymore. <laughs> wow, right? Brian was silent for a good 30 seconds. His single response was this. Adrian, we need you more than you need us, and you need to know that. Shit, I think you probably already know that. We're low on food, something fierce, but we're in the safest place you can imagine. After all this bullshit, you really need to consider coming to us and... Staying here until it all blows over. I looked at the faces of the people around me. Chuck was nodding in agreement, and Patty had her head hung low, clearly thinking about it. Randy was tearing up, and Abby was looking at me, wondering what I was thinking. She looked so skinny and tiny to me at that moment, and I felt a little bit of my heart break off for her. Such a young girl and in such a scary world to finish growing up in. Gilbert was looking at me, too, but I could fucking tell he was looking to me to show support and strength. Brian, those of us here are free to make whatever decision they want. If anyone wants to join you, they're free to do so. However, this is my home now, and I plan on staying here. I'm more than happy to help you as much as I can, though. 
Give us some time to figure out what we're doing, please. He said no problem and wished us safety and good luck. Chuck immediately said, We're fucking gone tomorrow. He rationalized it and it made sense, a lot of sense. If Westfield was willing to destroy an entire gas station to get revenge on us, then they were willing to burn the campus down, building by building, to get at me. Not at them, mind you. Me. This shit was personal, and everyone knew it. Sean wanted me dead. And if the others died too, well, that was just fine to him. I said we should sleep on it and discuss it tomorrow. That's when I put my small entry in last night. I had to say something to someone, so I chose you, Mr. Journal. No one slept. Gilbert moved his truck to the end of Prospect Circle and sat in it all night long, waiting for more Westfield assholes to show. I wandered campus almost all night, stopping only to piss and shit inside. I grabbed a few of the leftover granola bars we'd accumulated, and I kept at it. I wound up blacking out from exhaustion sitting at the kitchen table sometime around nine this morning. I slept for three or four hours before Abby woke me up banging on the outside door. She was red-eyed from crying. My radio had died. I forgot to charge it. We gathered in Hall A again for a meeting I wish I could forget now. Chuck and Patty had discussed it all night, and they were leaving. I said that was fine. They were bringing Randy and Abby with them. Abby had waited for me to tell them no. She wanted me awake to support her assertion to stay here. I didn't support her. She should not be near me right now. I'm dangerous to her, and the Westfield assholes are dangerous to her as well. If she stays here, she'll get killed. I I can fucking tell. She actually hit me in the face when I told her to leave. She said some horrible things, too, but she had a right to say them. You're a liar. You said I could stay with you. I don't want to leave. This is my home now. I, I can take care of myself. We'll be fine. Everything will be fine. Lots of stuff like that. I let her hit me a few times before Patty intervened and grabbed her. She felt betrayed by me, and I can't blame her. I told her why she should leave, and she argued until she collapsed from exhaustion. I don't think she slept at all last night. I sat at the table and waited for Patty to get her down and to sleep on the couch. Charles was crying, and Gilbert was rubbing his face, showing his frustration and sadness over everything. I sat silent until Patty returned. This is all I said to them. You need to leave. Tomorrow, if we can get them to come get you. You can take some food, some medicine, a few guns, and some ammo, and a vehicle, if you want one. I'll deal with this on my terms, and believe me, you don't want that much blood on your hands. They had no answer, so I stood up and asked them straight up, are we making the call or what? Make your decision, stay or leave. Chuck and Patty looked at each other painfully for a minute and then reached for the radio. I walked out of Hall A. Adrian. February 2011. February 1st. Goodbyes are always painful, Mr. Journal. This one more than usual. When I got back to the dorm last night, I cried. A lot. It got so bad, I inevitably started to think about Cassie and how much I missed her. I wanted desperately to have her support right now. Jesus, I miss that woman. I'd give it all up to have her back for just one hour. Just one hour. But that's not happening, is it? Like Gilbert said, I've got to earn my redemption. One day, God willing, I'll make it to the big campus in the sky, and hopefully she'll be there waiting for me. Until then, I've got blood to spill. I wound up sleeping for about six hours until dawn again. Terrible dreams again, Mr. Journal. I don't remember what the dreams were about, but I remember violence. Otis was long gone and hiding under the couch when I woke up. He does that lately when I have bad dreams. Once I'm awake, though, he's fine. I got him out from under the couch, got him some food and water, and took a long, hot shower. I knew from the radio conversation last night that Brian was rolling in at high noon to get the Williams family, so I had work to do. First thing after I got ready was to head down to the gas station. Outside, I could smell the odor on the air of a burnt home. You ever been near a house fire? Lots of nasty chemical smells in the air, and this one was extra bad. 
I hopped in the plow, made sure there was a chain in it, and I headed down to the gas station. I had to move the spiked boards we dropped in the road. I approached it carefully and made sure there was no one around. Of course, someone with a good rifle and some time behind a scope could kill me from far enough away that I'd never see them, but fuck it. I'm feeling a little down in the dumps today. I hooked the chain up to the burnt-out truck and then hitched it to the plow. I dragged the heap into the gas station yard and searched the station for anything usable. Wouldn't you know, but there was nothing left. All that was left was just a few standing remnants of frame and the warped metal of some tools and shit. I headed back up to campus. As soon as I pulled in, I saw the Williams people in the windows of Hall A, gathering what few things they wanted to leave with. I suddenly got really fucking paranoid that they were going to steal valuable stuff I'd need to replace, but I calmed myself down. Everything that I couldn't live without was already in Hall E under lock and key. Whatever they took from Hall A, they could keep. After I parked the plow, I gathered up the stuff I wanted them to leave with. I had a rough idea of the 9mm ammo they still had, and I knew it was around 50 or so rounds. I wanted them to have more. I grabbed them 25 more rounds to take with them. I anticipated Charles would take a shotgun with him, and that's fine, but I really wanted him to take a pump action as well. I snagged one of the Benelli pumps that we got from the cabin and a box of 12 shells for him. I also wanted them to keep the Marlin and the TAC-22, so I grabbed another box of 500 rounds. I wanted to give him one of the 38 revolvers we'd gotten, but I couldn't find the one I wanted to give them. I think I left it in one of the gun cases. I didn't bother looking for it before they left. It seemed like more than enough ammo to keep them safe and sound. I had no idea what kind of drugs they had over at Stig, so I made sure to grab some antibiotics, ibuprofen, aspirin, vitamins, and some painkillers. I also grabbed them some food. Out of the cafeteria, I snagged a flat for 48 cans and filled it with various different foods. We had a full bag of chips spare, as well as two tins of juice. I also grabbed a few random tidbits like granola bars, a few chocolate bars, etc. I got it all in some cardboard boxes and moved it over to Hall A. I left it just outside of the way of their sights so they couldn't see my surprise parting gift for them. It wasn't much after that when I saw Charles trying to get my attention through a window. I headed inside. We sat down at the table and had a really awkward conversation that turned a... well, turned a little ugly. Adrian, we'd like to leave here with a fair share of the food. Oh yeah, I, I got a package of food ready for you already, and you can take whatever you want from what you've got here in the dorm as well. I've also got some weapons and ammo I'd like you to take. Oh, wow, that's that's great, thanks. We, we can load it all in their truck when they get here. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you guys. It's not a ton, but they got food there, and I'm sure we'll be trading more soon. That, or you guys will come back once this is dealt with. Well, uh, how much stuff is it? I mean, we were thinking a straight-up split of the food. There's five of us and just one of you, so we were expecting to take you, no, about 75% of the food. He seemed confused that I wasn't just giving it all to them. I got angry, but I stayed calm. Chuck, in that case, I think it's fair you guys take whatever it is you gathered on your own, which is nothing. What I'm giving you is what the girls and I gathered the past few days together, plus extra food, plus several weapons, and a shitload of ammo you didn't come here with. I think I'm being more than fair. He was steaming. So you're just going to throw us out on our asses with next to nothing. That's ridiculous. If you just talked to Sean instead of fighting him, this wouldn't be happening. This is all your fault, goddamn you. I stood up and pointed a finger in his face. Calm had gone the way of the dodo. You fucking brought this on me, you asshole. You led them to my home, the one I almost died to make safe, and I killed people so that you could sleep here at night. Sleep right near the wood stove I found out of a house I cleared by myself. You eat the food I gather and have electricity from the generator that I put here. I nearly smacked him across the face bitch slap style, but I turned and walked out the door. At the door, I said one last thing. Chuck, you're leaving here with more than you came with. Get your family safe and have the best life you can. Don't regret this decision. Own it. And I walked out. I didn't see him again until when the Stig truck pulled up to the bridge. I didn't move the vans away this time. 
I just stood there, waiting for them to come out of the truck. I had the weapons packed into a single rifle case from the grocery store roof, and I brought the big box of food and ammo out, too. Brian jumped out of the passenger side of the truck, and his sidekick, Daryl, waved out the truck window at me. Now that there's some trust established, he seems to have warmed to me. Brian's first words to me were, Holy shit, man, what happened at the gas station? All I did was nod solemnly. He knew not to pry. He shook my hand for some time, and eventually we grabbed the box of stuff and brought it to the back of the big truck. He threw the door up, and we hefted it into the back. After a good shove inside, I wiped my hands off and stood there, waiting as the Williams family trudged their way over the bridge in our direction. He finally started talking. What are you going to do? I killed three of his people, Brian. They were waiting in ambush at the gas station for us after they torched it. I remember licking my lips a lot. They're dry and painful right now. Too much time outside. I need to look for chapstick. And we saw the bodies, and it serves them right, Adrian. If Sean's fucking you over like this, you know you've gotten underneath his skin. This is a power play, Adrian. He's trying to show his people that you're a threat and that you'll be dealt with. I laughed. He didn't know the whole story yet. There's more to what happened at the gas station than you know, Brian. After I dropped those three people, I searched their bodies and took their guns. Good. Anything decent? He asked. He seemed excited at the prospect of new weapons and ammo coming into town. Brian, their guns weren't loaded. I let him think about it. He spat on the ground when he put two and two together. I spoke up before he had the chance to. He had me kill those people on purpose. He knew I'd do it, and he put patsies out there with empty guns for me to kill. I eliminated that cocksucker's competition. I murdered innocents for him, Brian, and he'll fucking pay for it. Brian nodded slowly. You want help? I'll give you Jason. He's got some military experience. I'm sure he'll be useful. I shook my head. No, thanks. I need to do this solo. I've got some ideas on what to do and how to do it. I just need to think about it. I do know this. If he's killing off his own people like this, then that means he's not very popular at home right now. My bet is if I kill him and only him, the rest of his people will throw in the white towel and call for a truce. Brian agreed. I've got some planning to do. Just about then, the Williams people arrived, and it was a mess. Charles wouldn't look at me at all, and Patty was crying. She hugged me, and we got her up in the back of the truck. Randy hugged me, too, and he was falling apart. Poor kid was just sobbing, begging his mom and dad not to make him leave. Abby didn't look at me, either. She was still angry. Chuck couldn't get into the back of the truck because of his busted arm, which pissed him off even more. Brian wound up making him ride bitch in the front. I helped Patty and Randy up, and Abby told me I can do it myself. <laughs> Gotta love that kid's spunk. Brian handed them a flashlight and pulled the truck's door down. As the door slid shut, I could hear Randy sob. Talk about a heartbreaking moment. I completely felt like the Nazis loading the Jews onto the trains headed to the concentration camp. I mean, that was the moment, in a nutshell. I was sending people off I knew might not make it. I was hopeful. Brian and I shook hands again, and he offered any assistance I needed. I thanked him and said the same. I told him I'd be in touch once I knew what the plan was. He said he appreciated it, and he got in the truck. I watched them back up the hill and disappear. A couple minutes later, as I was walking back over the bridge, I heard the distinct noise of snow crunching underfoot behind me, and I dropped and brought up the M15. Running down the road and crossing the bridge was Abby. She had all her shit with her and was running all elbows and knees towards me. I damn near shot her for the second time. That kid's stupid sometimes. She ran right up and slid to a stop about five feet from me. Her nose was running and her eyes were red. She steadied herself, cleared her throat, and said one thing to me. I'm not leaving you here alone to deal with my family's problem. I gave her a hug. Such a strong kid. She'd banged on the truck to stop and told her family she couldn't leave me alone. She apologized to her parents, kissed her brother on the head, hugged her mom and dad, and ran back here. I really don't want her here, but I have to admire her stand-up attitude. She's taken responsibility where her family can't. 
what a strong person does. They do what's required and responsible, despite being afraid. Hope she didn't learn that from me. <laughs> I'm a terrible role model. We got her shit set up in a room down the hall from me. Despite the fact that we have the wood stove functional in Hall A, we're going to be here in Hall E. More resources, weapons, the solar panels, etc. Plus, there's no use in splitting up and wasting twice the fuel on two generators. Damn little sense now that the gas station nearest to me is gone. I don't know how I'm going to deal with getting fuel. We'll need to hit larger stations further away and really make substantial fuel runs. None of this 20 gallons at a time bullshit. We'll need to load up all our drums and get 300 gallons in one trip. Otherwise, we'll be wasting too much fuel just getting the fuel. Now, in my moist, wet dreams, I envision us finding a fuel truck on the side of the road somewhere. <laughs> Fat fucking chance, right? So, the rest of the afternoon was getting her settled, eating some food, and making murderous plots to end this Sean motherfucker. Oh, and Brian radioed us to let us know they made it back safe. Guess I don't have to worry about them anymore. Now all my thoughts and evil intentions are fixed wholly on Sean. Hear that, you little bitch? I'm angry. And I'm on my way. Adrian. February 2nd. It's about 11 p.m. There was another explosion outside about 20 minutes ago. It was loud enough to shake the plates in the cupboards and send Otis scrambling. Since then, there have been a series of smaller explosions. The night sky is glowing orange from the fire, and it flat out lights up the clouds for miles around when there's another burst. I can't exactly pin down where the explosion was, but my educated guess is that it's more than 10 miles away and probably on the other side of downtown somewhere. I sent out a radio call five times now to the Stig people, and they haven't responded. I think Stig is right about there. Abby is starting to freak out. I'm not sure what to do. Adrian. Guilt. Charles and Patty watched their 17-year-old girl turn from them and run away down the rural road towards her old private school. She'd left them, and they both knew it would never be the same again. This wasn't like the time they'd brought her to the boarding school when she was a freshman. This time, she was leaving them for herself and her needs, not theirs, and she wouldn't follow them where they were going anymore. Abby had banged on the inside of the back of the truck they were in until Daryl and Brian in the cab heard her. Patty had tried to stop her daughter, to calm her down, but when Abby's mind was made, almost nothing would derail her. Especially not now. Not since the world had ended and little Abigail had grown up. Patty had a flash of memory from just a few days ago when her daughter had stood over an undead teenager with a pistol and blew the girl's head off at point-blank range. Abby had done it to save her mother's life. Dirty Harry had nothing on Dirty Abby. The Williams family, Father Charles, Mother Patricia, Daughter Abigail, and young son Randall, had survived on their own in their family home for six months following the apocalypse. The end of the world came at the hands of the dead. One day, Wednesday, June 23rd to be precise, the dead refused to stay deceased. All across the world they had risen and bite by bite their ranks increased until the remaining living were scattered, starving, and scared. Their daughter Abigail had been at her private school the day the world ended. She'd been trapped alone there overnight and was eventually freed by a staff member at the school named Adrian Ring. Abby had left Adrian behind to return home to her family in their small town of Westfield, but when she left, he told her she and her family could return. He was going to make the school's campus safe to live in, and they were welcome to return. The Williams family had hidden in plain sight, windows covered, moving only at night and silently when they did. They ate everything they could find and only decided to do something about their situation when all the food in their neighborhood was gone and the town's remaining survivors were closing in to scavenge their home. When things became desperate for the family, Abby lobbied hard and won her parents over to the idea of going back to the school 
to be with Adrian. Adrian was a tough man. He was smart, clever, and knew how to use weapons effectively. Abby knew he would still be safe, and she knew they could find safety from the undead with him. They arrived on campus Christmas Day. The trip through the hills between the two towns was treacherous, and they ran out of gas. Fortunately, they found one of the school's trucks on the side of the road a couple miles from campus, and with a little luck, it started for them. The last few miles, they rode packed into the front of the Ford. Adrian welcomed them in, gave them a warm place to stay, and that night he even fought off an attack by the scavengers who had followed them from their hometown. They ate like kings with him. He taught them how to shoot, and together they helped turn one of the dormitories into a new home for their family. He even led them into his own town on their own scavenging raids. It was scary, but every time they went out, they returned with the things they needed. The worst thing that had happened to them in the month they'd been with him was a broken arm suffered by Charles, and frankly, everyone knew the injury could have been avoided. His arm was stepped on by zombies when they were being overrun at the police station downtown. He thought he was out of bullets and ran in trying to save their group and kill the zombies with his bare hands. He'd forgotten about the loaded pistol on his hip. Live and learn, Charles had mused. The scavengers that ran their town of Westfield hailed from the high school there. They were led by a man named Sean Stockwell. Sean was a state senator, and with his asshole buddies on the force, they had formed a council and were controlling the entire town. Sean had followed the Williams clan to Auburn Lake Preparatory Academy, and when Adrian told him to leave, they attacked. Adrian had killed two of the men before Sean ran off, but just a few days later, Sean returned in force. Down the street from the school, there was a lone survivor who had befriended Adrian. His name was Gilbert Donahue, and he was retired from the restaurant business. In a prior life, before that, he was also an ex-Green Beret. He and Adrian had set an ambush, and when the Westfield people returned to take the food and the campus by force, they walked right into the trap. It was a bloodbath. All but two of the Westfield people were killed in the ambush. Sean escaped. Things quieted down, and eventually the Williams family, Adrian and Gilbert, wound up getting in contact with another group of people in the same town. This new group was led by the local chief of police, Brian Moore. The same Brian in the front of the truck they were in. His group was much larger, over a hundred survivors, and their sanctuary was a solar panel manufacturing plant across town. They had successfully completed two mutually beneficial trades, and the future was starting to look very bright for both groups. Even if the walking dead were not gone, some civility had at least finally returned to their lives. Today was February 1st, and on the night of January 30th, Sean's people had returned and ignited the small gas station down the road from the school. It was a convenient source of fuel for them, and with it denied by destruction, their life would become much more difficult. Despite earlier arguments to the contrary, Charles and Patty decided to move the family to the solar plant immediately and join the other group. Sean's vendetta was against Adrian, not them. Charles had argued with the big man Adrian over food and supplies, but with a broken arm, there was no forcing Adrian to do anything. Even if Charles had a shotgun, there would have been no forcing Adrian. That was akin to trying to scare a rock with a Pez dispenser. The family had just left the campus in a box truck that belonged to Solar Technology Innovations Group, or STIG. Brian's group was set up in the STIG corporate headquarters and manufacturing plant. Patty, Abby, and their 12-year-old boy Randy got in the back of the truck with the weapons and food Adrian had given them. Charles couldn't get up and into the back of the truck with his broken arm easily, so he rode in the front with the former chief and Daryl a burly, bearded hulk of a man wearing a Husqvarna cap. A blind person could have told you Daryl was a logger. He permanently smelled like fresh pine. When they'd gotten the truck backed up about 500 feet to a wider spot in the road, Daryl swung it around, and that's when they heard Abby banging inside the back. They'd all piled out and opened the sliding door to see what was happening. She wanted out of the truck and out of this plan. 
Charles and Patty pleaded with her not to go, but she was firm in her decision, and she didn't care that she wasn't eighteen yet either. Laws didn't matter any more, only right and wrong. And she knew it was wrong to leave Adrian to fend for himself alone against Sean's raiders. She would stay with him and help as best she could. She felt their entire family owed it to him, and she didn't want to feel guilty the rest of her life about it. So she left. She'd taken her pillows, her blankets, the nine millimeter on her hip Adrian had given her, and the backpack filled with all the clothes she owned. Patty and Charles watched her jog down the hill and across the bridge blocked with vans and onto campus. Adrian stopped to meet her, and they walked away. Patty cried. The rest of the trip to Stig was easily the most horrifying hour and a half of their entire lives. Charles had moved into the back of the truck after taking one of the pain pills Adrian had spared for him. Charles knew his wife needed him badly then, and pain be damned, he went to her. The majority of the ride was not only bumpy, but blood-curdling. Charles tried to keep a tab on how far they were going, but he couldn't be sure. There were no windows in the truck. Twenty minutes into their journey to the Stig plant, the family started to hear and feel the truck shudder from impacting the walking dead. They could envision it in the blackness of the truck far too easily. There would be a thumping noise followed by a vibration coming from the front as a body hit the grill. Moments after that, the front of the truck would run over the fallen body, and you could hear a series of crunching noises followed by the telltale bursting pop as the zombie exploded under the tires. This happened over and over. At least twice, the truck had to slow and they heard the chief shooting a heavy shotgun out the window at something. In the dark, the gunshots were so much louder than normal. Charles could feel Patty and Randy flinch every time the trigger was pulled. Charles kept telling them that every hop, every crunch, and every ripping noise was one less zombie. Every time the gun went off, it was one less dead person that could hurt them. And every second they moved closer to Stig, it was another second further away from the Westfield danger. The truck swung a wide arc that sent them sliding in the back. Brian banged on the front wall, and they heard him hollering, We're here. That little burst of excitement and relief went a long way to temporarily alleviate the departure of their daughter Abigail. The truck's transmission jerked into reverse, and with a short grinding of the gears, they sped backwards, coming to a gentle stop as the truck's rear guards bumped into something solid. They heard the clacking of the door latch being flung open, and suddenly they were blinded by the white glow of fluorescent light. Howdy, I'm Tim, they heard through their closed eyes. It was a young voice with a hint of the hoarseness that drinking too much cheap whiskey can give you. Tim helped Charles to his feet, and within seconds he saw the man. Tim was tall and thin, and Charles recognized him instantly as one of the men who had come to the school campus to install solar panels they'd traded for a few days ago. In fact, Tim was still wearing the navy blue jumpsuit with the Stig logo on it that he wore that day. Charles thanked him and winced at the pain in his shattered forearm. Even with a fresh Percocet in his system, it still hurt badly when touched or moved. "'Welcome to Stig. Best place to live in this giant toilet of a town.' Tim presented the interior of the warehouse the dock door led into like a game show host presenting a prize behind curtain number one. Scattered pieces of warehouse racking reached up nearly three stories to the metal ceiling above. The cavernous room was brightly lit with fluorescent light streaming down from huge overhead fixtures. Far in the back of the warehouse, Charles saw a huge metal door marked flammable. He hoped that was a huge room filled with fuel to keep them warm. No sooner had Charles looked around in the industrial warehouse, the lights started to snap off with an electrical zap. A middle-aged woman wearing a puffy skiing jacket near the dock was throwing the switches on a panel and turning them off. Gotta save the juice for the night. We leave one light on in the warehouse and another in the plant. We actually live in the office portion of the building. Tim gestured towards a large opening in the wall running away from them and to the right. Suddenly, they heard the booming of multiple weapons firing outside. The woman who was turning off the lights drew a large revolver from her waistband and carefully opened the heavy fire door that led outside. Charles gathered his family and pulled away as Tim drew a small revolver from his jumpsuit pocket. 
He went to the door with the woman, and a few loud gunshots later, Daryl and Brian jumped through the opening, and the woman yanked the door shut behind them. Brian leaned over and put his hands on his thighs, chest heaving. He looked over at his logger friend, Daryl, and grinned. Not bad, not bad. Only what, ten or twelve got to this side this time? Getting pretty good at this. Charles was mortified. Ten or twelve what got to this side? What are you talking about? Brian swallowed hard and stood. Charles, my friend, this building is surrounded by undead. The entire town is outside now. We trick them into moving from one side of the building to the other side when we need to get out. Charles and Patty were speechless, and he suddenly felt like he'd made a terrible mistake coming here. Come on, I'll give you guys the guided tour. Brian put his arm gently around Charles's good shoulder, and they started towards the opening in the plant wall. From somewhere outside, they heard a faint gunshot in the distance. The tour was both impressive and humbling for Charles and Patty. Poor young Randy was very much scared about everything. He'd lost a very comfortable home with this move, and the nearly pitch-black ride through a zombie-infested town had done nothing to sell him on this being a good place to live. The Stig facility was a technological marvel. Having been originally designed as a green building, it had every environmental sensibility in mind. The plant and warehouse had skylights and solar panels running the entire length of the roof. The toilets flushed with little to no water, and the water removal system on the roof collected melted snow and rainwater into a purifier for drinking. The front of the building where the offices were was made of smoke-tinted glass with transparent solar panels built right into them. Stig was pioneering the technology of transparent solar panels, and their corporate headquarters stood as their crowning achievement and biggest sales tool. Brian led them through the dark and idle manufacturing plant and into the offices. There, his little girl Sarah jumped into his arms to join in on the tour. Charles and Patty visibly stiffened at the sight of the thin but beautiful girl. He carried her most of the duration of the tour, but had to set her down when they went up the stairs to the upper office floors. The first floor was the staff cafeteria, meeting rooms, and cubicles. Because the entire office building area was just reinforced glass, they'd taken the warehouse racking down early and reassembled it bit by bit outside, against the outer walls. It made a sturdy steel and wood obstacle that the zombies couldn't get through, and it still allowed some sun to shine in for the solar windows to activate. They'd driven cars and trucks up against the racking as well, so the zombies couldn't push against it and knock it over easily. The racking was only ten feet tall, so it didn't hinder the upper floor windows whatsoever. The shape of the office portion of the building was similar to that of a donut. The cafeteria was situated against the open interior donut area, so diners eating their lunch could bring their food outside to a small garden. The exterior area was perhaps a hundred feet square, which Brian said they planned on converting into a food-producing garden when warmer weather came. It was protected from the outside and had water and sunshine. The building had a dead glass elevator that looked out into the garden. It was stuck halfway between the first and second floor. The cubicles were left intact on the ground floor. The doors were blockaded on the interior by makeshift plywood and two-by-four walls and large desks. Each exterior room on the first floor had the door shut, locked and barred, so even if the undead outside managed to break a window and get inside the room, they'd need to breach the fortified inner door as well. Brian told horror stories of how they'd lost ten men just getting the racking in place the first few days. Patty shuddered at the thought of trying to do that work with the dead people slowly creeping up behind you, inevitable and unstoppable. The second floor had been converted to storage and living space. The open areas where the accounting department cubicles had been were transformed to create an impromptu village. Families lived in two or three cube homes with blankets and sheets for doors. This part of the building was much warmer from the heat they had going, and Patty thought it felt fairly cozy. Charles thought it looked like post-Katrina New Orleans. Humanity huddled together, starving and scared. All he could see were thin faces, stretched and gaunt, forcing out a smile at the new people they'd be forced to split food with. 
Brian was interrupted by the sound of gunshots a handful of times during their tour. He was explaining the story of how they raided many of the local businesses on this side of town right after the racking was installed when they reached the third floor. The top floor was previously executive offices, sales, and marketing and meeting rooms. Each corner of the building was dominated by an opulent office that had been turned into a guard station. A solar window on each facing of the building was removed and a clever hinged hatch put in its place. Two people were in every room, and they served as a shooter and spotter team. Brian walked them into one of the corner offices that faced the street in the industrial park the building was in. He gave them a long speech as his daughter clutched his leg. He rested his hand lovingly on her head as he talked. So the rules here are simple. Conserve food, conserve water, and conserve electricity are the easy ones. Marx's rule is that everyone pitches in. Whatever skills you got, we need to know about to make sure they're getting used properly. Everyone works every day to get shit done. The Pandora's box rule is do not go into the hazmat storage area in the warehouse under any circumstances. There are toxic and flammable chemicals in there that can really hurt you if something goes wrong. We keep most of our fuel in there as well. You can keep your guns, but if you draw them on someone who still has a heartbeat, then you lose them, or worse. Brian looked over his shoulder briefly out the window, then looked back at them. The really hard rule is this. Never go outside. I know it sounds silly, but you'll go stir-crazy in here in a few weeks. Get into the garden, go on the roof, run in circles out in the warehouse, but whatever you do, do not open an exterior door. We got people with guns at every door that can open to the outside, and they'll keep you from leaving. We can't afford a door opening with all the dead folks outside. He thumbed over his shoulder out the windows. How many are outside? Patty asked, wrapping her arm around her husband. Dinner's in about half an hour in the cafeteria on the first floor. I think all your food went in there already. We have to store it all centrally so we can control the supply. Otherwise, people steal it, and then we start running out and getting into fights. Don't be late for dinner, either. If you're late, someone else will eat your portion. In the meantime, you're welcome to check out the view. And with that, Brian and his little girl Sarah left them with the two shooters in the office. They sat smiling sadly at the three family members. One of them, an athletic blonde man with curly hair, holding a powerful hunting rifle, smiled and spoke up. It's been a good day. The truck dragged most of them off when they left to get you. The mob won't be back for another good hour or two. Patty and Charles walked up to the window to look out at the white world underneath the gray skyline. It was cloudy again and would snow soon. Parking lots and office structures went off in all directions for a few hundred yards. Cars were neatly organized in the giant Stig parking lot. It was easily the size of a soccer field, filling every open space between the cars, hedges, and fences for a hundred feet in every direction, trampling on one another and the fallen snow was a knotted mass of bloody, rotting, and festering undead. They pressed forward against the building like a tide of putrescence. Patty and Charles suddenly couldn't breathe. The cafeteria was dimly lit with energy-saving fluorescent bulbs. Only four lamps were turned on for the meal, and the people were packed into the room like sardines. Every round plastic seat at the long tables was occupied. Everyone smiled at them when they came in. It was almost like they were welcome. Almost. Dinner was atrocious. Cafeteria food is rarely a delicacy under normal conditions, and this was anything but normal. A staff of about ten survivors worked in the industrial kitchen, opening cans and heating them over electric burners fueled by the solar power system. They'd run out of the majority of the popular spices and seasonings months ago, and they were down to using the more obscure and disliked flavorings. The dinner choice that evening was warm canned tuna with dill, limp green beans with paprika, and canned fruit salad. Salt was low and reserved for very special occasions. To say the people looked unenthused at the tables would do them no justice. Most of the adults left their food half-eaten for their children. 
who were too hungry to not eat the bland offerings eagerly. By comparison, Charles and Patty felt fat in the cafeteria. They were by no means overweight, but at the school with Adrian they ate very well compared to the people here. The husband and wife picked at their meal and watched Randy do the same. Patty wasn't a tuna fan in the first place, and choking it down was a true struggle for her, especially with it being so dry. Charles wound up giving half his meal to a family with three children sitting at the long cafeteria table next to them. The mother's bright blue eyes sparkled with tears as she thanked him. Charles shook his head when he sat down across from Patty. He started to regret his decision about leaving the campus when he saw her dab at the moisture in her eyes. And he really regretted it. After the meal, one of the women in charge of the cooking stepped up on a table and announced that tomorrow's meal would be spaghetti with chunky tomato sauce, and quite literally there was a standing ovation for her. Apparently pasta was a very popular cafeteria meal post-apocalypse. Charles and Patty couldn't help but laugh at the exuberance the people had over boxed pasta and canned sauce. After the meal, many of the people came over and introduced themselves. It took the better part of twenty minutes for Chuck and Patty to shake all their hands and smile and nod. There was no chance either of them would remember any names that night. Charles was feeling the dull ache of his broken arm as he and Patty brought their plastic plates to the window counter looking into the kitchen. A young girl took their plates with a weak smile and started to wash them in a sink. Brian happened to be at the window at the same time with his little girl Sarah and his young son Tommy. Both Patty and Charles realized that the little boy looked just like Brian. Tommy looked as if he were stamped out of a miniature mold of his father. Patty bent down to him and said hello, and the shy little boy hid behind his dad's leg. Charles had a question for the former police chief. Brian, Adrian said he put some painkillers in the package he gave to us when we left. Any chance you know where they are? Brian picked his little boy up and plopped him on his hip. They're probably in the medicine closet upstairs. We keep all that centralized so folks can't overdose. We had a few folks here kill themselves early with sleeping pills, so now we're a little more cautious about it. Head upstairs to the top floor and find Suzanne. She was a pharmacist's assistant before this poo hit the fan. Poo! Tommy exclaimed. That got a laugh out of everyone. Charles grinned at the little kid. All righty, thanks. Where are we sleeping tonight, by the way? Patty asked as she tickled Tommy's exposed belly. All his tiny ribs were visible under the skin. He was so skinny, she thought to herself. If you want, just hang out on the second floor in the main area where the cube farm is. We call it the village. Someone will track you down and show you which place to snag. Space is kind of at a premium, so you might be a little squished for a few days while we figure it all out. Patty and Charles thanked him. Randy had met a few younger boys while they were talking, and they seemed to be hitting it off. Randy had been so lonely the past few months. The few friends he'd made had disappeared or died, and twelve-year-olds desperately need friendships. Perhaps Randy finding friends would be the best reason to have come here. If they could keep him happy, then maybe, just maybe, this was all worth it. They let him talk to the other kids for the better part of a half hour, then headed upstairs. Patty and Randy went to the village on the second floor, while Charles went to find Suzanne and the painkillers he would need to get through the night. It didn't take long to find her. She had made a big sign of the RX symbol on an erasable marker board. She was lying down on a couch reading a paperback novel underneath it. Hi, are you Suzanne? Charles asked her. She was young, barely twenty-one, and really quite pretty. She could have been a model with a little makeup and a nice outfit. She looked up from her book and immediately saw the air cast on his broken arm. Yeah, that's me. You must be the new guy, Charles. Yes, uh, my wife Patricia and son Randall are here as well. They're down in the village right now. Charles was never good at talking to girls. He felt stiff and self-conscious. No matter how many years passed, he always remembered the days of school when he was the tiny kid that was good at math and couldn't play sports. Suzanne sat up and put her book down after dog-earing it. What can I help you with? Well, I got this busted arm here, and I've been taking some pain pills for it, 
and before I go to bed, I wanted to get the bottles, so I had them. His arm throbbed, thinking about having to wait much longer to get the pills. Well, Charles, we don't give out whole bottles. We administer them as needed, kind of like how a hospital does it. If you need a pill, I can get you a pill, and when you need another, we can get you one then. She said it very matter-of-factly. Charles thought about it for a second and realized that wasn't ideal, but would work fine. He knew he was already starting to get hooked on the pills, and maybe this was an easy way of cutting back. That'd be fine. I usually take two pills at bedtime to get through the night, if that's okay. Suzanne stood and fished a key out of her jeans pocket. What are you taking for the pain? Perks, I think. Charles knew, but didn't want to let on that he was just a little obsessed with his little round friends. Well, perks are pretty powerful, and we definitely don't want you to get constipated, so we're probably going to keep you to one a night. Too many perks, and then you need a laxative. We're low on that already. She went into the closet she unlocked and looked around on a shelf. Once she found the bottle she was looking for and got a single pill, she grabbed a bottle of water. It wasn't sealed, but when Charles sniffed it, the water smelled clean. He took the pill and swigged down some water to swallow it. Suzanne smiled at him and Charles thanked her. He hoped one pill was enough to get through the night. They'd given the family a single large cube to live in, without doubt a dramatic decline over the entire dormitory they'd just left at the school. The cubicle was near the corner of the large room most everyone else slept in, which was nice, but it was fairly open and had no ceiling. The cube walls reached maybe five feet high. They had plenty of mattresses, though, and once they got them piled up three high, they had a very comfortable bed. It was a shame none of them were sleeping. Mercifully, Charles blacked out from the Percocet and made it almost four hours before the pill wore off. Part of the trouble of having a broken arm was that he couldn't sleep on his side. It was either on his back or not at all. Every night, without exception, he woke up with a sore arm and a stiff back. There would never be another night where Charles complained about rolling around too much. Charles had been having strange dreams for months. Tonight was no different. He always dreamed of people from his past. Most often, he dreamt of his older brother who had died in a car accident when they were both teens, as well as his parents who had passed away from old age right before Christmas two years prior. Patty was having the same problem. When they discussed their dreams, they both realized that every night when they dreamed about people, they always dreamt about the dead. Neither of them had any dreams since June with their children in them. They thought that was beyond strange and quite freaky. His wife's sniffling did more to wake him up than the pain in his arm did. He knew she was crying the moment he shook the sleep out of his drug-filled head. Her chest was rising and falling slowly, but hitching along the way. She was trying to be quiet. Charles said fuck the pain and rolled over to her. He rested his broken arm along his side as comfortably as he could. He nestled his head on her shoulder under the covers and kissed her temple. She jerked away slightly at the touch of his lips. She did that when she was mad. Charles sighed softly in dismay. From across the cube he could hear his son Randy doing the same thing as his mother. Right before they'd laid down to sleep, Randy had asked if he could stay up late to play Xbox or PlayStation. Patty had asked around if they had one Randy could use, and she was disappointed by the answers she got. They did indeed have them, but they were for use on Fridays only, not enough electricity to run them on the other days. Randy was very unhappy about that. He couldn't sleep. He missed his sister. His new friend Adrian was gone, he couldn't play video games to pass the time, and he blamed Charles for everything. Patty got a pass on the blame from Randy because he knew she was on the fence about leaving the school in the first place. Her hand was forced when the bastards from Westfield blew up the gas station. It just seemed safer here. Charles daydreamed a lot. Late at night, when he was left alone with his thoughts, he wondered about how he could have done things differently. He wondered if he should have gone to college for electrical engineering like his dad wanted, instead of civil engineering. He wondered if he should have bought a house up north where it was cheaper and less populated. He wondered if he should have 
bought a pump shotgun instead of a double barrel years ago. He lamented and second-guessed everything nowadays. All it did was make him feel guilt. He kissed his wife again, and this time she didn't pull away. She'd fallen back to sleep. He pulled gently away from her and shuffled to his son's bed, patting his shoulder. Randy jerked away from his touch, though it seemed to Charles out of fear, not anger. Charles bit his lip and walked away hurt, heading to the bathroom. The lavatory was lit by a small solar power lamp. It cast about as much light as a small candle in the tiled bathroom. He wandered over to the urinal and emptied his bladder. He debated trying to take a shit, but he hadn't eaten a lot of fiber lately, and the painkillers really did have him backed up. He rested his head on the wall in front of him as he shook the piss out of his dick. On his way back to the office cube his family now called home, Charles caught the glint of moonlight off a reflective surface out a window. Intrigued, he shuffled quietly into the office and walked over to the window. A slat in the blinds had been knocked slightly to the side and was letting in a wedge of blue moonlight. From the parking lot below, Charles could see the silver disc shining off a windshield. He reached out and pulled the cord to the side, tugging the blinds away. Below them on the ground for nearly two hundred feet in every direction, all he could see was a mass of the living dead. Charles leaned forward once more and pressed his head against the cold glass. He watched the thousand rotting souls below sway back and forth, slowly shuffling their feet, waiting for a sign of life. He'd watched them do the same thing through the windows at his home a month before. He'd just never seen so many all at once. They reminded him of the beds of kelp under the ocean, swaying with the currents, waiting for the nutrients to come to them. The dead were waiting for the living to come out, and their patience was eternal. Charles woke up with the commotion of the village. Patty had already left the comfort of their ramshackle bed when he sat up, and Charles had a moment of panic when he saw Randy had disappeared too. He couldn't believe it when he saw his watch and realized that it was already noon. He did, however, feel the sharp twinge of pain in his arm. It had been a very long time since he had his last pain pill. Suzanne was nowhere to be found on the third floor. He asked a few random strangers wandering the halls going about their business where she was, and eventually he was pointed to the cafeteria. It was lunchtime, after all. He meandered down there with a scowl from the pain all over his face. Several people gave him a wide berth. Chuck took a wrong turn and wound up doing a loop around the entire first floor. By the time he reached the cafeteria, he was in even more pain, and his frustration had reached a boiling point. He stormed into the cafeteria, ready to rip that Suzanne bitch's head off. Who the hell was she to pretend to be a pharmacist and then disappear when he needed his pills? He saw her sitting at a table with a few other younger girls, laughing and eating their food. His blood was boiling over, and he made a beeline right at her. Dad? He heard Randy call out from the side. Charles looked over and saw Randy coming towards him, dragging a train of kids with him. Charles lost his anger like a feather in the wind. His son was happy. Randy practically flew across the cafeteria and attacked Charles with a hug. His battered red little league cap was turned around backwards, and his freckles seemed extra dark for some reason. He looked like the older brother Charles had dreamt of the other night. It almost made him forget about the legion of dead pressing against the walls outside. Dad, I want you to meet Andy and Jeremy and Jerry and Sam and Chelsea and Alan and Joe. Randy pointed in succession at all the kids arrayed around him. He was so proud of himself. Randy had always struggled to make friends in school. He was hyper and weird. Well, Randy, that's awesome. Uh, hi, kids. Charles gave his son a hug with the good arm, and the kids all said hi in response. Dad, we're going to go play down in the plant. That's where we can play. I think we're going to do capture the flag. Randy was beaming. All Charles could do was smile. Well, what are you talking to me for? There's a flag out there with your name on it. Charles gave Randy a push, and the passel of little people took off running. Charles watched them go with a smile, barely remembering the pain in his arm. He turned and saw Suzanne again, and went over to say hi and ask for his morning pill. 
Twenty feet away, Patty watched her husband smile for the first time in a very long time. The rest of their day was spent trying to fit in. You would think it would be easy to do that, but in reality, it was not. None of the Williams family had spent time around more than two or three other people in recent memory. Patty wound up retracting away and staying quiet most of the time, trying to figure out again how to interject comments into a discussion. She watched as other people casually talked to each other, and she hurt inside when she found herself stammering and breaking in at the wrong times. Everyone was polite to her, but she still felt like an outcast. Patty's former skills as an accountant weren't the most applicable in a world overrun by the dead. However, her time working with Adrian, learning how to use weapons, was very useful. After she professed her skill with the Mossberg Tactical Twenty Two, Adrian gave her, she was sent to the third floor to train as a guard. Charles was much the same. He felt doubly useless because of the broken arm. His inability to strike up conversation or laugh at the jokes the other residents of Stig tried on him made him feel terrible. Add to that his former profession as a designer of roads and drainage ditches had absolutely zero use here, and it made for a pretty toxic cocktail for his self-esteem. Eventually, he was assigned the exceedingly important task of Kid Wrangler. Charles was supposed to hang out in the center of the manufacturing plant and make sure the kids didn't get into anything they weren't supposed to. He was a little insulted. He was an engineer for the state a year ago, making nearly eighty grand a year, and now all he could rate for a job was something his daughter had been doing since she was thirteen. However, he did get to see his son frolic and play for a few hours before an elderly lady came and told them dinner was ready. Dinner was a pretty big deal that night. The spaghetti was a surefire hit with everyone, and just about everyone was present. It was standing room only after just a few minutes. Charles and family were granted table space due to his broken arm. He couldn't stand and hold a plate, nor could he sit on the floor and eat without dropping food on himself. One of the men that Charles recognized as a door guard gave up his seat so they could sit together. Charles and Patty were thinking that maybe just Maybe this could work out. Randy seemed happy. Patty would enjoy protecting everyone. And once his arm was healed up, Charles could do something a little more appropriate. Randy gobbled down his dinner as fast as he could twirl the spaghetti onto his fork. The boy had fun waiting for him back in the plant. The little old lady that relieved Charles before the meal was sitting nearby, and when Randy shot off like a rubber band, she patted Charles on the good hand and followed the boy away. Charles and Patty were left alone in the middle of the crowd. How's it going for you? Charles slurped a few errant strands of spaghetti up. Patty absently twirled her fork, a slow smile appearing on her face. Pretty good, actually. You remember that blonde guy we met last night? His name is Tony. He's the guy training me. He's funny. You'd like him. I get to use binoculars and look for raiders coming into the park or identify zombies that might break the glass. It's tedious, but it feels important, you know. Charles bristled at her guarded happiness. He knew he should be happy for her, but deep down inside he was jealous. She got to guard the entire facility, and he got to guard a few kids playing tag. That's awesome. I'm glad you two are getting along. I'm watching Randy play with his new friends, keep them from hurting themselves in the plant. He shrugged. Patty lit up. Oh, that sounds like fun. Like when we'd bring Abby and Randy down to Abbott Field and they'd run around and fall down and be all stupid with each other. Patricia trailed off as she finished. Bringing up their daughter didn't help anything at all. They sat in silence as the cafeteria around them buzzed with happiness over the carbohydrate feast. Patty could see Brian sitting at the end of a table feeding his two kids one noodle at a time, whipping their face like he was in Devo. She could almost hear them singing the song, too. You could tell he was a good father. It didn't take long to put that puzzle together. Excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Williams? A teenage girl had approached them. She had a worried look on her face. Patty thought she looked like she'd just crashed her dad's car. Yes, dear? Patty asked her. Your son is Randy, right? She bit her lower lip. Yeah? Patty put her fork down. You should come. He's causing a little fuss. The girl motioned towards the doorway, 
towards the plant floor. The two parents stood and let the young girl lead them out. This wasn't the first time they'd been called away because Randy had caused a fuss. Charles muttered some choice words under his breath as they left. But Dad, he called me a nasty name. It's not my fault. Randy struggled mightily to get away from his dad's firm grip. Randy, enough. You're making a scene. Charles was dragging his 12-year-old out of the plant and into the warehouse where there was some privacy. Patty followed them, apologizing to the young boy Randy had decked a few minutes prior. His nose was bloody and tears streamed down his face. Once they were in the warehouse, Charles let Randy go and he jerked away, storming around in a circle. Patty couldn't help but notice the resemblance between Charles and Randy. Both boy and man couldn't stand not getting their way, and it was even worse if they were one-upped in the process. What happened? What gave you the right to punch Alan in the face like that? The tone of Charles's voice was serious. He said I was a fucking retard, Dad. I'm not a fucking retard. Randy spun and spit the words out like venom at Charles. Charles was taken aback by the seriousness in his son's face. First off, you are not a retard. In fact, you are a very fast learner. And second, if you use the F word again, you'll be grounded for a week, buddy. Fuck you, Dad. Where are you going to ground me? Make me stay on the second floor all day? This place sucks. It's just like a prison. I wish we were back with Adrian where we could at least go outside if we were safe. This is going to be just like school, too. Everyone will get sick of me and I'll get picked on. Randy's anger turned to hurt. Patty went to her son and scooped him against her. Mother's hugs always worked better than anything. Patty entered the discussion. Look, mister, if you want to make good friends, then you will. You just have to understand that it takes time and patience to make good friendships. People aren't going to love anyone right off the bat. Randy sniffled and nodded against her chest. He was tired. It had been a long day, and he hadn't played with kids anywhere near his age for months. Abby was his only playmate for the past six months, and she was gone as well. Poor Randy's hyperactive mind couldn't take all the change happening around him, and the added stimulus of new people didn't help. Poor guy had overloaded on reality. Charles inadvertently made a fist with his bad hand and yelped out in pain. He let out a stream of profanity that could curdle milk if any were to be had. Randy looked back at his father with a vaguely evil smirk on his face. Grounded for a week, buddy. Uno was the card game of choice for the Williams family. No other game allowed for blatant cheating, conniving, and tomfoolery in their household. The boys almost always played versus the girls on teams, and it was always a great time for everyone. Stig had a few Uno decks, and when everyone retired to the office area to go to bed, Patty saw one of the decks and snagged it. When the two Williams boys meandered their way back to their family cube, she had the deck all shuffled. They played cards for an hour, and things went very well. Randy and Charles seemed to have gotten over the friction caused by Randy's outburst at his new friend Alan. Patty had even started to forget about the faces of the dead people outside the building. There were a lot of dead faces to forget. When they'd finally reached their full of draw fours, Charles excused himself and went upstairs to find his nightly pain pill. Patty kissed Randy on the head and went into the bathroom to do her business. She looked at her drawn face in the faint light of the solar lamps. Several other women washed their faces using as little water as they could. She did the same. It was refreshing, but she definitely missed taking a shower in the morning. She had no idea how good they'd had it back at the school. If she could only take back her decision to come here. Once she'd wrapped things up, Patty headed back to the cube. While they were playing cards earlier, her new co-worker, Tony, brought over a dark sheet for them to use as a makeshift doorway. She unfolded the sheet and used some of the string he'd left for them to attach it across the way. It took her about ten minutes, but the end result was much more privacy. She let herself into the little home and asked her son out loud what he thought. Randy, what you think? It isn't exactly Fort Knox, but it's better than nothing, right? No answer. She looked over at his bed and realized it was empty. 
Her heart started to sink as the sheet was pulled away. Charles popped in. Knock, knock. He noticed the look on her face. What's wrong? Randy's AWOL. She presented his empty bed. There was a quick knock on the frame of the cubicle. Charles turned and used the good arm to pull the sheet back. The tall, blonde guy with curly hair named Tony was there, smiling. Hey, Patty. Hi, Charlie. His natural charm sickened Charles. Tony, what's up? Patty was mildly irritated at being bothered with a missing kid to deal with. Any chance you could take a few hours off a guard's hand right now? One of the night guys, Gerald, seems to be sick, and we're looking for someone to cover his shift. You game? Tony scratched his ass crack absently as he asked. He may have been good-looking, but he wasn't really what you'd call appropriate around a lady. Patty sighed and rolled her eyes. Now was not the time. Just as she was about to answer him, Charles spoke up and interrupted her. Go ahead. My official job is child wrangler anyway. Plus, he's my kid. Charles shrugged and then winced from the pain in his arm. Patty was frankly a little surprised. She nodded in agreement, picked up the backpack and rifle she got from Adrian, and gave her husband a soft kiss on the cheek. Okay, I'll be back in a few hours, I guess. Uh, you get Randy back here and get some sleep. Okay. Be vigilant, like Adrian used to say. Like he says, Charles. Like he says. He's still alive out there. She smiled and joined Tony. Charles chuckled softly to himself. Yeah, she was right, he thought. If anyone's still alive out there, it's going to be Adrian. That man could eat nails and shit tacks. Tougher than anyone he'd ever met, and with that, Charles meandered off to locate his adventurous son. When Charles had reached the bottom floor of the office building portion of Stig, he was pleasantly surprised to find Brian and Daryl sitting in a waiting area at the bottom of the stairs. The two men were having a conversation when Charles walked past. Hey, Charles, how was day two? Brian asked. Charles stopped and swayed a little bit. The painkiller he'd taken was starting to kick in a bit. Oh, wonderful, Brian. Could be worse, I suppose. I'm in a building surrounded by undead. My job is babysitter. I've got a broken arm, I just lost twelve hands of Uno to my smart-ass son, and now he's gone missing. Brian and Daryl exchanged a laugh. Daryl spoke then. You know, Chuck, I think I saw Randy take off with that little guy, uh, what's his name? Mary and Alex's son. He looked to Brian for an answer. Alan, Brian answered. Charles's face tightened into a frown. They scuffled earlier. I know my son, he's up to no good here. Any idea where they went? Pretty positive they went into the plant. Brian sat forward, picking up on the father's concern. Is this going to be a problem, Charles? You want some help? Yeah, the faster we get to Randy, the less likely we are to break up a fight. Randy isn't a brawler, but he's clever enough to trick Alan into doing something stupid that'll get him hurt. The three men all started towards the hall that led to the manufacturing floor. Charles filled them in on Randy's checkered past in making friends. He'd been diagnosed with a smidge of ADHD and social anxiety years past, and it always became worse around other kids. If you stuck Randy with an adult, though, he was a perfect little angel. The three men entered the two-way doors into the plant and hollered out to the two boys. The only thing they heard was the dull echo of their own voices. They're probably in the back warehouse climbing the leftover racking. Damn kids think they're monkeys. Daryl shook his head and laughed. They started walking towards the rear wall of the plant where the opening into the warehouse was. Ten steps into their journey, they heard a hollow metallic bang from ahead. It almost sounded like someone had smashed a sledgehammer into a metal drum. Brian's face drained of color. That's a gunshot. Oh, shit. Did they try to go outside? Charles blurted. Brian drew his pistol, and the three men took off running. They ran the hundred and fifty feet through the plant, waiting for another bang, but none came. When they burst into the center of the warehouse, there was no one to be found. Daryl pointed to the side of the warehouse, at the hazmat materials room. The heavy door was slightly ajar, and a faint light crept out of the gap. Brian licked his lips and looked at Charles's face. Fuck. They trotted over to the chain door, and Brian dug his keys out of his pocket. He tossed them to Daryl and pointed his weapon at the gap in the doorway. Daryl searched for the key to the heavy padlock and slipped it in the tumbler quickly. 
With a twist, it popped open, and he pulled the chain apart, tugging the doors open and stepping away. Standing with his back to them was little Randy. His arms were at his side and dangling. In his left hand, he held a small silver revolver. The smell of gunpowder was on the air. On the smooth concrete floor at his feet was the body of Alan, the boy he'd punched in the nose earlier that day. Randy stood there, motionless, in front of canister after canister marked Selane gas, extremely combustible. Charles had no words. He knew what had happened and had no idea what to say. He looked right to Daryl and then left to Brian with pleading eyes. Finally, Brian broke the silence. Randy, son, can I get you to put that weapon down, please? His voice was calm, soothing. Randy stood still for what seemed like a millennia before turning to face the two men. His face was covered in a fine mist of blood. Charles noticed there was no emotion on his face, and that frightened him even more than the blood. Randy looked down at the snub-nosed pistol in his hand, then back up at his dad. His eyes questioned and then invaded Charles. Son, do what the chief says, please, Charles asked his boy quietly. Why should I? Everyone else gets to carry a gun around here. Why can't I? Randy's brows furrowed in anger. Brian answered him, Well, seems like you may have shot Alan there, and if you remember from yesterday, Randy, if you point your gun at someone who's alive, you give up the right to have that weapon. Randy looked over his shoulder at the body of the little boy, Alan. But I shot him in the head, guys. It'll be okay. He won't come back. Randy had lost touch with reality. Charles tried to breathe, but couldn't. His son was a murderer. Randy, why'd you shoot Alan? Brian continued to ask questions, trying to keep the boy distracted while Daryl took slow and painful steps into the room, trying to close the gap to the boy. He deserved it. He called me a fucking retard, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of never getting my way. I'm fed up with everyone acting like I'm here to be ignored or picked on. Randy finally exhibited an emotion. Anger. Charles took a step forward. Son, no one is ignoring you. Trust me. I love you, and I want you to be happy, and if I ignored you, then that's on me. Please, don't be angry anymore. Tell me what I can do to make you happy. Charles's heart was breaking. His former actions and decisions were flooding in over him. He felt ten thousand pounds of guilt slowly suffocating him one bad choice at a time. You never even asked me if I wanted to come here, Dad. You and Mom just decided everything. I miss my room. I miss my games. I miss Abby. I miss Gilbert. And I miss Adrian, too. You took my whole life and ruined it. The pistol in his little hand shook with rage. Brian raised his pistol slightly, putting the front gun sight on Randy's legs, ready for a shot should Randy threaten the men. Instead, Randy slowly lifted the gun to his side and pressed the muzzle to his temple. What if I make this decision all by myself, Dad? What if I shoot myself in the head right now? How would that make you feel? At least I have the right to ruin my own life, he yelled, pulling back the hammer on the gun. Charles dropped to his knees on the hard floor, oblivious to the damage he did to his kneecaps. All his soul was bared now, pleading with his son not to do it. God, no. Randy, think of Abby. Think of your mother. If you do this, they'll never get over it. They love you so much, you can't even understand. I love you so much, I can't even tell you. Charles had tears of pain and fear streaming down his face. Daryl had frozen solid, unable to move in the moment. You know what, Dad? You're right. Randy backed away further into the room filled with explosive chemicals. He looked at Daryl and Brian, and suddenly Charles saw fear on his son's face. I'm sorry to make this decision for you without asking for your input, but as you can see, my dad set a bad example for me. As fast as a mongoose, Randy spun and pointed the gun at the dozens of containers of silane gas and pulled the trigger. 
Patty looked out the windows at the mobs of dead people walking around. They seemed far more agitated now than earlier in the day. Tony sat next to her on an abandoned desk, leaning his back against a wall so he could peer out the windows. His expression was emotionless. You think they're acting, you know, weirder than normal? Patty asked him. Well, when you've watched them as much as we have, you start to notice random patterns in their behavior. I know that sounds weird, but they definitely act stranger at certain times, Tony assured her absently. Patty was intrigued. Like when? The last time they acted really weird was when we had that dysentery outbreak a few months back. We had a lot of people die. It was literally shitty. It's almost like they can sense when bad shit's about to go down. Fucking creepy. Just as he finished speaking, the world outside the window gleamed with a bright white light. Patty noticed in the flash of light that all the dead had been looking in the same direction, towards the rear of the plant. She turned to peer in the direction of the burst of light. A terrible roar filled her ears, and she was flung against the frame of the windows in front of her as if the hand of God had reached down and swatted her like an insect. The coppery taste of blood filled her mouth as Patty regained consciousness. Her ears were ringing painfully, and she couldn't hear anything. She realized her body, head to toe, was bruised and battered. Breathing caused a stabbing pain in her side, and she immediately held her breath against the pain. Shallow breaths didn't hurt as much. She was very cold, almost freezing. With tremendous effort, she rolled over on the desk she was lying on. Her confusion was overwhelming. Her hearing was gone. Her body was in pain, and somehow she had gotten on top of a desk outside and somewhere up high. She thought it must be a bad dream. The ringing in her ears faded somewhat as she blinked enough debris out of her eyes to look around. Before her vision cleared, her diminished hearing revealed screams of pain and panic. Dozens of voices cried out in the cold moonlight begging for help. With a grunt and a hundred lightning strikes of pain, she sat up, dangling her legs off the desk. The back end of the office was gone. The doorway to the center of the floor was obliterated, as was the entire floor beyond that. Her blurry eyes cleared more, and she realized the entire back half of the office building was eradicated. Looking up and further away, she saw what remained of the long building that had stretched out into the parking lot. The rough metal skeleton of the factory and warehouse was laid out bare before her, like the ribcage of a fallen giant. A giant crater extended out from the back end where the chemicals had been stored. She was reminded of the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing. Before her, she could see the tattered remnants of the second and first floor of the office building. Bodies of the injured and the dead were cast about like bloody matchsticks. Many were hurt, and most were dead. On the ground, she could see that the tidal wave of undead had flooded into the destroyed building like a dam had broken. They were murdering the few injured on the ground with startling ferocity. The smell of burning flesh and carnage was strong, even over the odor of scorched chemicals. Flames burned all over the ground. Patty could see in the far rear of the building where the fuel storage was, there were jets of flame issuing upwards out of canisters of chemicals. She heard the rumble of an explosion coming and shielded her eyes. One of the cylinders exploded loud enough to rumble her chest. When she looked back, there were sheets of flame on the ground where the flammable materials had landed. They burned in vivid colors, as their toxic chemistry reacted in the fire. It looked like the wrath of an angry god. All Patty could think of was her husband and son. She suddenly felt the pang of guilt over agreeing with Charles and allowing her broken family to come here, bringing them here to die. The pain of leaving her daughter behind transformed into relief. Next to her, she heard a sharp gasp of pain, she turned quickly to see the source and felt her ribs cry out in agony. She froze, solid for a moment, and finished turning in slow motion, breathing carefully. 
Crumpled on the floor of the destroyed office was Tony. She got off the desk and went to him, carefully kneeling at his side, fighting to contain the pain in her side. He was hurt terribly. From face to hip, his flesh was scorched and raw. She could see a shard of metal the size of her hand embedded in his hip, letting dark blood flow out steadily. His eyes were wild with pain, and he reached out to clutch her arm desperately. Words of solace escaped her. Tony painfully inhaled a full chest of air into his lungs and stammered out a single instruction to her. D- d- don't let me, don't let me be, become one of them. Patty's rifle was nowhere to be found. February 4th. I feel like dying tonight, legitimately curling up into a ball and rotting away. I won't, though. I can't. People are depending on me, and I can't give up. I made a promise to myself and Cassie that I would be a better person in her memory, and that's what I plan on doing. I will be the better person. I am a better person. But I'm not good enough yet. There's still work to do before I cash out my chips. Stig is gone. It's just gone. Annihilated. There's almost nothing left there. Everyone is dead. Well, not everyone. On the night of the second, we heard the explosions that destroyed the Stig building. First, there was one huge boom, then a series of smaller ones. Each lit up the night sky like a miniature sunrise. Abby and I sat by the windows watching the glow over the trees and hills for half an hour. We kept trying to radio the Stig folks, but there was no answer. Eventually, Gilbert came over the radio and said he'd be right over. By the time he arrived, Abby was already an emotional wreck. She was sitting in the kitchen at the table trying to contain her sobs and fucking that all up. When Gilbert came in, he went right to the table and sat next to her. He held her hand and let her get it all out. I tried to comfort her, too, but Gilbert had it under control. When he gave her a hug, he and I exchanged glances over her shoulder, and we both knew we had to find out what had happened. Time was a factor. Gilbert got her calm and reasonable, and with a little prodding, we got her focused on the idea of going to find out what happened. Once she got it into her head that we were going to attempt a rescue, she was all fucking business. I think she had to get it all out first or something. We took 20 minutes and came up with a solid plan. We hadn't been across town yet. We knew from the truck the Stig people had drove over here it was a fucking wreck downtown. There was no way a regular pickup like the maintenance plow would make it all that way with, well, without us losing windows or getting the front destroyed. Shit, Worst case scenario, it'd get totaled and we'd be sprinting in January to get home. We felt our immediate best alternative was the heavy rescue truck. We knew we were potentially rolling into a situation with casualties, so the rescue gear aspect was good. There's a door to the rear, as well as the two front cab doors. Also, it's a heavy diesel truck with great ground clearance, multiple rear tires, and stainless steel everywhere. We started loading it immediately. I got the M15, my Glock, and my little cheetah in my ankle holster. I took the Savage as well, if only for the scope. I also remembered to bring my sword this time, too. I realized when I was getting my shit together, I had made a horrible decision the other day in giving them the Marlin and the Mossberg Tac-22. Both were twenty two rifles, and as you'd expect, those were the only twenty two rifles we had. <laughs> Fuck me, right? I'm now sitting on a few thousand rounds of twenty two ammo and a single twenty two pistol to push it all through. Just my luck, right? I always miss some stupid little detail that winds up becoming really relevant later on. <laughs> I wound up grabbing two of the better 12-gauge pump shotguns and a hundred shells or so to go along with them. Abby rolled with her Beretta and every round of ammo we had for it, as well as the twenty-two pistol. I also grabbed the two three fifty seven revolvers we had and put them in the truck. We had a lot of ammo for them, and it made sense to finally put it to use. 
For some reason, I also grabbed the compound bow and the arrows. Why not, right? Not like I had to carry the thing. Gilbert arrived with his trusty forty-five, and I shit you not, an AK-47. I know, Mr. Journal. I fucking knew it. Strapped across his chest, he also had an old-school NVA magazine bandolier filled with clips. It couldn't have been more appropriate. Well, if he had a red bandana on, as well as a bow and a giant knife, it might have been better, but all things considered. He didn't say shit when he sat down on the table. I just laughed. Abby was like, dude, what the fuck? Too funny. We already had medical gear packed into the truck, and we snagged shit like rope, a few halligans, and other stuff we thought we'd need. I grabbed a few of the converted milk jugs I'd filled with water, as well as enough food to last a day or two. Lots of granola bars, candy bars, and canned shit we could eat without cooking. Never know when you'll be back. I double-checked to make sure we had enough fuel in the truck, and we were off. I drove, Gilbert rode shotgun, and Abby rode in the back area, moving about to keep an eye on things. Stig is on the other side of town. There are two ways to get there from campus. The first route is to go straight down Main Street and across the length of town in the most direct fashion. The second route is to get on the side roads and move through the residential side streets. Indirect, but based on what we've seen ourselves and what Brian said earlier, those streets had less undead. We decided the side streets were our safest bet. We drove past the burnt-out husks of the gas station and headed east down Route 18. At the Main Street turnoff, we hung a right and drove into the same area the grocery store's in. Across the street near there is Wyman Street. Wyman cuts up around downtown and links to the streets that make up the grid of downtown. We turned on to Wyman, and that's when things got ugly. First off, None of these roads had been plowed yet. The only path through the snow was the tire tracks and pushed-away areas made by the Stig truck. Luckily, the heavy rescue truck is smaller than their box truck. Wyman is right after the police station and is right where we saw the huge mob of undead congregated when we came down here before. They weren't as packed in as they were that day, but there were quite a few. I slowed the truck down to about 15 miles an hour and told everyone to hold on. It was awful. Watching all the dead faces as they reached up over the hood at us was not a good experience. We'd hit them, and most either got knocked down or ran over, or they hung on for a bit, clutching whatever they could. When they finally went under the truck, however they went, we just drove right over them, completely missing them. Some of them, though, we ran them right over. Two bad things about running over dead people in a large truck— one, they crunch and pop in the most visceral and gross fashion. The first one is gross. The next ten are mind-numbing, and after that, your humanity takes a serious hit. Caustic experience. And two, they turn into huge speed bumps, and trucks suck at taking speed bumps. I think it was our fifth or sixth body when Abby was launched into the ceiling of the truck like a piston. She's got a fucking egg on her grape the size of my thumb. Shit, I love making food comparisons. Maybe I'm hungry. The shocks on that truck couldn't deal with the damn lurching, and we had to slow down even more. Slowing down was bad. That gave the damn zombies time to reach up as we drove by, and many grabbed onto the mirrors. Once they started to grab the mirrors, many began to step on the gas tank steps, and then they were at the windows. We caught on to that shit storm before it fully developed, though. Gilbert cracked his window and started to blast the heads off anything that made it to the point of grabbing something to hold on to. I pulled my Glock and did the same, but it was really hard to drive, shift, and shoot, so we wound up having Abby lean over my back with the twenty-two pistol and do the dirty work on my side herself. She was also wedged in there so tight when we drove over a dead body, she couldn't move. Plus, the snap of the twenty-two going off was a lot more reasonable in the cab than the boom of the forty-five. Once we got the system down and barreled through the first thousand yards of undead, it was smooth sailing. Well, smooth-ish. Don't get me wrong, there was still a lot of toe-pushing going on. I can't hear out of my left ear today. Abby's twenty-two pistol going off over and over has beaten the eardrum into submission for a while. After we turned off Wyman and started to make forward progress towards the industrial park, 
things got noticeably better. We actually got into some open spaces where I could gun it, and we made up some good time. That little breath of air allowed us to reload all our guns as well, which was nice. I had to turn on the wipers, too. We had a lot of red and black spray on the windshield from shooting the dead. Fucking nightmare. Moving through the side streets from there until we got back onto Main Street was fairly easy. A few scattered walking undead here and there, which we either clipped with the truck or just drove around entirely. Didn't make sense to shoot them. I kept thinking of how I went on my drive-by shooting spree the day I went to Moore's and blew through like a hundred rounds of 9 millimeter For nothing, too. I mean, there was no reason to do it. Not making that mistake again. We encountered a heavier crowd once we got onto Main Street again. The scary part was the glow in the sky coming from somewhere ahead. Shit, by then we knew it was coming from the industrial park. Remember, Mr. Journal, we haven't had nighttime electricity in almost, what, seven months? There's been no familiar orange glow of downtown in the sky at night, just black sky filled with the pinpricks of a billion stars. It's actually one of the few things I like about the world ending. A sky filled with stars. After skirting downtown, I had a new appreciation for the two trips the Stig people took to get to us. They were really serious about making friends with us. I mean, shit, there's a really good chance of shit going really badly on that run. Anyway, we turned on to Main Street again and had another, I don't know, maybe mile or two to go before we reached the turnoff to the park. From the street, Gilbert and I were slack-jawed. We'd been here before, and from what we could see... Things were very wrong. The entire plant portion of the building was gone, except for a few of the girders that supported the walls. The ceiling supports had melted or were melting down to the ground. The cars parked in the rear parking lot alongside the plant had been tossed aside and flipped over like child's toys. One was tipped up on its end and leaning against a tree. Several were stacked haphazardly on each other like matchboxes. The front portion of the building used to be all glass, steel, and concrete. Only the very front of the building was in any kind of shape you could call intact. A few of the panes of glass were still there out of the hundred that made up the sides of the building. Most were shattered and blown out from some tremendous explosion. Stacked up in all directions around the building were the twisted remnants of what looked like warehouse racking. Looked to me like they might have built obstacles around the building with it. That was pretty smart, actually. The back end of the office complex portion of the building was smashed out like a giant ice cream scoop had been taken to it. A giant gouge was just gone from it. You could see the exposed floors and interior walls. Papers flew around in the wind and fires burned all over the place. Pools of flame covered the parking lot in slicks the size of backyard swimming pools. Shit, some of the trees in the other parking lots were on fire. It was like Dante's Inferno. Abby had no idea what the building used to look like. The only thing she saw was the horde of undead. They had to be fifty deep and spread out over an area the size of a car dealership. They were moving about in the area like inhuman vultures, picking over the giant bones of the dead building. When we finally turned into the industrial park, I killed the headlights and we crept forward using the light from the fires to guide our way. Abby started sniffling and at that point it was pretty obvious we wouldn't be pulling anyone out of here alive. We skirted the stig area and came around the backside of the building. The undead were pressing into the torso of the building right where the offices met the plant. You could see them attacking something, but there were too many dead people to make anything out. I'm glad. That's the kind of memory you wouldn't be able to shake. (sighs) I stopped the truck about a hundred feet away from the undead and had Abby hand me the savage. All three of us got out of the truck and we set up a small ten-foot perimeter while I scanned the ruins for signs of life. I knew there would be nothing on the ground level alive, so I went right to the second floor. I panned across the floor and didn't see anything alive. I did see more undead there, though. I noticed a small flash of movement from the top floor and brought the scope up. It was Patty. 
She was sitting on a desk waving the remnants of a shirt or towel in our direction. She was clearly favoring her side as she waved, and she looked like she'd been ridden hard and put up wet. That woman looked bad. However, she looked alive. I played dumb for the moment about seeing her because I didn't want Abby to freak. I waved back at her, but she didn't see me. We would have to seriously risk being noticed by the dead to communicate with her. I thought about it for a few seconds, and Gilbert caught on that I'd noticed something. He quietly asked what was up, and I said there was a survivor on the third floor. He thought about it for a minute, and then I remembered the bow. I hopped in the truck, grabbed a roll of ace bandages, and found a sharpie in a case. I wrote on the bandage, Getting the ladder truck to rescue you, back in three hours or so, can you thin the herd, stay strong. I wrapped the message tight around the arrow and then taped it with medical tape. On the outside of that, I wrote, Read me. I got out of the truck and sat the savage on the hood. I took a few seconds to scan the surroundings and lined up my shot with a regular arrow. It was about 200 feet, maybe. Not a mile, but fuck, it was easily the longest shot I'd ever taken. I let the test arrow fly, and it came up short. In fact, it landed square in the shoulder of a dead guy walking around underneath Patty. I actually had to stifle a laugh. I lined up a second test arrow, and this time I hit the side of the desk next to her. She turned suddenly, saw the arrow hit, and then half dove, half rolled into cover. I think she thought I was trying to kill her. I grabbed the good arrow, lined it up a little higher for the added weight of the new bandage, and let the bitch fly. It soared up into the night sky and came down just on the fucking edge of the ripped-out floor near the desk. After a minute of waiting, Patty finally came out from her cover and saw the arrow. She got the arrow unraveled, and I watched her in the scope. After a minute of pawing around, I saw she had the Mossberg twenty-two with her. I also saw her put her backpack on the desk, and if memory serves, she should have had that box of 500 rounds in there. About a minute later, I watched her line up a shot and start shooting slowly into the crowd of undead beneath her. I was so absorbed with watching her, I didn't notice that the undead had realized we were there. Abby barked out, Get in the truck! Go! And I snapped, too. Abby had the twenty-two out and started to shoot clean and slow as she backed up. Gilbert let loose about fifteen rounds at head height into the rushing mob and hightailed it as fast as an old guy can into the truck. I grabbed the 357 off the driver's seat and blasted five more down as she climbed in the truck. I got the door shut when the zombies were about 15 feet away. I tossed that pig into gear and we headed out. Abby was brilliant and wedged herself right behind me again, so when we hit the mass of undead bodies, she didn't get launched into the ceiling again. We had a decision to make right then. Do we attempt to clear out the undead? Do we use firearms or attempt to grand theft auto them to death? I made the decision in my head almost instantaneously to just floor it. I didn't want to fuck around with running over something and getting a flat tire doing donuts in the goddamn snow. I took a wide arc and probably ran over about 25 undead. I don't think they all died, but maiming them is a great benefit as well. I felt that was a good start, and we headed back to campus. To shake the undead following us, I swung around the parking lot, essentially leading them to the rear of the building. Once I had enough back there, I swung around again and floored it, sending everyone else sliding around in the truck. I gunned it around the edge of the parking lot, back into the industrial park road, and swung back onto Main Street. The undead we passed on the way to the plant were in the road. They'd followed us to the plant. I kept the accelerator pinned to the floor, and we plowed into the wave of undead like a battering ram. Bodies exploded on the front of the truck like they had dynamite taken to them. We smashed over and through them and cleared the heavy crowd in seconds. Once we passed that huge crowd, we were in the clear. Well, it was clearer on the way back than it was on the way there. We'd hit a lot of dead people on the way and broken a lot of legs. Most were in the road crawling and scratching their way, and we just plowed over them. The truck shook and shuddered like a bastard, but we made it through the back streets and out Wyman to the other end of Main Street in one piece and without having to shoot from the windows much. The west end of Main Street out to Route 18 was pretty much empty. I gunned it as fast as I could to get some space between us and them. I didn't want them to follow us back to the campus. During the drive after we got off Main Street, I told Abby her mom was alive. I waited until there to tell her because I needed her focused for the area of greatest danger. 
She was beyond relieved and just short of neurotic about hurrying up. We knew we were on a clock to get her safely back. When we arrived on campus, we already had a plan. I drove the heavy rescue truck straight to the ladder truck, and we moved everything over as fast as we could. We knew we'd need heavy firepower and a way to either destroy the undead rapidly or distract the shit out of them. Gilbert had the idea of taking one of the fuel barrels and simply dumping the fuel on them to set them on fire, but that wouldn't be conclusive enough. They might not burn to death, and as I've gone into in depth about already, a burning zombie is worse than a regular zombie. Thus, a burning mass of zombies is... We didn't have enough ammunition to shoot them all either. Driving over them was an option, but that was inviting serious risk. Once when Kevin and I were on patrol in the Al Mansur district, our Humvee drove over a dead body and a shard of bone went right through a tire. Couldn't afford it then, and we can't afford it now. However, I did have an idea. We grabbed the shit and formulated our plan. We would set up a noisemaker on Main Street past the industrial park and then turn around and return for our run. We'd drive in the parking lot, smash our way through it to get their attention, and drive very slowly back into the street heading east and to our noisemaker. We would hopefully leave the crowd there at the noisemaker and then slowly do a loop around a few streets there to come around behind the zombies and hopefully slip into the stig lot with a lot less company. The return trip through downtown was a little rougher than our previous exit. It was like we had a huge train of undead just wagging back and forth as we went through the urban areas. We headed east, they headed east. We went west, then they did. So we essentially returned into what amounted to a crashing wave of undead. We couldn't go around and once we came into the pack, so I punched it again. This crowd was deep, at least ten or twelve deep, and spread out over about fifty yards. I could swerve a little, but in reality, I just wanted to smash them apart. The ladder truck doesn't have an open interior to the back like the rescue truck. We had two rows of seats instead. Abby was belted into the back, and Gilbert and I were in the front. When we hit the bodies and started running over them, it wasn't as bad as before. We were jostled around. I think the larger, heavier truck helped as well. Less hopping, more crushing. When we got close to the park, I had Abby get the noisemaker ready. We drove past the park, heading east, and threw out the second part of our trade secret noisemaker system. I pulled a U-turn and hung a right into the park and plowed right into more of the undead. They'd been thinned out noticeably here. We heard a few cracks of gunshots ahead, and I knew Patty was still kicking. Abby hollered out some pretty vulgar shit about how insanely badass her mom was, and Gilbert and I laughed. It was like we had a third penis in the truck with us. After I busted through the last big batch, we slowed down to let the rats get behind the Pied Piper. Abby took the battery-powered radio and rolled down the window. Like a monkey, she climbed out and got on the roof of the truck with Lady Gaga blaring. I'd found the old-school boombox in a dorm room sometime in July and had it stored away for just an occasion like this. To the tune of Love Game, we rolled like pimps into the slaughter. Yes, Mr. Journal. I realize that line makes me look like I should be drinking out of a sippy cup, wearing a helmet and a drool bib. At the very least, I could get my man card revoked for saying that. Dude, I gotta dress it up somehow. What's left of my manhood is at stake. Poor Abby froze her faux penis off up there. Is that a strapadictomy? <laughs> or an adedictomy? <laughs> Luckily, we didn't go far. We had the crowd on us, scratching at the truck and grabbing on as best they could. Gilbert had the window down and was plugging away on his side of the truck with one of the three fifty seven revolvers. He'd blast a cylinder's worth of rounds, roll the window up, reload, and go back at it. He probably blew the heads off thirty zombies as we rolled in a circle, gathering the undead. When we turned back onto Main Street, I hollered to Abby to hold on, and I gunned it until we had about forty feet of space between us and them. We went to the spot we'd prepared as our noisemaker area, and Abby got down off the truck. We'd thrown a small tent out into the street, one of those two-person tents that spring open when they're thrown. Abby got off the roof lickety-split, and Gilbert opened the back door for her. She set the radio inside the tent and zipped it shut. Gilbert opened up with his AK to our rear and cleared the closest undead. 
Abby and Gilbert got into the truck and I drove about 30 feet and killed the lights. At that point, we were at the mercy of whether or not paparazzi was a more powerful draw to the dead than an idling fire truck. Through the mirrors, I watched about 80% of them stop cold at the tent and lay into it. They pushed at it, swiped at it, hit it, and even tried to bite it. The snow was so thick and the nylon so smooth, they couldn't get in. Eventually, they were piled in the middle of the road on the tent, almost ten bodies deep. I carefully put the truck into gear and we slowly pulled away. We were stifling our laughter to make less noise. About fifty feet further, we took a right and started to loop around some side streets to come up behind them to get into the industrial park. We had about twenty-five zombies follow us when we pulled away, but that wasn't that bad, really. Once we were out of eye shot, I hit the lights and picked up speed. Those streets were completely devoid of undead. My bet was the undead at the plant had come from there, and other places, I'm sure. You you get my point. When we got to the other side of the loop, I killed the lights, and we crept up behind the undead pig pile on the tent. They entirely ignored us as we pulled into the park. It reminded me of rednecks trying to catch a greased pig. They couldn't get in the tent, and the harder they all tried, the worse the cold nylon slipped away. As long as the CD kept playing, we were golden. Back at the Stig plant, Patty had the good sense to stop shooting when we led them away. We pulled around and saw there was about fifteen undead milling about on the ground below her. They were fixated on her. It was almost like watching a blood-soaked cat that was staring at a caged bird. Creepy. We drove right up next to the ruins of the office building and hopped out. The undead didn't pay any attention to us until we actually got out of the truck, which was weird. Once we did, they literally snapped their gazes over to us. I actually recognized some of them as people from town, which was awkward for me. I got the bow up and into action as Abby started to work on getting the ladder up. I let loose about five arrows with the bow. At point-blank range, it's hard to miss, and I'm happy to say I hit and killed with all five arrows. Now, I will also go on to record here and say that two of my arrows missed their intended targets and killed other zombies that happened to be in the line of fire, but frankly, there are no pictures in this journal, and only the score at the end of the game matters. After the fifth arrow, they were too close to use the bow on, so I drew the sword. I desperately wanted to keep as quiet as possible. Gilbert kept one eye on me and one eye on Abby to make sure we weren't being surrounded. Wearing my heavy winter jacket makes me feel kind of invulnerable to being bitten. It's thick and padded, and with gloves on, I feel really warm. Not that warmth equates to safety. I just felt it needed mentioning that I felt warm. I took the sword and hacked the legs off the leading three or four zombies. Like I said a while back, moving in 90-degree angles confuses the shit out of them. Plus, it leaves their knees exposed to a slash. Once I had him down, I checked the ladder and saw it was about halfway up. I hollered out to Gilbert to ask how much time we had before the zombies in the street got to us, and he said plenty. I hacked a few more zombies to death after I lured them away from Abby. By then, there were maybe four or five left, and Abby hollered out, Ladders up! I stopped to go to the ladder, but she hollered out again, I got it! Kill the damn zombies! When I looked back at her, she was already heading up the ladder to get her mom. Time was no longer a factor. We had to kill fast and get the fuck out. I tried to sheathe the sword, but it wouldn't go in. I wound up dropping it and drawing the glock. A few shots later, the zombies were dead. Gilbert hollered out, They heard that! I returned to the truck and got the M15 and shouldered it. On the second level of the office building, there was maybe seven or eight undead, and Abby stopped halfway up the ladder to deal with them. I could hear the snap of the twenty-two pistol in her hands. She calmly popped each and every one of them in the head as they reached up at her on the ladder. I actually got hit in the face by falling brass, and I've still got a little round or cylindrical burns on my face. Gilbert and I moved to the back of the truck where the ladder was, and we started to lay down fire into the massive crowd of zombies heading into the park. Gilbert and I shot as slowly as we could. It was about a hundred yards of space, and we wanted to pick off the leading walkers accurately. Gilbert took the 9-12 to firing corridor, and I went 12-3. to I think we got about a magazine each worth of bodies down when we heard Abby struggling with something on the ladder. I turned, and she's coming down the ladder, basically dragging a dude on his back behind her. He was fucked up bad, but still alive. Patty was coming down right after him, and she was all messed up, too. Abby, Patty, and I had this weird exchange at the back of the truck, like, who the fuck? 
I don't know. What the fuck? Mom said so. What the fuck, Patty? Just grab him. Fuck that. Fuck you. Fucking A. (laughs) I grabbed the dude's collar and dragged him with one arm around to the front of the truck. I could tell by the way his legs sat at it was busted. Abby climbed into the back seat of the truck, and between the two of us, we got his half-conscious ass dragged up and into the seat. I emptied the few rounds left in my magazine into the crowd of ridiculously close undead, and we all piled into the damn truck. I told Abby to keep one eye and a gun barrel on the dude in case he bit it. I guess that was a bad choice of words. Patty assaulted Abby. Good lord, they cried and hugged and loved and all that craziness. Gilbert wound up pointing his pistol at the burnt dude while they rediscovered their lost relationship. I drove the damn truck. I spun us in a circle, told the hugging mother and daughter to hold on, and I hit that wall of undead like a fat kid wrecking a cake. Undead flew everywhere like frosting through a chip shredder. It was awesome. Once we made it through there, it was almost entirely clear. We'd either shot or hit so many fucking zombies the herd was super thin. Patty said she had maybe a quarter of her box of ammo left, which meant she'd shot almost 400 herself. That poor woman. That poor rifle barrel. Serious soldier action there, though. Tough broad. We made it back through town and onto the other side of Main Street clean. Route 18 was smooth sailing, as was Auburn Lake Road. When we finally got back to campus, I'd learned the burnt dude was Tony, and he was a guard in the Stig building. We got him out of the truck and into Hall E's living room. Patty molested me some, then she molested Gilbert some. She told us probably ten times that night how there was some kind of explosion. You know what that means, right? Sean, oh Sean, you done fucked up, brother. More on that later. Patty and Abby blacked out on the couch holding each other. Gilbert and I couldn't sleep. I gave the Tony guy some first aid, but to be frank, I'm giving him a snowball's chance in hell of even coming back to consciousness. One whole side is burnt to shit. His left leg is broken down near the ankle, and I know for a fact it'll never heal right without surgery. He's got a shard of metal in his hip the size of a deck of playing cards, and he's lost a lot of blood. I got an IV going in him, and he sucked the damn thing dry in minutes. Gilbert and I discussed what the hell we were going to do as the sun came up. Hard to believe it, but we were up all night. We'd had the good fortune of bad weather rolling in. Pretty much as soon as we started talking, the snow started to fall. Tony's color came back after a few hours, and then Patty woke up. She told us all about Stig, and I was kind of shocked. From what I heard, it sounded like they were eventually going under. They were consuming food faster than they could scavenge it or grow it, and... Patty said a lot of the folks didn't expect them to make it through winter. Great building, shitty location. Brian wasn't kidding when he said they needed us more than we needed them. Now that he's dead, I'm not sure he was right. Patty said she'd take over watching Tony, and Gilbert and I passed out. I got about five hours of sleep and woke up in the early afternoon. Patty was with Tony, and he was still out. Abby was sleeping on the couch, and Gilbert was out cold on the recliner with Otis in his lap. Guess he can't be a complete turd if Otis still likes him. I showered, then Abby was up, and she showered, and then Patty showered, and we all sat around like we were at a funeral. Not far from the truth. Everyone was on pins and needles all night waiting for the Westfield assault force to roll in. I got the guns cleaned, and we all took stock of our fucked-up lives. Turns out, we're miserable. We went through a lot of ammo on that run. Worth it, though. We got Patty back. That's enough for me. Both trucks were filthy with carnage, but they took fuck all for damage. I mean, with a good washing, they'll be fine. That night, we posted guard at the bridge after getting the plywood planks back into place. We knew that they were aware of them, but that doesn't make them useless. It's like barbed wire. The enemy can see it, and it still slows them down. Cuts down their options for attack. I took the first half and Hall A's furthest window, nearest the bridge. There was no way anyone could get across the river right now, and the lake is covered in two or three feet of loose snow. Nothing came. Patty took over at 4 a.m., and she said nothing happened either. The snow lasted through the entire night as well, and kept on during the day. I'd say we got a foot or more. Earlier today, we began our plan to strike back at Sean. We're in a pickle here. Once I told them about the unloaded guns on the patsies at the gas station, everyone knew the stakes had been raised. 
The basic idea is this. We can't go in their guns blazing without more info. If Sean is setting people up to die, then he has an agenda and enemies on the inside. Now, it's not always the rule, but as the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I think in this case, it's damned applicable. What we need is inside info. I need to know what's going on in there. Then I need one bullet to end this. McGreevy's rifle dish out a little bit more justice if I have my way. I need more time to plan this, though. And time is something I don't know if I have. I'm exhausted. I need rest. I, however, would like to end this journal entry on a positive note. Team Vagina is bloodied, but not dead. (laughs) Adrian. February 6th. You know, I lost my fucking sword. I've got the long sword I brought from home still, but it's huge compared to the small one that's gone. I can't imagine carrying that thing around all the time, especially getting in and out of vehicles. On foot, yeah, sure, but in vehicles, the scabbard alone is a pain in the ass. I think the blade was bent the other night at Stig anyway. I shouldn't complain. I got really good mileage out of it. Best 300 bucks I've spent in a long time. Not that I've spent any money recently. The world is on sale. Free for the taking, as it were. What's that, Mr. Journal? How am I? How's life? Life sucks. But I'm alive, and so are some of the people I care about, so I guess all things considered, it could be much worse. Yesterday, last night, and today, we've had at least one of us on guard, watching and waiting to be hit. We've upped our patrols to three a day to look for footprints or movement of any kind. We've seen nothing. The paranoia is a motherfucker, though. It's worse than before when we were waiting for them to show up. They raised the ante considerably when they hit the gas station in Stig. Fucking Sean. I'll watch him bleed out before all this is said and done. Mark my words, Mr. Journal. I want that asshole's blood running in the snow. Yesterday, Tony got a little better. He woke up for a few minutes and talked to Patty. He was grateful to be alive, but in a lot of pain. We won't leave him alone on the outside chance he kicks the bucket. Mostly, Patty has been his babysitter. She's got at least one busted rib, and any kind of movement blows for her. We've got her chest wrapped up tight, which helps some. She's been relaxing with him in the living room of Hall E, making sure he's still alive. As I said, he got a lot better yesterday, but he slipped into a fever overnight. He's just got too much damage to fix. We're wasting medicine and food keeping him alive, and I hate to say it, but his suffering needs to end. Soon. Patty can't see the light on this yet, and it's making things a little uncomfortable for Gilbert and I. Combat triage isn't easy for anyone to deal with, but it's a fact of life. I'm feeling very disorganized in my head. I haven't been sleeping well at all, and with the stress and sudden changes going on, I frequently feel like I'm a spectator inside my own head. It's almost like I don't realize something's happened until after, and then I'm trying to recall it. I forgot to put the magazine in my M15 this morning when I went on patrol and didn't realize it until I was a hundred yards outside the building. I gotta get my shit together here or I'm gonna die. I really need to get some sleep. When I've been sleeping, I'm having those shitty-ass dreams again. Lots and lots of violence, lots of arguing with people, and tons of just really odd bullshit. When I don't wake up freaking out, I wake up confused and sad. I think I might go back to taking something to help me sleep, because I can't function on three hours of sleep broken up over the night. I can't focus at all. One thought keeps fucking with me. I never asked Brian if Cassie was there at Stig, or if Steve was for that matter. I haven't been listening to the radio at the time Steve said he'd broadcast, but honestly, with the state repeaters down, he'd need to be within ten miles or so anyway. If he was within ten miles, he'd fucking stop by. He knew I worked here. Simple reality is that Steve is probably dead. And as far as Cassie's concerned, well, I'm hopeful she's either holed up somewhere safe or she's been dead for a long time. Those lines of thought allow me to get some sleep at night. Yesterday we accomplished jack shit, resting and trying to stay vigilant for an attack. I did get Abby, Patty, and Gilbert keys for Hall E, though. 
I think we're at the point where they can have keys to their own home. Today was more of the same bullshit, really. Well, Patty and I got into it. Like I said, she really wants this Tony kid to survive. I can totally see where she's coming from, too. They were trapped on the top floor of the Stig building and had this intense bonding experience, and they kept each other sane, and I'm sure her motherly thing is going crazy, too. Here's the thing. He's dying. We can't break his fever, and he's got severe burns on at least a quarter of his body. We've already gone through several of the IV bags from the heavy rescue truck, and it's not like those things are growing on trees. Which reminds me, apples grow on trees. Something to look forward to if I live to fall. We managed to get the hung of iron out of his hip and get the wound packed. But the dressing needs to be changed at least once and probably twice a day to prevent infection. Speaking of which, he's so susceptible to infection right now, it isn't funny. Burn victims have their immune system so compromised, hence the hospital burn unit idea. It's much cleaner there than in the rest of the hospital. And he has a busted-ass leg, which we can't do fuck all about. Even if he heals from the burns and heals from the chunk of his hip missing, he'll be on crutches at best for the rest of his life. Realistically, the man will be a burden on us if he survives. I hated to be callous about him to her, but he's going to drain our medicine, our supplies, and our food. She screamed some. Abby intervened, and the two women had a moment together. I apologized for being a dick about it, and that helped some. I can be very black and white when things are bad. It's like the way I cope with ambiguity. Pick a course of action and ride it. Even if it rides me into the sun, I need to see it through no matter what. Cassie said I was pig-headed more than once. No arguments for me about it. I can be an asshole. I am not perfect. The human being in me wants him to make it and spring off the couch like a jackrabbit. I would love to have another young and able-bodied man to help around here. I'm fed up with always being the muscle. Patty keeps saying he'd be a great guard, too. I guess he was a spotter or shooter over there before the shit hit the fan. I guess it'd be nice if he miraculously came through, but with the fever he's running and his wounds, he's got shit stacked against him. I just heard a gunshot outside. Be right back. Adrian. February 6th, Second Entry Abby was on guard and took down a zombie that had wandered to the bridge. That can't be a good sign. Feeling like the undead we encountered downtown may have followed us a little further than I would have liked. I really don't want us to waste ammunition on more random wandering undead. Abby and Patty are on strict instructions to use twenty twos to kill if they have to. We've got a ton of it to use, so it makes no sense to use anything else until absolutely required. Glad she's got good eyes still. It's almost 9 p.m. right now, and she saw it in the dark like nothing. I am so glad the two women are still alive. I can live without Chuck, especially the way he and I left it. And I must admit, I do miss Randy. He was a little weird, but a lot of kids are at that age. It's tough to grow up, especially in middle school years. Just a giant torture chamber, really. Everyone's either popular, fat, gay, nerdy, or retarded. Everyone gets assigned a category. Nothing is as cruel as school children. Can't blame the kid for plugging into the Xbox. It's the 6th tonight, and hopefully tomorrow we can start laying down the plan to deal with Sean and the Westfield folks. Gilbert said he's swirling some ideas around in his melon, and I am as well. Gilbert kept saying that we were combat ineffective, though, and he's right. Patty's useless for a week, at least, with the bad rib, and, well, with Tony here, we can't do much. We certainly can't leave him alone, Gilbert, God bless him, is old as hell. He's a good shot and sharp as attack, but as far as combat operations are concerned, he can't really be relied on. He's a hamburger away from a heart attack at his age. Oh, God, hamburger. I would murder for a grilled burger right now. (laughs) Fuck my life. Planning, scheming, trying to stay sane. More on that front tomorrow, Mr. Journal. Adrian. February 7th. Tony died today. After I rotated out of my shift on watch, I did a patrol of campus, then went back to Hall E. Gilbert's been staying there with us to help out. 
and when I returned from the patrol, he met me at the outer door. His face was long, and he had the, son, something bad happened, look on his face. I can distinctly recall the same expression on my own dad's face when my grandfather died. I asked him if it was Tony, and he said, yeah. Guess it happened while I was out on the patrol. He went peacefully, which is good. I guess Patty had fallen asleep, and Gilbert had that feeling Tony was about to kick, so he was sitting near him. When Gilbert noticed he'd stopped breathing, he got Patty awake and got her out of the room. He wrapped a hand towel around Tony's head, took a folding knife, and did him in the eye. Fortunately, dead people don't bleed much, so the towel caught all the blood. I've got the nagging question in the back of my head about whether or not Gilbert did him manually, though. Patty was gone. It was just him and Tony. Gilbert easily could have killed him while he was passed out. That idea doesn't bother me in the least, though. Gilbert and I both knew one way or the other. Tony's time was short. I'm just glad Gilbert said he went peacefully, naturally or otherwise. Patty was still upstairs crying about it, and while I had the chance, I took Tony's body outside. I went and got the four-wheeler, got him in the small trailer, and drove him out to the staff housing area where I put the bodies from before. I guess I'll start another pyre when I get a big enough stack. We've already started a decent pile with the roamers coming back up into the campus area. I sure hope there isn't an army of the fuckers walking up Auburn Lake Road right now. I'd drive down to look, but the noise might attract them in. This is so fucking draining. I don't care if Westfield rolls in here with a dozen Abrams tanks tonight. I'm taking a fucking Ambien. I can't deal with this right now. Adrian. February 9th. Patty's been weirder since Tony died. I think she was really attached to him. Abby thinks it's because he was like a remnant of Randy and Charles. Sort of the last tie to the events at Stig, or a crutch, keeping her up over Charles and Randy's death. I don't know about that, but Patty's definitely pretty broken up. Mind you, Mr. Journal, that she was already coping with the death of her husband and son. She's definitely gone quiet. I catch her every so often, just sitting there, staring out a window, kneading her hands together. Poor woman. She's so strong, though. Doesn't want anyone to think she can't function. She doesn't want to be a burden on anyone. She doesn't know what happened at Stig. She does know that she didn't see anyone sneaking around near the place when it blew. She and Tony were on watch in a corner office when we found her that night. She said she saw nothing. That either means they snuck in from a totally different angle to hit the plant, or it was some kind of inside job. Doesn't change anything. Abby's taking it all in stride. At least that's what she thinks she's fooling us into thinking. I can tell she's under tremendous pressure. She doesn't want to let us down, and she wants to show her mom that everything will be okay. I wish I could tell everyone things will be okay, but fact of the matter is, I don't know if it will be. Yesterday we had some more snow, and as long as it snows, Westfield will struggle to get here for an attack. That's a relief. The shitty part about yesterday was the three zombies we had to kill. Our nail boards have become useful for more than flattening tires. All three zombies got their feet stuck on the plywood sheets covered in nails. Luckily, it was all on my watch in Hall A in the morning, and I took my longsword out and had me some beheading action. After that, I had me some stacking zombie bodies into the four-wheeler action, and after that, I had me some stacking more bodies on my funeral pyre action. Fuck this shit, right? We got through yesterday without firing any guns, which was great. Can't help but think that any kind of gunfire will lead more and more up here. I wonder how many undead were drawn to the Stig building instead of up here while I was clearing houses out back in December. I'm betting they were making a lot more noise than me. Poor fucking people. Gilbert slept all day yesterday and took over for the evening for me. Patty has been resting in Hall E, steadily going crazy. She wants to help with the watches, but she can't breathe for shit with the busted side. She says it's much better now, but I don't believe her. I made us our first meal since the majority of the Williams family left for Stig. We'd been eating out of cans since then. 
I warmed us up some cans of mixed veggies, and I got three cans of Dintimore warmed up as well. I popped open a can of the brown bread I like for added variety. Veggies in stew. Not much, but it was hearty and calorie-filled, which is really important. Patty struggled to get it down, but she fought her way through it. Rest of the evening, I just hung with Patty, and we watched Abby sleep on the couch. She's such a fighter, too. Good female genes in that family. They don't quit. Abby took watch over for Gilbert sometime in the middle of the night, and this morning she said she had to kill a zombie at about 4 a.m. I guess she grabbed a bat and went out to the spike boards. She even dragged the body out of the road. How ballsy is that? Middle of the night, in the dark, she goes out all alone with a baseball bat and clubs a fucking zombie to death like a baby seal. Five bucks says she shits a brick when we start getting spiders around here again. This morning, we had a small breakfast together, and Patty mentioned that if we could get back to Stig, there would probably be some supplies left over there. She thought there was a rifle in the room she'd been trapped in, as well as a few boxes of ammo. I definitely want to go back and check it out, but after seeing what we went through to get Patty out, I think it's far too risky. It is, however, in the shit-to-think-about file. More shitty dreams the past couple of days. I've gotten better sleep when I've been sleeping, but the dreams are pretty horrible. Both of the two nights the dreams have been about my friend Steve. Today I turned on a radio and left it on the channel he said in his note. I mean, I know he's dead, but I feel obligated to do it with the dreams lately. It sucks. I sat there hoping it had crackled to life with his voice, but you and I know differently, Mr. Journal. Like a jackass, he went out and probably stole a BMW off a dealership lot and then proceeded to wrap it around a fucking guardrail somewhere. Steve was the kind of asshole that didn't clean off his car during snowstorms. He'd hit the wiper once or twice, then bomb away doing 20 over the speed limit. Knowing him, he never made it to a dealership at all. No work ethic on that guy. I'm rambling again. Gilbert and I established our Westfield plan. Well, phase one of it, at least. Every good op needs recon. Wars are fought on real-time intelligence and the stomachs of foot soldiers— And sadly, those are both my problem. It's too bad Tony didn't make it. Tomorrow morning at dawn, I'm taking the tundra and a snow machine and going to Westfield. I'll drive as far as I can and then move in slowly on the machine or on foot. My aim is to find out two things. First, how many undead are there in Westfield? Is it overrun with them and where are they? And secondly, do the Westfield pricks move in predictable patterns? Gilbert and I have a guerrilla warfare plan in mind. We've established that we can't just barge in with a direct assault on the school. We're vastly outnumbered, and without explosives, we can't take them out in one fell swoop. Some of our first ideas were an alpha strike on the school using fuel to start fires, but that quickly got dismissed for several reasons. Gilbert is, was, a Green Beret. If you know anything about those guys, then you know that they specifically train to go into foreign lands and build support with the locals to achieve a mission. Gilbert and I both agree that this is a good course of action. What makes this difficult is the fact that all the locals are inside a single building. It's not like we can hit an outlying village and bribe them with tobacco or something like a normal Green Beret mission. We need to establish their patterns of movement and intercept them, hopefully peacefully. We're thinking either a, oh dear, I'm hurt, please help us, ambush, or a spiked board and guns full-on ambush. We've got handcuffs to take hostages if we need to, but ideally I'd like to do this as peacefully as possible. We can't give those people any reason to think we're the villain. I'd bet a can of peaches Sean has gone out of his way to throw us under the bus as the most evil thing since Osama bin Laden and Steely Dan. Bottom line is, we'll figure that out when I get back tomorrow night. Once I see plowed roads, I'll know where they're moving, assuming, of course, they're plowing roads and moving about. I can't imagine a group of their size hasn't been moving around regularly. Patty said the high school group was very active in the city, gathering resources and whatnot, so it stands to reason they still are. I'm rolling out with the M15 and the Savage. I'll also bring the two pistols and enough ammo, food, and general supplies should I get cut off. Earlier tonight, I also found some snowshoes in the gymnasium, which will come in handy should something happen to either the truck or snowmobile. I hate to think about hoofing it the 30 miles back here, or however far it is, but the reality is that might happen. Hopefully I'm sneaky enough to get this done and do it right. 
After a few days of observation, we'll formulate a solid plan of attack. Gilbert assures me he can sell people who are on the fence about Sean with little to no problem. He's a pretty charismatic bastard, I'll give him that. The trick is to get enough info on the situation there and hopefully find a way to either speak to or capture folks. Worst case scenario, we can actively engage in guerrilla warfare and do an active denial of resources mission. Blow their fucking gas stations up. All's fair in love and war, cocksuckers. Now, if I get unbelievably lucky, I'll see Sean, and I'll take one shot with the savage and hopefully end all this bullshit before it gets any worse. According to what Brian said, he's the HMFIC over there. One shot, one kill. Man, that'd be ideal. Then I could go back to just worrying about the armada of undead that's slowly creeping down the road to my home. Well, if all goes well, I'll put an entry in tomorrow night when I get back. If it doesn't go well, well, I might not put an entry in at all. Ever again, that is. Good times. I'm kind of glad Sean tried to play soldier with me. I'm good at this game. Adrian February 11th I'm back like herpes, Mr. Journal. You just can't kill me. I am the boomerang of tools. Shit, I just called myself a tool. Ah, fuck it. Why fight it? Two straight days in Westfield for old Adrian here. Rough going, really, but I've been through much worse. I'll recap yesterday first. I left early before the sun came up. Right after I put in my last entry, I went out and got the snowmobile loaded into the tundra. I snagged some two-by-fours and rope and all that jazz. I packed a large backpack I got from one of the dorm rooms with all the supplies I'd need. Food, water, matches, a compass, state maps, and a small container of gas in the event I needed emergency fuel, etc. In the gymnasium, we have snowshoes for the kids, and I found a pair that fit me. Everything an almost ranger needs to survive a normal American town post-zombie apocalypse. Oh, and ammo. Lots of ammo. I brought all the five fifty six for the M15, the Glock, and all the mags loaded for that, and a spare box of forty five, and the cheetah in the ankle holster. I left a large longsword behind. Can't find a machete anywhere. I did, however, remember I had a decent camping hatchet, which worked out just fine. Makes me regret not buying a decent machete at Moore's at some point. Water over the dam. Abby was on watch in Hall A when I left yesterday morning, and I checked in with her to make sure she was okay. I told her that I'd be back sometime today. I fully expected to try and get back late yesterday, but that didn't happen. Anyway, we parted ways and I headed off. We got about a foot of snow the past few days, but mercifully the sun's been out all day and it's reduced down to about nine inches in the spots where I've been plowing regularly. Now, the trip to Westfield was a bitch for a few reasons. Obviously, driving through the snow sucked balls, even in a four-by-four with big ground clearance. It just sucked. Secondly, it sucked because I couldn't just drive straight to Westfield. Gilbert and I studied maps, and we knew that if they had any brains at all, they'd set up security checkpoints on the main road heading in. That meant we had to take side roads and park a ways outside of town, and either hoof it in or head in on the snow machine. Thirdly, it blew because I had to run over or get out of the truck to kill about five undead on Auburn Lake Road. They were slowly trudging in our general direction, and that's not a good sign. We've got to keep it quiet on campus for a few days at least to try and mislead the damn things back to somewhere else. Fucking crazy stuff, Mr. Journal. I drove roughly 25 miles on Route 18 to a road that we'd identified during planning. The road looped around the town in a pretty wide arc, but there were multiple roads branching off there that put me about a mile away from Westfield proper. According to one of the maps we had, Westfield had an original population of about 15,000 folks. Westfield was in the middle of a large valley and had a very centralized layout. From what I remember, there was a large tract of development skirting two-thirds of the city, and the downtown area was on the opposite side of town. I was heading towards where those two sections of the town met. The school was on the cusp of downtown and the developments. I found the area I wanted to park at and picked a driveway that headed into some cover. The snow was about a foot and a half thick, and I managed to smash the truck through and park it in the back of the house. Once I was situated, I sat tight and listened. Nothing. Quiet as a church. I gave it fifteen minutes and then got the snowshoes out. 
There was no way I could hide the tire tracks I just made, but my hope was that the turnoff I'd taken was so far from town they wouldn't be coming out to check. If they didn't see that road, then they wouldn't see the driveway. However, as a precaution, I got the snowmobile down and drove it very slowly about a tenth of a mile into the woods, so if they did find the truck, I had the machine as an escape option. From there, it was on foot through the woods. The snow was fairly hard-packed, and the snowshoeing was pretty easy. I've lost a lot of weight, too, which helped. On foot through the woods with all the gear was a bastard. I had about a mile to go before I got into a neighborhood that could be called downtown. I made sure to wear lighter-colored clothing. Now, the winter jacket I'm using is a neutral gray color, so to compensate and make myself less visible, I grabbed white sheets. I've got the sheets stitched roughly across my back and down the top of my arm so I can wrap up real quick and go completely white. If I go face down in this snow, the only thing someone will see is the white sheet. Go me and my fucking cleverness. Once I saw the houses, I slowed down and moved from cover to cover to stay hidden from anyone looking. I didn't see anyone, but that didn't mean shit. I worked my way through a few rows of houses and wound up stopping at a small ranch. The road it was on was plowed. From the side of the house, I saw a window was open, so I scrambled up and into the ranch house as fast as I could. I ate shit when I came down on the other side when the snowshoes snagged on the window. Bit my tongue pretty good. Don't. Once I got the shoes off, I cleared out the place and found it was empty. And emptied. Nothing inside worth taking at all. All the cupboards were open, as was the fridge. The place had been tossed for its contents. I set up the kitchen table inside the house with a chair and established a good hide spot. I could see out all three sides of the house at the plowed road, and unless someone slowed down and looked directly inside at me, I was invisible. I'd left no visible tracks in either, which left me feeling pretty safe. I set up at 11 a.m., something like that at least. I got my shit out and sat there. The life of an observer. Hours and hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. Nothing came into my field of view until 3 p.m. A small pickup truck came down the street heading north towards the suburb portion of the city. There were two passengers in the truck, and they drove pretty relaxed at about 25 miles per hour, red-headed guy and chick with a ponytail. They came through at about 3 and returned back at about half past 4. Most noteworthy was that the truck was carrying stuff in the back on the return trip. Notice anything funny about that paragraph, Mr. Journal? Anything at all? Go ahead, listen to it once more. Hear it yet? There's no mention of zombies in it. I didn't see a single zombie the entire first day and night I was there. Not one. That told me these guys had either dragged them all somewhere else, or had them huddled around the school like Patty said they had at Stig. Well, the third option is that they've managed to kill all the undead, but that scares me. It suggests a pretty powerful amount of organization and a large and capable fighting force. That night, I slept in a back bedroom and froze my ass off. I think I got about three hours of sleep total. However, I never used to mind getting shit sleep on ops like this back in the sandbox. You're so wired up on adrenaline, sleep feels like it's getting in the fucking way. Wake up, Adrian. Get back to the mission. It's funny how the brain works. I was set up in my hide, drinking a can of Red Bull at 4 a.m. I did see a single zombie shuffle down the road at 9 a.m. It was an old lady wearing a floral print bathrobe. She went from north to south, and I let her walk. No need to kill anything or announce my presence. I decided I'd displace after seeing her walk by. I gathered my shit and got out the back and went the better part of a mile north in the backyards of the houses, through fences and around old pools and over hedges, What a bitch. Took me over an hour to go a mile. Essentially, I shadowed the plowed road until I got to an area where the density of houses dropped off and I could see some farmland ahead. At the corner of the road I'd been set up on was a small cape. I set myself up in the second floor in a bedroom that had a corner view of the farms and the street. It was empty, just like the ranch was before. Clearly, these people had gone house to house just like I had. They were thorough. Not long after I'd finished getting myself set up in the Cape, the same truck drove by with the same two passengers, the red-headed guy again and the same chick with the ponytail. Once again, it was three in the afternoon. I watched the truck make a left-hand turn, 
drive a quarter of a mile, then turned into the long driveway of a farm. There was a fairly simple chain-link gate at the end of the driveway that the male passenger got out and opened for the truck. At that point, I got the savage trained on the farm and realized I'd hit the jackpot. The farm's layout is a bitch to describe, but the long chicken coop area ran the long way towards me parallel with the road. At the end of that was the farmhouse, and then behind both of those buildings were barns. Surrounding the whole damn thing was a fence that I could barely make out under the snow. The truck people got out, and an old guy came out of the farm to greet them. They went inside, and after about an hour, the two people came out with armloads of shit. I couldn't quite make out what was in the boxes and crates, but I bet twenty bucks I saw bottles with white shit inside. Pretty sure it was milk. I also opened the windows and took a real strong set of whiffs, and I could clearly smell cow shit. I think the farm has livestock. That means they have milk, meat occasionally, and if that long building is a chicken coop, then they have eggs and chicken as well. That explains how the assholes that ambushed us had sandwiches. They've got fresh eggs and milk available. I didn't see a single guard around the farm. Not one. I think they're relying on the fences for defense against the undead. I'd also bet they haven't had to deal with another group of survivors yet either. Well, other than us. That leaves them pretty wide open to be fucked with, especially by people who know how to fuck with people. Evil smile. Once the truck left, I got the fuck out. I'd seen enough, and I bugged out back to the snow machine. What a fucking chore to make that trip twice in just a few hours. We got some light snow last night as well, which helped with the noise. The truck was undisturbed, and I got the snowmobile into the back after fucking around with it for twenty minutes. Felt like an asshat every time the boards moved on me. I need to find the little bumper ramp attachments. Anyway, I had to break into the house there to find a shovel to get the truck unstuck. When I backed out of the garage, it got bogged down in a rut or something. I had to dig it out a bit. Clearing the house at night was a little freaky. I was about to go room to room like normal, but instead I just popped the mag light on and started talking out loud. I figured if anything was undead inside, they'd come to my voice. Luckily, the place was empty. So I dug the truck out, got it turned around, and made it back to Route 18 with no issues. I noticed the snow was undisturbed in the road as well, which meant they hadn't driven out to this point while I'd been in town. That's good news. Of course, if they find the tire tracks before more snow falls, they'll know exactly what was up. It took me almost an hour and a half to make it the 25 miles back. I'd bitch about how long the drive was, but frankly, that was as warm as I'd been in almost two days, so I hardly noticed how long it took. Gilbert was on watch when I arrived, and because we're afraid to let Westfield in on our communications, we're not using the radios unless we absolutely have to. I stopped at the nail boards and flashed my lights five times. I moved the boards, again with the fucking physical labor. Reset the boards, moved the vans, reset the vans, and got my ass inside for a Gilbert debrief. Patty and Abby tackled me with nervous hugs and fed me hot food, which was great. I was fucking starving. Otis showed me some love, too. I showed Gilbert the maps I drew and the notes I took, and we worked over a new plan for tomorrow. I'm headed back at 5 a.m. so I can beat the sunrise. Instead of going back to the same two houses I was in, I'll be heading further away towards the farm so I can see exit strategies for the farm. Is there a second exit from the farm if we ambush? Where's a good spot to hit the truck on a trip? If we're going to hit the truck in an ambush, we want to do it as far from the high school as possible so we can mitigate the threat of a QRF from there, but we also don't want to draw fire from the farmhouse. I won't be staying over in Westfield, if at all possible, tomorrow. I'll hopefully get in, see the truck making its trip again, and then hopefully get some good eyes on the farm so we can plan a hit either the 13th or the 14th. That reminds me, I need to think of something nice to do for the girls for Valentine's. Never been a good romantic, though, and I also don't want to send the wrong message. All the florists seem to be, well, dead. Roses might be out of the question. Maybe I can do breakfast for them or something nice. I think they desperately need something nice right now. (laughs) I know I do. Sleep now, then back to Westfield tomorrow for another recon op. If all goes well, we can plan an ambush for the 13th. Later, Mr. Journal. Adrian. February 13th. 
More blood on my hands today, Mr. Journal. Seems to be the rule lately. Adrian gets to kill people who may or may not deserve it. Our hand may be played with Westfield. I don't know how this will work out, but it seems the wheels are in motion. I need to stop rambling. Man, I'm an idiot some days. I hope this doesn't make things worse. Gilbert isn't sure one way or the other. As I said in the last entry I had the time for, I planned on returning to Westfield yesterday. I did. Before I left yesterday, Gilbert and I planned a different route into the town on side roads that were even more off the beaten path. It was almost all side roads to get there, and I tell you what, man, what a bitch of a drive. I almost switched to the maintenance plow just to make it a little easier, but I didn't want to risk losing the plow if something should happen. Not that a plow isn't replaceable, I just don't want one more fucking hassle. I got 99 problems now, and a plow isn't one. Seems like no matter where you go in the world, there's always one main way to get there, and then a bunch of -of out-of-the-way routes to get there. For example, I can take Route 18 all the way to the interstate to get to the city. Straight shot. However, I can take a combination of 20 different back roads to get there. Same idea here. I arrived in the outskirts of Westfield at about 11 a.m. The side roads I took brought me right near the farm I'd seen the other day, so it was a longer drive, but a much shorter walk. I established that my recon yesterday would largely be on foot, so I didn't set up anywhere. Using the snowshoes, I made decent progress through the woods around the farm. The snow was packed hard from the freeze-thaw cycle, so it was easy moving. I had the M15 slung on my back, and I rolled with the Savage so I could observe through the scope. The farm itself was fairly small. This isn't a massive dairy operation or a chicken factory. Like I said, there was one large chicken building that was maybe a hundred feet long, plus a good-sized barn and a reasonable farmhouse. Few shed-style outbuildings as well. I got close enough in three or four spots where I could see with the savage that there were indeed chickens in the long building and at least three cows in the barn. I suspect there were more cows than that, but I couldn't get an angle to see. Judging from the beaten down snow and the piles of shit all over the place, I'd guess it may be six to eight cattle. Looks clearly like a family-run farm. My friends in the pickup truck arrived once again at a little after three and stayed until a little after four. They brought back empty crates, and when they left, the same crates were full. I was set up about 25 yards into the woods, and with the scope, I could clearly see they had bottles of milk in them. Fresh milk. Oh, dear. The same old man from the day before greeted them and saw them off. After they left, he went back inside, then a few minutes later came out on the back porch with a cup of coffee. He fired up a pipe and smoked it out there for about half an hour, then headed back inside as the sun was finally dipping down. Once the sun was down, I exfilled back to the truck and headed home. The ride back was just as shitty as the ride there, in case you were curious, Mr. Journal. Shit-tastic winter we're having here. I got home at about 8 p.m., and we had ourselves a powwow. After explaining the trip of the passenger truck and lack of a second exit from the farm, we essentially had ourselves a bottleneck for the truck— The only exit for them was on the plowed road or through really thick snow, and the smaller truck wouldn't be able to handle it. If we slipped a few two-by-fours into the snow right there, we'd be even better off in preventing an exit that way. Gilbert and I agreed that the best ambush location would be near the cape on the corner, but perhaps a few hundred feet south. That way we'd be obscured from the farm and still quite a ways from the high school should they send a QRF to answer an ambush on the small truck. After some pretty raucous arguments, we decided that using Abby as bait would be our best plan. Abby walks down the road with me in a house with the savage. Gilbert sets up nearby with the snowmobile, and when the truck sees Abby, she gets them to stop to help her. Gilbert rides out on the snowmobile with the AK, asks them to drop their weapons and radios, and we begin our question-and-answer session. Hopefully it all ended with no violence. And by now, you already know it ended with violence. Gilbert and I, rashly, you could argue, decided to hit the truck today. We've got a lot of intel, and the longer we wait, the more time they have to attack us. Patty's rib has gotten good enough that she could take the watch in Hall A while we were gone, so she obviously begged up a storm to come along. We told her it was a bad idea, and after yet another screaming session, she conceded that she actually was still in a fair amount of pain. 
Patty's done a lot of screaming since Charles and Randy died. Hope she can find some calm soon, because that bitch has pipes. It's a good thing I'm half deaf from fucking gunfire. Gilbert, Abby, and I took off in the plow truck. We got the snowmobile loaded and grabbed up a bunch of good shit, and we're on the road by 4 a.m. We arrived just as the sun was rising, and when we saw no additional tracks in the road, we headed to the same spot I'd parked on my second trip to Westfield. Abby and Gilbert set up a rear guard with the snowmobile until I got 15 minutes ahead on foot. After that time, they rode out very slowly, following my tracks until they reached the spot I'd decided for the ambush. Abby and I slipped into and cleared another small home for me to use, and Gilbert rode the snowmobile around towards the farm, so if they suddenly slammed the truck into reverse, he'd be able to intercept them. And just about five after three, the truck drove by heading to the farm. I was set up in a second-floor window with a radio, and I could clearly see the quarter of a mile or so to the farm. I had an almost perfect little space between the trees and houses, so I could see the driveway, and when the truck parked in the yard, I could see it. Gilbert and Patty had a radio on them as well, and we switched to a seldom-used channel and did a hot mic test to make sure no one else heard us. We sent some garbled chatter out, waited for a reply, and after ten minutes we were reasonably sure we had the channel to ourselves. Abby staged down at the door of the house, and when I saw the two people get in the truck at the farm, I hollered down to her they were on their way. Abby jogged outside through the snow and made it to the road and started walking slowly as if she was heading towards the general direction of the high school. We planned on her having a hot mic so Gilbert and I could hear any conversation she had. It took maybe two minutes after that for the truck to reach a point in the road where she could be seen. They slowed down, and through the scope I could see the male passenger fumble for and get a handgun ready. They didn't radio anyone, though, which was great. Abby waved back at them at just about the perfect time. They might have mistaken her for a dead chick if she waited too long. Like we had discussed, she spun to face them and then did a wave and a handful of OMG people jumps. She basically freaked out like a cheerleader, which was really funny to watch, because if you knew Abby, she is not a cheerleader. Probably pretty enough, but there's too much faux penis and nerd culture in her. The truck slowed and came to a stop about 15 feet from her. I got up and bounded down the steps three at a time and switched to the M15 so I could come out the front door if I had to. The passenger stepped out of the truck and I watched the female driver put it in park. Mistake number one, never put your car in park when you might need to get away in a hurry. Over Abby's mic we could hear the man talking faintly and with eyes on I could read his lips and make out the whole conversation. Here's what I remember before shit went south. Holy shit, people, Abby hollered out. Show me your hands, please, the guy said back. Oh, sorry. She already had her hands out, but she raised them so she wasn't being a threat. He said thanks very politely, and Abby smiled at him. Hey, are you guys from here? I've been moving through some side towns here and was heading this way to look for food. Most of these houses are completely emptied. She gestured around at the rows of houses in the development we were in. I'm part of the Westfield Council. We're currently centered in the high school a mile or two down the road here. We've got plenty of food if you need a place to stay. There's plenty spare food for everyone. The guy was congenial and looked older than he probably was. I caught a faint hint of him being a little slow, too. Maybe too much time watching porn instead of hitting the books or something. Sort of tall, with receding reddish hair, and was a little chubby even, which told me a lot. I was pretty round when the shit hit the fan in June, but now I'm lean and there's little cushion. If this guy was still chubby, then they really were eating good there. That told me a lot. Abby took a few seconds to respond, and I had to stifle a laugh. Oh yeah, I bet you guys have free candy back there too. I, uh, I think I'll pass on the ride back to Pedoville. Do you guys have any food with you, though? Just a granola bar or something? The guy clearly didn't get the joke. He wasn't pissed, but the humor went right over his head. He took a few steps back, still holding the gun in her direction, and popped open the passenger door of the small truck. I couldn't hear him, but he was talking to the woman driving. After listening to him, she hopped out herself and approached Abby. She had a long, dark ponytail and was wearing a digital camo National Guard jacket. Hey, what's your name? the woman asked. I didn't like her posture. It said bitch to me. Abby kind of stiffened when the two of them were both out of the truck. 
I'm Clara. I used to live in Morgan right down the road back that way. She pointed to the general direction of the farm. It was nice to have a local doing the talking. I had no idea what the names of the little shitfill bergs were around here. Well, Clara, we really need help, and it'd mean the world to us if you would come back with us to the school. You could meet the rest of the council, and we could get you a cool job and everything. You know, it sounded an awful lot like she was trying to make it sound like an offer, but it came off as a threat. To her credit, Abby responded very smart. Okay, but I've got some questions first. The woman nodded like she expected it. How many people do you have? I don't think really large groups are safe anymore. Abby put the I'm scared frowny face on. I think there are 40 of us right now, but two of the ladies are pregnant and due by summer, so it'd be 41 with you and 43 by summer. The woman seemed particularly proud. Wow, having babies. You guys have a doctor there? That'd be great. Abby faked a smile. Kind of. We have a woman who is a physician's assistant at the local clinic. She's pretty sharp. She's studying up for the deliveries on the kids something fierce. We're pretty excited. Her and the guy exchanged smiles. They did seem genuinely excited to have more kids show up. Wow, cool. Who's in charge there? Abby was starting to feign interest to keep them going. Well, technically we're a council, so there's no official, like, mayor or anything, but... Our council is chaired by two people, Sean Stockwell and my lieutenant from the guard base in town, Lieutenant Daniels. Sean's pretty much the guiding force, but he needs the lieutenant's support to get big shit done, so it works out. The rest of the council is people from town from before, well, before all this. She gestured around. This intel was a fucking gold mine if it was all true. Also made me wonder where all the guardsmen were if there was a base here in town. I wonder what the base was responsible for and what gear they might have kicking around. Wow, and you guys have plenty of food? How is that possible? Abby continued with her drilling. The man spoke up and answered, Well, there were two grocery stores in town, and the chief and lieutenant secured them right off the bat when things went south. We got them emptied and got all the food into the school right off the bat. Plus, there was a bunch of restaurants that we got the food from, and then my family runs McDowell Farm back there. They provide security and fuel for my dad at the farm, and we share our milk and eggs and occasionally a chicken or two. Works out great. Again, all solid gold intel. Abby nodded and thought about it. She was making it look like she was going to go, but the deal was she'd tell them she couldn't because she had to return to get her sister first or something. The deal was, don't get in the truck. Well, that all sounds great. Can I meet you here tomorrow? I need to get my little sister first. I can't leave her alone overnight. We'll help you get her, the woman responded. I remember just about then I got that dumping sensation in the pit of my stomach right before things go bad. Abby was not prepared for that response, and she stammered some. I, uh, I'm all set, thanks, but tomorrow, if you want to meet us here again sometime, that'd work. No, I think now is best, Clara. It's getting late. It'll be dark soon. You might run into one of the dead folks, and we can't have that happening. The woman reached to her hip and rested her hand on what I figured was a handgun. I dropped to a knee inside the living room of the house and put the sights of the M15 on the woman. If she drew, she died. The man already had his pistol out, but it was hanging down, and he clearly was uncomfortable with the sudden change of stance from the woman. Abby made her only mistake and looked right at the window I was behind. She panicked and gave my position away. The woman put two and two together and spun to face me, drawing her weapon. The man stood still. Before she got the gun up and presented herself as a threat, I snapped off a single round. The windows of the house were open from the summer, and I sent the high-velocity 556 bullet right through an opening in the window. The woman doubled over and fell on her side, dropping the pistol, The man's face went white as the sheet on my back as he watched the chick drop. Abby reached into the small of her back and drew her beretta. Almost immediately, the man dropped his pistol. I moved out the door and through the snow, keeping my weapon on the man. The woman was rolling on the ground, bleeding heavily from the shot to her chest. She was coughing as well, spitting up some blood. Once again, I hit the lungs, getting good at that. I told Abby to watch him and rendered first aid to the woman. She died as soon as I got her sat up against the tire of the truck. I must have hit something a lot more important than just the lung. 
Lots of important stuff in your chest when it comes to getting shot there. I swore up and down quietly and repeatedly for a minute or two as the dude just watched in horror. He was totally unprepared for this. I stood up, grabbed the woman's Beretta 92F pistol as well as the two magazines in her jacket pocket, slung the M15 and walked over to him. He took a few steps back and I picked up his pistol. It was another Beretta 92F, or an M9 as the military calls it. They must have been guard issued, or at least from the guard base. Enticing factoid. Here's a summary of our conversation. Do you know who we are? I have no idea who you are. My name is Adrian Ring. I'm the guy your leader Sean decided to attack twice now. I wasn't threatening him, just passing along info. Once I said that, his eyes lit up. You're the dude who killed all our people at Christmas? You're a frickin' monster. You just killed Tara. Oh, gosh. No. Oh, shit. I caught a whiff of urine. Look, man, what's your name? I put on the Adrian I'm really your friend face. Oliver. They call me Ollie. His eyes were as wide as Lindsay Lohan's after a meth binge. Well, wide as they might have been if she were still alive, at least. You get the point, Mr. Journal. Ollie... I'm really sorry I had to shoot Tara, but she was probably going to shoot me. And I'm sure if you had the chance to shoot someone who was about to shoot you, you would do the same, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. Stronger smell of urine. His dark jeans looked a little darker around the crotch. Excellent, Ollie. Here's what you need to know. We want nothing to do with violence. However, your leader, Sean, followed people from here to where we are and then attacked us to get our food. Now, we're hungry, too, and you don't just attack people and take their food. You start peaceful trade or barter, right? I was trying to talk slow and appear as non-threatening as possible. I didn't even have a gun pointed at him. Yeah, but they told us you attacked them when they followed people leaving here. That's horseshit, Ollie, and if you know Sean like I know Sean, you know he's feeding you bullshit. Anything to get your people to hate us. Shit, you guys blew up a gas station near us the other night, as well as a building in the town we live in. Over a hundred people died the other day because of Sean, Ollie. That's a lot of spilled blood over nothing. His face squirreled up on me when I said that, and I knew he wasn't lying. I knew about the gas station, but the building you're talking about, that, that's news to me. Don't forget, mister, you shot and killed three of our people when we hit the gas station the other night. The ones with the empty guns, you mean? His face went pale white, and I knew he had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah, Ollie, they had guns, and I shot them because they were still there holding them. But when I checked, their guns were empty. Any chance those people that died that night were maybe against Sean's ideas at all? No answer. He just looked down at the ground, trying to hide his expression. I responded with a humph. Ollie, how many pistol magazines do you have on you? He thought for a second and replied, I got one in the gun, plus two more in my pocket. Just then I heard the dead woman start to move around on the ground behind me. I excused myself and yanked the hatchet off the belt hanger, and as she started the real severe twitching right before fully animating, I thunked the hatchet into the top of her skull. One more kibby later, and she went still. After I pried the hatchet out of her head, I went back to Ollie. Give me the two mags in your pocket, man. He did. I dropped the mag out of the Beretta and rifled it down the road. It skipped and slid about seventy-five yards or so. I pocketed the two magazines and searched the interior of the truck. There was a police radio, and I took it. I killed the motor and threw the keys down the road near the gun magazine. No other guns or good stuff. In the back of the truck, they had the crates of milk, as well as three dozen eggs and what looked like a butchered chicken or two. Here's where I took the moral high ground. Ollie, you know as well as I do, there's nothing stopping Miss Clara here from putting nine millimeters through your forehead, right? I tilted my head towards the angry little blonde in the road. Ollie nodded at me solemnly. I don't want to hurt you, and neither does she. Furthermore, I don't want to steal your food. You've got pregnant women to feed, and I'm sure you've got kids there as well, right? He nodded again. So the food is yours. When we leave, you walk to the keys in the magazine, and you come back to the truck. How you decide to tell the rest of the people what happened here is up to you, but 
I sincerely hope you tell them exactly what happened. Tara was shot when she pointed a gun at me, and I'm regretful it happened. You make sure to tell them I'm sorry for it, okay? He nodded again. I noticed the faint glimmer of hope in his face when he figured out he was going to walk away from the situation alive. Now, you need to pass along a message for me, and I need you to understand fully that I am as serious as someone can possibly be about this, okay? I gave him the Adrian Means business face. Okay, anything. You can tell this to Sean, but I'd prefer you told it to the people who are against him, okay? He nodded again. Sean has done wrong by me, and he's done wrong by my people. Now, this is no longer a country made of laws, but justice will be served in this regard. I expect you all to understand that attacking my people for no good reason, blowing up a perfectly good gas station filled with fuel, then blowing up a building filled with my friends, is entirely unacceptable. I've never done anything to you people here other than this today. Ollie nodded. I want Sean. Sean and only Sean. He pays for his crimes against me and my people. I want nothing to do with hurting anyone, but mark my words, Ollie. I will tear your school down brick by bloody brick until that man is brought before me to pay for what he's done. Ollie pissed himself again. Talk to your people. Tell them we want peace, but he needs to pay for what he's done. If he isn't brought before me within twenty days, then I'll start forcing the issue. I really do not want to force the issue, Ollie. Serious Adrian is serious. We have your radio now. We'll be turning it on every other day at noon to listen for transmissions on. I saw they were on Channel 4. Channel 5. If you want to communicate in a diplomatic fashion, I suggest you radio my people. Our first day listening will be the 15th. Ollie nodded. Channel 5 at noon every other day starting on the 15th. Roger. Ollie, I want to apologize for putting this on you. It wasn't our intention for things to go this way. Shit happens, man. This is bad times for everyone. I put my hand gently on his shoulder, and he didn't flinch, which I took as a good sign. I don't think he was afraid of me anymore, and that meant he believed me. In my head, at least. Start walking towards the gun and the keys. We're going to head this way. When you get to the keys and the magazine, you can come back to the truck and get the gun— We'll drop it about 25 yards in the opposite direction, okay? He nodded. Yeah, thanks for not killing me. Ollie, I want nothing to do with killing people. I just want Sean dead, and it's debatable he's even human anymore. Ollie nodded back at me and started walking past Abby. Abby and I made eye contact, and we booked it towards the area where Gilbert had the snowmobile. I dropped the empty Beretta in the road, and we were gone like ghosts. Gilbert got us back to the truck, and we hightailed it the fuck out of town. Roads were shitty again, but we've beaten them into submission the past few days. I was really angry over how it went down, but Gilbert said it was perfect. He had the feeling that Tara bitch was one of Sean's people, and that dropping her actually helped us. We got back an hour ago. I'm exhausted. Gilbert's up with Patty taking the first shift of the watch. If we're gonna get hit, it'll be in a few hours. If we don't get hit, then... My bet is Ollie passed the message along to the people over there who wanted to hear it, and we've started to sow the seeds of rebellion in Westfield. Brick by brick, Sean. Brick by brick. Adrian. February 14th. It's Valentine's Day. Surprise, surprise, breakfast in bed for the girls didn't happen earlier. I thought it'd be nice to get up early and make them something, but I wound up taking the late shift for watch last night, and by the time I made my way back to Hall E, they were already up and about. I caught a grade A tongue lashing from Patty this morning after Abby bragged to her about being such a central part of the ambush. The idea of her 17-year-old daughter holding a grown man at gunpoint definitely did not soothe her already ragged feelings. She's pretty sensitive at the moment. I told her risks were inevitable and that I was sorry to put Abby in that situation. That was a lie. I wasn't sorry about it at all. I was happy that we all made it out in one piece, to be honest. Whether or not Patty is ready to admit it yet or not, Abby is a soldier now, just the same as her. 
It's the reality of this. It's not like I've got other adults to bring along for my overly frequent and violent endeavors. So, with breakfast in bed as a sweet gift shot to hell, I decided to scour campus this morning looking for something cool I could give the girls. Sadly, I'm not really the romantic type. I can pull off sweet every now and then, but I usually wind up going with the proven stuff, like chocolates and flowers. I've spent too much time being not sweet to turn on that part of my personality easily. Sadly, there's a shortage of chocolates lately, and all the florists appear to be dead. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. I went to the girls' dorm rooms and went through everything I could find. I needed to find something that said, I really appreciate you and am thankful for all that you do for me. I didn't want to send the wrong message and have to beat one of the girls off with a stick if they thought I was coming on to them. After searching around, I found nothing. However, when I swung by the cafeteria to grab some more food for the dorm, I had one of those eureka moments. At lunchtime, Patty was on watch, Abby was sleeping on the couch, and Gilbert had gone home. I made lunch. I found one of those canned hams in the food stash, as well as some pineapple rings and some raisins. I carefully cut the ham into half-inch thick slices, then carved the ham slices into the shape of a heart with a giant arrow going through it about as artistic as a jello jiggler. I cobbled together a pretty sweet glaze to go along with it. I made some boxed mashed potatoes that didn't require milk, as well as a can of carrots and a can of corn. I ran over, got Patty, and woke Abby up. The girls were suitably impressed by my meager culinary skills. I felt bad when they both cried, but I think it was a good cry. I'm kind of shitty at figuring out the difference between the two, When I see a woman I care about crying, all I want to do is go to her and help make everything all right. Sometimes that just cocks it all up, though. I don't know. I do the best I can. Gilbert returned to campus right after the girls finished eating. He could smell the ham in the kitchen and smack the hell out of me for not making enough for him. I got a good laugh out of that. I think he might have been genuinely pissed, though. It did smell pretty fantastic for a canned ham. Once we were all gathered in Hall E and the women had eaten their fill, we went over the plan. Gilbert is now fully convinced that yesterday's largely failed ambush was a blessing in disguise. Once we'd gone over everything and he had time to think about it, he was sure it was a successful breaking of the ice. He said that the lack of attack on us spoke volumes. Either Ollie had covered for us and said nothing to Sean, or Ollie had taken our story to the other powers that be and... They decided an attack on us wasn't the best idea. One way or the other, I'm heading back to Westfield tomorrow to listen in on the radio. If they want to make contact with me, they will. We've got one more egress into the town we haven't used yet, so there's still some hope we can get close if they've burned our previous two ways in. Gilbert made some more spiked boards on two-by-fours this afternoon as well that we're going to put in the road when I leave tomorrow. If they blow out some tires five miles from here, that's a lot better than 500 yards from here. Gilbert is thinking we give them three chances to communicate with us via radio, or basically six days. He's betting we hear from them tomorrow when I go there. He said, I've seen this before, and I bet you anything we've got them by the balls, bub. I can appreciate the voice of experience. I'm scared of the voice of senility, though. It's funny but I don't think I've seen any emotion out of Gilbert over the Stig thing. I would have thought when the place blew he'd cry over Brian dying, but he hasn't. I think that says a lot about how much he actually cared about them. I mean, I know he cared, but he couldn't have been that close to Brian, otherwise I'd suspect he'd be showing it more. That, or he went home to ball his old ass off. I'm sad today. Last night, I had another Cassie dream, and it was a melancholy one. I can't recall exactly, but it was back from before, and we were lying in bed together, one of those lazy Sunday afternoons where you don't feel like doing anything, and you lay down in bed to take a nap kind of days. Of course, it was just a dream, but it was really nice. Waking up from that sucked, though. Harsh reality. I miss my woman. I hate being lonely. I'll leave it at that. We had multiple walkers make their way up Auburn Lake Road the past few days. 
While we were gone, Patty said about eight made it all the way to the bridge, and she wound up popping them off with the TAC-22 rifle. She had to leave the bodies for us to deal with, which wasn't that big of a deal. The big deal is the fact that we've had more undead on campus since Stig blew up than we've had in the past three months combined. There's an obvious connection there. I hope the entire armada doesn't show up on our doorstep while we're still dealing with this Westfield bullshit. No second reliable source of fuel has been secured yet either. At the rate we're going, we'll have to switch to using diesel pretty fucking shortly. Home heating oil is just dyed and treated diesel, and there are a hundred houses that are heated with it around here. We've got so many irons in the fire, and they're all equally dangerous and equally important. <sighs> Tomorrow, I'm heading back to the Westfield Burbs in the hope someone over there makes contact with me. Even if they don't, the plan is to attempt to recon a totally different part of town. If the opportunity presents itself, I'd like to try and get eyes on the high school so I can see what defenses they have, if any. I'm likely to stay there overnight again, so if you don't hear from me tomorrow night, Mr. Journal, don't have a heart attack or anything. Wish me luck. Adrian. February 16th. Things are moving very fast. So much has happened the past two days, I can barely recall all of it to recant here for you, Mr. Journal. Unreal. First off, I think I should trust Gilbert's instincts more. And, if possible, I should try to clone his instincts in a mad scientist's lair at some point. Whatever he learned when he was in Southeast Asia should be bottled and injected into modern soldiers. Well, that's assuming there's such a thing as armies in the future. I'll start as far back as I can remember and work my way to today. Here goes. I made the trip to Westfield fairly early. I didn't take anything to help me sleep that night, and I wound up waking earlier than I'd intended. After packing all my shit up, I took off in the tundra and made good time. It's been kind of warm during the day, and the melt has been good to us. I made the trip to the turnoff to get into Westfield in record time and wound up parking the truck in a garage in an out-of-the-way cul-de-sac. I was clever, though, and drove the truck into the garages of all the houses, so if anyone saw the tire tracks, they'd have to check each house to find the actual truck. Clever, eh? This parking job was pretty slick on the map. I didn't get close to Westfield in the truck, but on the map, this house was really close to the downtown area. Once again, though, saw absolutely zero undead moving around. I gotta hand it to Sean and his crew. They've been very thorough in their cleansing of the town. That, or they have attracted them all somewhere I still haven't heard about or seen yet. Anyway, with the snowshoes, I was able to hike down a ravine and up a hill on the other side to get to an area that was at most 500 yards from the school. The houses were densely packed, and I moved along with the hatchet and glock out. I left the M15 stashed in the woods in a gun case in the event I needed it. I didn't want to leave it behind in the truck, that's for sure. The buildings in this area were primarily multifamily homes converted into apartments and small businesses. There were a few small three- or four-story apartments that frankly took forever to get past. I have to check every level of the building while I'm on the move until I know there's no one there. The last thing I want is some Westfield asshole set up on a third-floor balcony with a twenty-two ending my day. When I reached the last one of those, I decided it'd be a great place to get set up in. The back door of one of the apartment buildings was open, and I let myself in and headed up to the top floor, securing every door on the way up. I wasn't concerned with killing zombies, I just wanted to make sure they couldn't get out of the apartment while I was there. I found the top floor apartment facing the school and tested the door. It was locked. One big boot later, and the older wooden door crashed open. I cleared the apartment and got the door shut. I had to move the fridge in front of the door to secure it, but I got it done. Inside the apartment, there were windows in a bedroom that faced the school. I didn't want to fuck with the curtains on the outside chance someone would see it and realize something was amiss, so I set up a place to sit back from the window and wound up getting the savage's scope on target with great visibility. Once I was set up, I turned the radio I took from the pickup truck and turned it on the channel that I told Ollie the other day. With any luck, I'd hear from them. I wasn't sure how long the battery would last or whether or not we had any way to charge the damn thing if it died. So, the school is pretty fucking big. 
I'm guessing they had somewhere around 600 or 700 students based on the size of the town and the size of the building. It's roughly rectangular with the gymnasium at one end. The school is two stories high and the gymnasium looks to be about three and a half stories high. They had electric lights visible in the windows, which tells me they've got generators. The entire school property is surrounded with vehicles parked end to end. Specifically, each vehicle is either a truck or a van. In two places that I could see, the head vehicles parked sort of set back, and it looked like they were using those trucks as a gate, similar to my vans back at campus. There were a few undead here and there in the streets, but honestly, the whole portion of the city I could see was a fucking ghost town. On the roof of the building, they had two security people. I could see they were armed with AR-style rifles, and they were wearing the same National Guard camo that woman had worn in the failed ambush. They didn't have scopes on their rifles, which seemed like a travesty to me. Silly to put observers anywhere without a scoped weapon. They seemed pretty relaxed, and the few undead that meandered to the vehicle barrier were left alone. The zombies couldn't get around the trucks or vans, and they seemed pretty friggin' confounded by the wall of metal and glass. I noticed they had about 15 vehicles in the parking lot, three military-issue Humvees as well as a heavy-duty military-issue tow vehicle. I forget what they're called, but they have a shitload of wheels and are used for moving tanks. I had vehicle envy. I took some notes, drew some maps, and at 12.15 the radio cackled. We were in business. An older man's voice came over the radio. It was clearly not Sean's. Hello? Is anyone there? I waited a few seconds and answered, We're listening. Go ahead. Thanks for answering. You people have some feathers ruffled around here. Got some folks scared about what you're up to. He had a smooth baritone, almost melodic. I could totally envision this guy singing country music from the 50s, the shit my grandparents used to listen to. We're very sorry about what happened to the lady the other day. Genuinely sorry. Well, it sounds like she pointed her weapon at someone who was faster on the trigger. Sounds a lot like natural consequences to me. He seemed full of wisdom and wonder. It didn't hurt that he more or less dismissed me shooting one of his locals. I liked him. It reminded me of Gilbert some. Well, we weren't out to hurt anyone, just trying to learn more about your situation here and trying to find out a way to bring this bullshit to a close. Too many good people have died already over this. As I talked, I moved around the apartment, making sure I wasn't getting snuck up on. Wise statement from someone as young-sounding as you. How old are you? I'm almost thirty-five. I've seen my share of growing up recently. Sad, but true. I hear that. So, my boy Oliver says the man that talked to him the other day put the fear of God in him. Would that be you? I had two options. Lie about it and say I was someone else and risk Ollie listening in and finding out I was lying or tell him the truth and put an honest foot forward. I chose the truth. Yeah, that that was me. My name is Adrian. It wasn't my intention to scare him, although I can see how he would have been a little freaked out. Yeah, watching someone get dropped can do that to you. He sounded, I don't know, not angry, but maybe sad. Yeah, so you contacted us, and you know my name. Can I get yours? Silence for maybe thirty seconds, and he replied, My son says he recognizes your voice. That tells me you're being more honest than most lately, so in the spirit of being a good Christian, I'll tell you my name. You can call me Lenny. Fantastic, Lenny. I appreciate your honesty. I hope you can appreciate the pickle your fearless leader has put us in here. I was hoping he was on board. I'm hearing all kinds of stories about pickles lately wish we had more. We have some here in the mason jars in the basement. You're aiming to kill Sean, are you? That was random. Well, he's done his level best trying to kill me and my people. He's destroyed the gas station near our place as well, and the other day a large building filled with people was torched as well. Over a hundred died in that explosion, Lenny. I can't abide him being a threat to my people anymore. What happens next, Adrian? If we don't give him up or drag his body out, what are you and your people going to do to us? Lenny, I don't want trouble. 
Ollie seemed like a good man, and you strike me as a good person as well, but Sean needs to be brought to justice, and one way or the other I'll see to it. Next time he sticks his head outdoors, it's getting shot off. Now, if I have to, I'll make life difficult to flush him out of that school. I'd really rather not do that, though. I'd rather we came to some kind of agreement where you can try him for his crimes or you can just send him off somewhere so I can handle this myself. You prepared to kill another man, Adrian? I won't lose another friend to him and his plans, and I don't want him wasting the lives of your people trying to kill mine. The world's filled with problems, and I don't need him making it more difficult for me or for your people, so the answer is yes, I am prepared to kill him. I'm also prepared to kill every single person he foolishly sends to try and kill me, too, and I'd much rather I sat down and had a meal with those people instead. I was aiming for the Christian morals I suspected he had. It was probably the better part of a minute before he replied, I'll tell you something, son. That man is not popular with a lot of the folks left here. He's made a lot of enemies, but he still has some friends, and he still has some power. You best be able to follow through if we hatch a plan to make things right by you. I was excited, I'm not going to lie. Lenny, I'm a man of my word. There's little left in this world worth haggling over, and the biggest thing I can give you is trust. I don't know you, and I can't trust you yet, but I can tell you this. If we shake hands and you're the man you seem to be, then you won't have any problems with me. Silence for another minute. Finally, he replied, you interested in meeting face to face? Tough question. Yeah, I suppose that's the best next step. I can't say when we can meet you or where, but if you're interested, I can arrange it. Very good. You can come to the farm whenever you like. I've got some ideas that we really can't share over the radio in case things are being listened in on. My behind might already be in a sling for what we've said already right here. He seemed annoyed at the premise of being watched over. I understand. I'll try and contact you as soon as I can. Noon in two days via radio again work for you? Sure does. You take care, son. I think you've got a week or two before he comes at you again, but rest assured he will come at you. You're under his skin like a thorn covered in lemon juice. I smiled. Lenny, thank you. We'll be in touch, and best of luck. God bless. And... That was it. I danced giddy like a schoolgirl for ten minutes, then returned to watching the school and taking notes on what I'd said and what the Lenny guy said. Talk about excitement. As soon as the sun started to dip at about 5.30, I exfilled. I did get the scare of my life when I was leaving the building, though. I was going down the flights of stairs in the central hall, and I looked over the railing and saw a hand resting there, slowly moving up. I'd already made a shitload of noise, though, so even when I froze, whatever it was would have known. I leaned over and put the Glock side on the hand and noticed it was all gray and covered in flecks of dried blood. It looked like old blood, too. I got the hatchet out and holstered the Glock. About a flight and a half of stairs later, I came face to face with a young lady that, when alive, would have been beautiful. She was young, twenty-five years old at the most, and had long straight hair dyed in colorful streaks. She had a pierced lip and eyebrow, and she was covered in tattoos, very alternative. She was wearing a torn open pajama shirt and a pair of boxer underwear. Man, she must have been gorgeous when she was alive. I actually had to take a deep breath and focus myself to hit her with the hatchet. I kept thinking about love lost and, oh man, I wish this chick was alive stuff. I sidearmed the hatchet into her neck right below the ear and nearly severed her head. It sucked. Her head rolled around with the jaw still clenching up and down, so I curb-stomped it a few times until the brain got smushed. I got the fuck out after that. Making it back to the truck turned out to be a real bitch. The ravine behind the house was really ugly on the way up, and I had to practically repel it. I made sure not to forget the stashed M15, and I trucked it home. I remembered to stash the two-by-fours with nails in a spot of Route 18 where the snow was still covering the road. They'll never see them if they come that way. I made it home by about 7 p.m., and I swung into Gilbert's place to let him know what happened. He said he'd be by in a bit, and I headed to campus to shower. Patty moved the vans for me as I got the nail boards out of the way, and I got in, cleaned up, and everyone gathered for a powwow pretty quickly. I told them everything I saw and said and heard, and they were pretty excited. 
Gilbert complimented me on my maps and the notes I took. Apparently, my attention to detail is good. Yay me. He immediately suggested we make another trip into Westfield today and meet with this Lenny character. His argument was that if we went immediately, we showed them several things. We were serious about moving this plan forward as soon as possible. We knew exactly where Lenny would be and when, so he knew that if he double-crossed us, we could find him and exact retribution at our leisure— And he said that by going immediately, we cut down on the likelihood that they were attempting a double cross on us. Essentially, the less planning time we gave them, the better. Faced with Gilbert's patented pile-o logic, we made plans for today. I crashed immediately to get some sleep, and Gilbert took off for his place. Patty and Abby held down the fort over the evening and into the night, and as soon as I woke up, I packed up our shit and met Gilbert at his place in the plow truck. We were on the road by 8 a.m., and after moving all of our nail-laden defense, we reached yet another new and interesting parking spot by about 10.30. On the drive over there, Gilbert mentioned one really strange thing that hadn't occurred to me yet. That told him we had major leverage. If Ollie was Lenny's son, then why wasn't he living at the farm with his dad? Gilbert felt it was weird that Ollie rode to the farm, got shit, then returned to the school— Unless he felt safer there, Gilbert felt something was up. There was a reason why Ollie wasn't at the farm. Our parking spot was closer to the farm than my previous places, and we rode the snowmobile as slow as possible through the woods to a point near the chicken coop area of Lenny's farm. I knew there'd be some noise for cover coming from all the damn birds in there, and Gilbert kept the snowmobile moving at about five miles per hour, so we made little to no noise anyway. The trees, without doubt, killed a lot of the engine buzz. We parked the machine about fifty yards from the edge of the tree line near the farmhouse. I led Gilbert through the woods until we got to where I'd set up the other day to observe the place. I showed him through the savage where that was, and he formulated the final details of our plan. The truck arrived with Ollie and a new guy wearing camo at the same time as usual, right after three. As soon as they left, Gilbert made an old guy beeline for the farm and wound up walking right into the back door of the barn. He went inside for fifteen minutes, then turned his mic on like we had Abby do when the old man from earlier came back out on the porch to fire up his pipe. Gilbert spoke quietly into the mic, saying, "'Cover me. Here I go.' He exited the rear of the barn and walked around it and right up to the screen door. The old man with the pipe stopped cold when Gilbert waved, and he put his hand on a revolver on his hip. I put the crosshairs on the old guy's chest and waited for him to make a mistake. You must be Lenny, Gilbert greeted him. Aye, that'd be me. You can't be Adrian, but I bet you're with him, eh? Lenny grinned and puffed on his pipe. I could just barely smell it in the wind. Yeah, I'm one of his friends. I'm Gilbert Donahue. I volunteered to come here and speak to you. I thought we might be able to talk, two old fogies on the porch together. I couldn't see Gilbert's face, but I totally could tell he was smiling. Lenny grinned. I like the cut of your jib, Mr. Donahue. What are you, Marine? I'm a squiddy. Ground pounder here. Three tours of the paddy ending in 71. Mind if I come on the porch with you? Might cut down on the breeze out here. Gilbert rubbed his shoulders to emphasize he was freezing. Lenny led him onto the porch, and the two men sat down in what looked to be rocking chairs. Lenny puffed his pipe, and after a bit, Gilbert finally asked a question. You like coffee, Lenny? I have a cup in the morning, Mr. Donahue. Same as most men who wake with the sun. Lenny smiled. Call me Gilbert. I thought you might want some of this here in my pocket. Gilbert slowly reached into his pocket and produced a small container of Maxwell House instant coffee. He handed it to Lenny like it was a gift of epic proportions. Lenny took it and smiled. Parley had begun. Thanks for having me out here, Lenny. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Gilbert. We got a Sean problem. Your friend Adrian is fixing to take care of for us. I think I'd like his help, but it ain't gonna be easy. Nothing worth doing right is easy, Lenny. You know that same as I do. I can assure you this, though. That boy means business about Sean. If we don't figure this out right quick, it'll get a lot uglier before it gets better. I mean, ugly for everyone. I don't want this to happen, and I'm telling you, you do not want that boy any more motivated. He's lost friends over this, and he wants Sean's head on a pike. He deserves justice on this. 
Lenny nodded. I got all goose pimply when Gilbert said all that. I felt like such a tremendous badass. Hearing a Green Beret say that about me was one of the most flattering things anyone's ever said about me. Lenny nodded in response to Gilbert's veiled threat. Lenny wasn't scared, that much I could tell through the scope. He was, however, worried. If Sean dies, the National Guard man will take over, and those two are cut from similar enough cloth. You'll need to find a way to deal with that man as well, otherwise this just might get worse. He's got far more skill in raising hell than Sean did. You know Sean spearheaded that dunderheaded attack on you people right after Christmas, right? The lieutenant wanted nothing to do with it. He was pissed, though, you guys took out half the men who had skill with guns that day. Gilbert took it in. What's this soldier's name? What's his story? Tell you the truth, I don't know his first name. The guardsmen that served under him still answer to him, and they call him Lieutenant Daniels. I believe deep down he's a good guy. Early thirties. He lost his family when it all went down, and he's kind of scared of everything now. He plays hardball with everyone. Very no-nonsense now, and not always in the good way if you get my meaning. Lenny tipped his brow at Gilbert. Gilbert nodded. Can he be brought to bear? Can we show him we're not the enemy? Gilbert leaned forward in his chair. I don't know. He's got his men thing, and he's G.I. Joe and the savior of mankind. Apparently, he served in the Tenth Mountain in Afghanistan for a tour, and apparently that's enough to get you voted man of the year down at the school. He's smart enough, but I think he's scared yellow, and there's a fair chance he'd be more ready to go to war than sit down and talk things over. We need to sell him hard that Sean is dangerous, or that standing up to you guys is the worst idea imaginable. Gilbert sat back and chewed it over. The two of them sat in silence and thought it over. Gilbert broke the moment of quiet. What if we take his ability to fight from him peacefully? Lenny looks all kinds of confused after that. I bet he had the same expression on his face I did. I had no idea what the fuck Gilbert meant by that. Lenny responded, What the heck does that mean? Take his ability to fight peacefully. Ain't that a whole lot of impossible without fighting? No, not necessarily. Are there men under this Daniels kid that don't like Sean? Oh, yeah, a bunch. He doesn't have that many men left, and I'd say most would go against Sean if they could. All his buddies with a bunch of them. Gilbert seriously looked like he blew an old guy load. I think I saw dust fall out of his pant leg. What if we were to get one of the guys against Sean to make a daily farm run with some extra gear in a day or so? We tell Ollie all about it. We set up a fake ambush with everyone in on it, and we take everything. Ollie and the soldier return to the school and tell them we're big swinging dicks and we're the next best thing since Sophia Loren and a jug of Crisco. Lenny got a laugh out of that. So we make Daniels think you guys can take whatever you want at will unless they give up Sean. Exactly. At the very least, the people here will find out that Sean's blunder and attacking is now coming back on them. We do it in two days, so you can organize here. Really, we don't even have to be here or take anything. You guys can just leave all the stuff we've stolen right here. Of course, the risk is that Daniels decides to come to us and go to war, but if your boy Ollie can find us someone close to Daniels, then we can hope that he can persuade him to either meet with us and talk civil, or that we're too powerful and well-organized to mess with. If they give us Sean or put him to justice and prove it to us, we disappear. Simple as that. No war required. No more blood of the innocents shed for this idiot. Lenny looked at his watch. You all going to be in town tomorrow? We can have a presence here if you need it, Kilbert nodded reassuringly. Well, let me talk to my boy when he comes back tomorrow. If he thinks we can do it, then I'll radio you all again same as yesterday, only at about five in the afternoon. If we're a go, we'll do it the next day and we'll figure it out. That sounds perfect, Lenny. I appreciate your help in all this. Hopefully we can finish this with minimal people getting hurt. There's far too many of us dead now to make more of us dead for nothing. Gilbert stood, and Lenny joined him shortly after. The two men shook, and Lenny looked out over his property before letting go of Gilbert's hand. So, how many guns you got pointed at me right now? He smiled at Gilbert. Just one, Lenny but it's real big, and he's a real good shot with it. 
Gilbert pumped his hand and grinned. It was friendly. That's smart. I like the way you all think. Let's get this all done and call it a day. Sounds good. If you don't mind, I'm going to take a walk in your woods, try and find my way home. Gilbert motioned to the door, and Lenny let him out. Gilbert walked away at a 45-degree angle from me, heading to where we could meet, towards the snowmobile. Lenny turned and headed inside. I covered the house until Gilbert was safe in the trees. I hightailed it to the machine and trudged it along to where I thought he'd be and picked him up. We didn't say anything until we got to the truck, but Gilbert was on cloud motherfucking nine, Mr. Journal. He's convinced we've got this all but sewn up. I'm a little more apprehensive, as you might understand. So the ride back was fine. Had to remember to stop and move the nail boards out of the way and whatnot, but all in all, it was a quick ride home. Abby moved the vans for us, and we got back into Hall E and had some food and talked everything over. Hopefully, it'll all go well and we can make our case to this Lieutenant Daniels guy. If he's on board, either through fear, respect, or what the fuck else, we can form a plan to kill Sean. With any luck, this Daniels character draws his Beretta and puts it to Sean's temple and does the dirty work for me. I'd rather I had the satisfaction of doing it myself, but... Politically, it makes a lot more sense to have someone on their end do it. I'm headed to bed early again. I've got to go back to Westfield once more tomorrow to make sure the fake ambush is on for the day after next. Talk about exciting shit. I'm super nervous and super excited. Might have to take something to sleep tonight just from the excitement. <laughs> Huzzah, bitches. Adrian. February 18th. I wish I had a cigar to chomp on, strictly so I could say I love it when a plan comes together at the same time. Things are moving along just swimmingly. Who the fuck says that? I know I don't. Why the hell would I record it? I guess I'm channeling Queer Eye for the post-zombie apocalypse. Did you see that zombie's outfit? Oh my god, so tacky. Insert flaming moment. Gotta love the gaze. Oh, wow. Okay, so that was off track. Our Westfield problem seems to be coming closer and closer to becoming a Westfield asset. Yesterday, I beat feet to Westfield at about 10 a.m. I didn't need to get there for recon purposes early or anything, and I really just wanted to be there for noon and the house beyond. I did wind up taking a Lunesta that night, and I tell you what, I slept like a goddamn baby. The women have been soldiers about taking up guard duty and doing campus patrols. Patty's rib seems to be more or less set and mended. She says she's all better, but I see her wince now and again. She's off the Advil regimen for the most part, and I think she's more sore than in pain. Tough check. Abby has been doing some pretty ballsy solo patrols of campus, which is saying something because we've had a lot of undead up here. We've gotten them at the bridge pretty much without exception, thank God. Between them getting stuck on the nail boards or not being able to get around the vans fast enough, we're getting it done. I'll lose my mind if the girls get bitten, though. I have fully adopted them as family. Anyway, we're reasonably safe. And on my trips out from campus, Auburn Lake Road has been reasonably clear. Almost every day I have to stop to take out one or two with the hatchet. Sometimes, if I think I can get away with it, I just hit them with the truck. Though if I can, I get out and kill them manually. I'm still waiting for something really loud to happen on campus to lead the huge pack right up the fucking hill. It really makes me want to do something about fortifying the campus immediately, but we've got too much going on. On the way to Westfield yesterday, I set up a small resupply cache. About five miles from town, before the turnoff roads, I found a small house right on the side of the road. I backtracked, went on foot into the woods, and made a straight line to the house so I didn't leave any visible footprints in the snow. The house was wide open and exposed to the elements, and I cleared it out quickly and safely. I dropped off a backpack with my SIG and the magazines, as well as the Remington 870 shotgun. I left a change of clothes, some food, some water, a spare radio, and some medical supplies. If the shit hits the fan in Westfield, we'd at least have weapons and basic supplies. I looked for salvage in the house, but with the windows open, everything edible was ruined. Actually... There were a few cans of food that I snagged, and they had some consumables like laundry detergent and soap and shit like that. I got to Westfield and got myself set up in the woods near the farm. 
I had a good angle looking right down the barrel of the road we did our ambush on the other day, as well as a good field of vision to the door and porch of the farmhouse. Good killing field and great visibility. There was no radio traffic at noon, and when the truck arrived at the farm early at 2.30, I knew something was up. I recognized Ollie and his stout frame and red hair, and with him was another military-looking fellow. He was also a little thick, but he had a solid look to him, sort of a police officer-esque stance. I got out of the truck and headed inside. They were still inside the farm when I got the call over the radio a little after that. It was Lenny. Hey, anyone out there yet? I responded, Yeah, Lenny, we've been here all day. What can I help you with? Is this Adrian? Yes, sir. Nice to talk to you again, young man. I need to ask a favor of you, if you don't mind. He seemed in good spirits, but I caught a hint of skepticism in his tone. What can I do for you, Lenny? My boy Ollie is here, and he's brought a good friend of his, Staff Sergeant Mike McCarthy. Old Mike here is on board with your plan, but ain't willing to do anything without a man's handshake on it. I told him you'd be a hard sell on that, but he's pretty much insistent on it. Any chance you'd be willing to talk face to face? Now, I put some serious thought into this. If I said, fuck you, go to hell, then Sergeant Mike goes back to the school and tells them everything, or he goes against us and says no fucking way and we've lost everything. I can say, sure, I'll be right there, but don't try anything funny, and then he feels like he's at gunpoint. No one wants any part of a shotgun marriage. I played it bold, big swinging dick bold. If he doesn't mind being outside when we meet, then I can be there in ten minutes. After a minute, Lenny came back with, He says that's just fine. Where at? Your porch okay? It's private and whatnot. Plus, you can fire up that big old pipe of yours. Now that's thinking. We'll see you in a jiffy. And I was mobile. I stopped and watched them come out on the porch a minute or so later, and before I came out of the wood line, I checked every single spot I saw for snipers. If I was one, it was reasonable they had one, too. I came out behind the barn so they couldn't see me and came around the corner with the savage on my shoulder. I got to within maybe thirty feet of them before they saw me. My white-sheet camouflage was apparently very effective. Sergeant Mike jumped up and the cigarette fell out of his mouth. He dropped his hand to his pistol and then jerked it away and looked around. He totally knew there were other guns pointed at him. I had to hide a laugh because there weren't any. Power perceived is power achieved, Mr. Journal. Write that shit down. Good afternoon, gentlemen, I smiled. I could see Mike taking my measure, and he seemed to assess me as dangerous. He nodded, and I got the, that's a good soldier look. Sergeants, the good ones at least, can usually assess a soldier as shit or shine almost instantly. There's a way you walk, a way you talk, and a weight good soldiers and cops have. I have it. I nodded at Ollie and Lenny and greeted them. Ollie seemed a little nervous, but much better than our first meeting. Mike didn't look scared much, but the whole time his big brown eyes kept looking for shooters. I shook everyone's hand once Lenny let me on the porch. We talked about kind of generic stuff, then I squared off and just asked them what was up. Mike spoke up first. Look, Adrian, we got a pretty good thing here. As long as we put up with Sean's shit, we eat good, we sleep good, and we're safe. I'm all for kicking his ass off the pedestal he's put himself on, but there's a lot of shit that could go down. If we get rid of him, how do we know you're not going to make a power play on us? You don't. I can say this, though. I've got zero interest in telling you people how to live your lives. I'm trying to live my own. Sean keeps fucking with that, and that's just unacceptable. I saw Lenny flinch when I dropped the F-bomb and made a mental note not to swear anymore. Mike nodded. I suppose you're right there. We were thinking of doing a run tomorrow, and we return empty-handed. We'd go to Lieutenant Daniels and tell him straight up that your people ambushed us, didn't hurt anyone, and said that you guys wanted justice for the gas station attack. I can tell him that all you want is Sean, Sean and only Sean, and you'll be square and walk away. I can sell him on a story that you guys are insanely well-armed and smart and all that, and hopefully the LT will just toss Sean out like rubbish. You think that'll work? It's risky. He might see us as a huge threat and decide to attack us instead. Plus, after our failed ambush when your woman Tara got shot, I was a little apprehensive. Ollie chimed in real quick. Adrian, I kind of lied about that. I went to my dad after you guys left, and 
We decided to play dumb. I told him we got jumped by a zombie and Tara got bitten. I told him I shot her. I thanked Ollie for that, and Mike nodded again. Yeah, that's true. He might feel threatened, but Daniels is kind of a pussy, fundamentally. He went out on skis the day of the Christmas attack and hid in the fucking woods when Sean's assault on you guys went to shit. He wound up skiing the entire way back here over 12 hours that night. Huh, Captain Snowpants revealed. Turns out he's Lieutenant Snowpants. Harsh. Funny that Sean left him like that to die. If we'd found your lieutenant, we probably would have killed him, though. That assault went bad on our end, too. One of my guys accidentally shot a few of your men when they went to surrender. Sucked. Mike nodded. Part of the job, right? Those guys were all big-time Sean people. A few of the local cops, some hunters who thought they were bad mofos. To be honest, they were as much a danger to us as they were to you guys. Fuck em. I grinned. Mike, they weren't much danger to us. That ain't saying much. Keep in mind as well, Sean torched a building in town the other night that had at least 150 people in it, and I lost friends. You can tell that to Daniels, too. I don't think he did that, Mike shook his head. What? He had to have done it. The place completely exploded, lit up the night sky like a Roman candle for hours. This, right after the gas station explosion, can't be a coincidence. He was here in town that night, all night. He was trying to get everyone at the school all motivated to go after you for a final assault. He almost had Daniel sold on a full frontal attack a few days ago, but Jeff balked, said it was logistically impossible not knowing what kind of force you guys had. Shit, we got less than 40 people now, and Sean said you had as many as 30. We talked more about it, and the more we did, the more it seemed like Sean didn't have anything to do with the explosion. Mike and Ollie both said that everyone was at the school that night, Everyone was present and accounted for, which meant Stig was hit by someone else, or there was a terrible accident. I don't know. I guess if Sean is off the hook for that, that's sort of good, but he still tried to have me killed, and he still blew up my fucking gas station. Justice or GTFO? After about 15 minutes of debate, I settled on the idea that a staged, cordial ambush where we came across as friendly more than dangerous was a good idea. Mike seems to really have a good head on his shoulders, and I think he's on the level with me. Ollie seems a little stupid, but he's about 25 and skipped college from what I understand, so he's doing pretty good helping his dad with the farm. Sometimes simple is just what you need. As it turns out, Ollie's been staying at the school because there's a girl there he's pining for— no evil at hand with that, I guess. So Mike and Ollie faked the first ambush today. As they said, they just left all the shit here back at the farm, and when they got back, they went straight to Daniel's and hopefully persuaded him to see the light. No word on that yet, but I'm getting way ahead of myself here suddenly. I feel like I drank ten energy drinks. I'm vibrating here, all over the damn place. I left the porch meeting pretty happy with how it went. I shook everyone's hand, politely stepped around the back of the barn, and got the fuck out. I left immediately. I didn't want to risk that being their chance to get behind me or get to my vehicle to fuck it over. They hadn't, though. When I got back to campus, moving all the damn nail boards on the way, I filled Gilbert and all them in on what went down. He agreed with my big swing and dick plan. Any other way I could have played it would have either been too threatening or would have played my hand as being not strong. Gilbert was sort of on the fence about it. It's risky to put us in that light. It'll either show Daniels we mean business and we want to be allies, or it'll show Daniels that we're scary and need to be destroyed. I guess we'll find out shortly. Oh yeah, I ran over two more zombies on Route 18 on the way back. It looked like they were headed towards Westfield from downtown. I wonder if I dragged them away when I left in the morning. No way to know, I guess. I slept like a stone in the living room last night. Been exhausted from all the activity this week. I slept well and had no weird dreams that I remember. That's a big plus. I am so sick of the LSD dreams. Shit's getting old, Mr. Journal. I booked my ass back to Westfield this morning after refilling the Tundra's gas tank out of Big Blue. I had eaten up all my fuel jugs and the gas tank going back and forth like this. It was a somber reminder how fucked we could be for fuel if we don't start figuring this out soon. I mean, fortunately, we've still got the spare barrel stashed around campus to use, but we really need that fuel to keep the generator going for the furnace. 
I haven't been able to figure out if the solar panels are helping or not either. They're mostly covered in snow at the moment, too, which isn't helping, I'm sure. They're self-heating or something as well, which is probably why they're only partially covered with snow. I don't know. I got to my parking spot in the burbs of Westfield at around 10 a.m. again. I hoofed it to yet another location a few houses over from the very first house I sat up in. This house was a fat ranch right on a street corner, about 500 yards from the school. I could see almost all the way to the end of the street, where it turned off towards the farm, too, so the spot was nice. I saw the truck go by at 3 p.m., right after a chubby zombie slipped and ate shit on the road. It was funny watching it try to get to its feet in the packed-down slush. We had a warm night last night, and the roads they plowed are all gushy now. Too funny. As before, I left the zombie to wander off. Mike and Ollie returned back through town late. That made sense if they were going to fake an ambush. I got some radio traffic as they made the turn onto the road I was on. It was Lenny. Anyone listening today? I waited about thirty seconds before responding to him. Yeah, Lenny was shaken. I was casual. The boys are headed back to the school now. They're going to talk to the lieutenant when they return. They're going to tell him you'll be available tomorrow on this channel at noon. Sound fair? That sounds perfect, Lenny. I appreciate all your help with this. My pleasure, son. Trying to do the good Christian thing. I had to smile. I wasn't religious in the least, but I can appreciate the idea of being a good person. I know I've failed at that many a time, and to hear that he was trying to be right by others sort of warmed my heart. I said goodbye, and after waiting an hour to make sure things were quiet, I got the fuck out of town. Noticed it was lighter much later as well today. Maybe it was just because of the timing of my exit, but it seemed lighter later. The trip home was a little messy. As I said, it was kind of warm, and we got a little bit of rain. I got a wee bit paranoid when I made the turn onto Auburn Lake, too. It got foggy once the elevation increased a little. As I've mentioned before, I fucking hate fog. I hated it even more because I actually friggin' hit a walking zombie on the way up the hill. The bastard was just plodding along, and I was doing about 25 miles an hour. Launched him into the fog ahead so far I couldn't see him. I crept forward until I saw him trying to get up. I aimed for him and ran his ass over. Definitely didn't want to get out of the truck in the pea soup bullshit. No fucking thank you, Mr. Journal. I told Gilbert about the recon today and the faked ambush, and he seemed pleased with it. Gilbert's always thinking so far ahead on shit. I bet you anything he's already got plans for us for spring. Wily fucker, that Gilbert. In retrospect, after our mistrust bullshit, I can totally see how his actions can be misconstrued. He literally is always looking at every angle and only reveals his hand when necessary. I bet that guy's a royal bitch at the poker table. So, like a giant human rubber band, I am headed back to Westfield tomorrow in the hopes that our friend, the Lieutenant Daniels, read Snowpants, drops me a cordial line and we can speak amicably. It's my sincere hope Sergeant Mike and Ollie can persuade him to our side. I desperately want this to end with as little bloodshed as possible. I tell you, though, Mr. Journal... I'm feeling good about this. I don't even care about the jinx factor. Fuck it. Mike, Ollie, and Lenny all seem like really good people to me. I'm a good judge of character, too, I think. Uh, They seem like down-to-earth straight shooters who've had enough of all this bullshit. I hope they see me for the same. Adrian February 19th Fuckity, fuck, fucking A, Mr. Journal. One more to grow on? Fucking A. Wow, heart is pumping like a bastard. I think this is almost over. I really do. Within 48 hours, I'm either dead or Sean's dead. And one way or the other, this trip will come to an end. I get to start the next journey. I don't even know where to start here. I have a chubber the size of my forearm, which is way larger than normal. That's at least 50% larger than normal, not that I'm bragging about dick size to a fake person. Christ, the thing has been so unused lately, I think I've got dust on it. It's awful. Otis is freaking out here, man. Whenever I get all excited and happy, he digs out one of his little cat toys and goes postal on it. He's currently running around kicking the living shit out of a fake mouse and chewing its head to shit. He's such a moron. Back on subject. I went to Westfield today at the crack of dawn. The drive-in was good, although it snowed all day, and the ride back sort of sucked ass. 
I wound up hitting five more zombies in the tundra on the way out. I saw a small crowd coming down Route 18, so I drove really slowly away, and apparently I got them moving this way. I wound up hitting them with the truck on the way back. Poor fucking pickup is beaten to shit. I'll need to use the plow for night drives now, as I've managed to smash both headlights in the tundra out. Maybe I can score another tundra somewhere, or at least spare tundra headlamps. I weaved my way into the city of Westfield this morning and set up shop in a multifamily house about three blocks from the school on the other side. It's amazing how few streets they've plowed out. I mean, it makes sense to leave them covered in snow. The zombies can't get through the stuff for shit. But it also means there are huge tracts of real estate I can move around in with really no chance they'll see my footprints. I did get a bit of a scare, though. I was sprinting between buildings, and a Humvee came around the corner about 75 yards ahead. I was near a bush and literally just dove out like I was about to jump on a slip and slide. The sheet on my back blended in perfectly with the snow. The Humvee stopped, and I peeked out of a tiny crack under the sheet. The soldier-looking guy searched the area I was laying in, and after about 30 seconds decided he didn't see anything, and they left. I realize it's a little crazy to be hiding from people I'm trying to ally with, but I didn't want them to know I was on a recon op right in their backyard. It makes me look like a liar when all I'm trying to do is cover my bases. Funny how diplomacy in the post-apocalyptic world works, eh, Mr. Journal? I cleared out the second-floor apartment of the multifamily home and found nothing. Empty as they all are. The kitchen window faced the school, and with a few hours of note-taking and map-making... I was able to get a full and complete layout of the school. Good times. After chilling out and eating a granola bar, my radio popped to life on their channel 5 at 12.05. It was a new voice, and I was pretty excited to hear it. This is Lieutenant Jeffrey Daniels with the 809th Brigade Support Battalion. Is there anyone on this channel? Over. G.I. Joe, baby. Had to try and play this close to the chest for a bit. Copy that. This is Adrian Ring. I've been waiting for your call, over. I didn't want to over-military my responses, but I wanted him to know I wasn't a total tool when it came to protocol. Copy that, Mr. Ring. I'm under the impression you are a decision-maker, over. Terse. He sounded fairly young, too. Definitely younger than me, but I thought Lenny said he was about my age. Roger that. I'm here to start some talks about getting rid of what I've been led to believe is a mutual problem for our people. I appreciate you contacting me, over. Copy that. You know the United States has a standing policy of not negotiating with terrorists, right, Mr. Ring? His tone became defiant. I knew I had to placate his ego. I could just tell I needed to think of a way to make him feel like we were not his enemy. Lieutenant, I prefer to think of myself as a humble soldier that's trying to protect his fellow citizens from someone who appears to be a terrorist themselves. I'm sure you realize by now that Sean has perpetrated not one, but two unprovoked violent attacks on my people and our shared resources. Can't afford to allow him to be in charge of the people here, or the threat he poses is too dangerous for me and my people to not respond by defending ourselves. Over. I took a big risk with that. Senator Stockwell has reported that he was attacked when he followed people from here in town to your base of operations. When we returned to your AO, you'd set up an ambush for us, and we wound up losing a dozen people. I can't see your point of view right now. I need proof, over. Uphill battle here. This guy struck me as one of those hard-ass officers who couldn't think outside the box. Ran his unit just like the manual said, and not the way common sense said. Lieutenant Daniels, I'm sure you keep your ammunition and weapons well organized, correct? Over. Had to make a play at showing me he was either incompetent with organization or he'd illuminate a fact for us that provided some semblance of proof of Sean's scumbaggery. We are very well organized, Mr. Ring, when it comes to that. Over. You lost three people the other night in your attack on the gas station, correct? Over. Copy that. Two males and a female. Wasn't pleased about that either, Mr. Ring. This line of discussion is not moving us together, over. I'm sure you weren't pleased. Shooting them was the last thing we wanted to do, but they were armed combatants standing around our gas station as it burned. Were those people friends or supporters of yours? Over. Moment of truth. His voice broke a little when he responded. I'd rather not comment on personal relationships with a terrorist. I knew right then I had his ass. 
no over, and his voice kind of broke, which meant they were friends of his. I'm genuinely sorry you lost people, Lieutenant. Did you happen to know what weapons the people you lost had? Can you find that out, over? Again, uh, I'd rather not comment on that. No, over again. He'd started to lose his composure. I understand. I'll just tell you what I know, then. I searched your people and made sure they were well taken care of, Lieutenant, and I'll tell you this. Not one of the three people who died that night had loaded weapons. It's my distinct suspicion that your fearless senator set those people up to die because they were against him. Over. Silence for some time. Maybe a full minute. You have my attention, Mr. Ring. Over. He sounded pissed, and it didn't sound like he was pissed at me. Look, Lieutenant, I'm sick of posting watch every single night waiting for Sean or some asshole who thinks he's the next coming of the president to try and set my home on fire. I've got old people and kids that have done nothing to him that I'm trying to protect, just the same as you, I'm sure. I want this to end. I want to go home and deal with the damn dead people beating down our doors instead of the living people that should be working with me. I've lost good friends over all this bullshit, and at least a thousand gallons of gasoline, and it's not like the gas station is opening up again anytime soon. Gas doesn't grow on trees, either. I really need your help in bringing this to a peaceful end. Over. Silence again. It lasted so long, I actually checked to see if the battery on the walkie had died. It hadn't. It was about five minutes before he replied again. I've got no interest in putting a gun to his head, Ring. I'm told you'd be willing to do it if it came down to it. Is this true? Man, this was hard to answer, Mr. Journal. I wanted to kick that prick's face in, and I wanted to do it more than just about anything I'd ever wanted to do, but I couldn't let him know I was bloodthirsty. Here's what I came back with. Look, I served same as you, active duty. I did my time in the sandbox. I know what it's like to kill someone. I'm not happy about pulling triggers when the gun's aimed at anyone. I will say this, though. Sean has done wrong by me and done wrong by my people, and I need to see justice done for my people to sleep at night. If that means I'm the one that does what needs to be done, then so be it. I'll do what's necessary and deal with the guilt later. I can't let that man continue to put the people I care about in continual danger. Over. More silence. Not as long this time as last time. Finally, he came back. I went to Sean earlier this morning and discussed the fact that we've had two trips assaulted by that asshole from the school. He was pretty furious, Rang. I mean, fucking angry. We're rolling in a big patrol tomorrow when we make the run at about 3 p.m. We've already decided that it'll be him, me, and four guys I trust. We're meeting with Lenny at the farm. We're going to tell Stockwell he's done for, and he can leave, or he can stay, and get handed over to you, over. Shaboing! Instant chubber. Is that going to be safe? He strikes me as the kind of asshole that'd draw a gun on you and your men. Well, Ring, if he decides to draw a gun on us, then I've got no problem shooting him. I won't shoot him unarmed, and I won't shoot him in cold blood, but if he draws on one of my men, we'll shoot the shit out of that cocksucker. No, over. He meant it. Understandable. Where would you like me to be? I'd really like to have eyes on for this, if you get my meaning. Over. He thumbed back with a live line and then sighed. I don't know if he meant to do that. You got binos or a rifle with good optics? Over. I do indeed. I can be in range for that. I'd much rather be within earshot, though, if that's okay with you. I'd really like to hear everything that's said. Plus, if anything does go down, I'd like to be there to help. Not that I can't help from a few hundred yards away with a rifle, over. I really wanted to be there to hear it all go down. Daniels took another minute to reply. That'd probably be a good idea. If you'd like, you can hole up in either the barn or the chicken building. Just make sure Lenny knows where you are. If anything goes wrong, we'll radio you on this channel by noon tomorrow. Keep the line open until you see us pull into the farm. After that, you should be in earshot. If the meeting is called off, we'll speak again via radio on this channel the day after next at noon once more. Same as today, over. That sounds excellent, Lieutenant. I'd like to add something as well, if that's okay with you, over. Here's the final sales pitch. Go ahead, over. 
When this is all settled, I'd really like to sit down and pour a glass of something kind of strong with you and your soldiers. It'd be nice to have a drink with someone who wears real combat boots, if you understand my meaning. I had to appeal to his warrior nature. We don't have any booze left here, so if you bring the bottle, we'll help empty it with you. I could hear him smiling right through the radio. I hope to shake your hand tomorrow, Lieutenant. Same to you. Over and out. Ha <laughs> ha! Woot! I am positively fucking giddy. I skedaddled after an hour or so and got the fuck home. I don't even remember the trip. I remember literally hitting the giant cluster of zombies I led away from Auburn Lake Road earlier, but I don't remember much. Dead bodies flying around like an explosion of zombie confetti. Just too damned excited. We're rolling out early in the morning to get to Westfield and to get us all into position. We're rolling fat as hell on this. Everyone's going, and we're all bringing a full combat load in the event shit hits the fan. We're leaving the truck behind at one of the houses with Patty in the event the truck is attacked. Gilbert, Abby, and I are taking the snow machine to different places and setting up. Abby's going in the chicken coop. I'll hopefully be in the barn, and Gilbert will be in the tree line with his AK. One way or the other, tomorrow this bullshit ends. If I live, I'll put an entry in as soon as I can. Adrian February 20th. It's over. He's dead, and so is he. That totally sucks my nose. <laughs> Balls, I mean. Not as happy as I thought I'd be, but whatever, right? <laughs> I'm a little drunk. I'll chitty chitty chat sometime when I get home and wake up. Hope I can find a good place to sleep, Erica. Kind of a packed house and stuff. Fucking A, Mr. Journal. Fucking A, dude. <laughs> Adrian. Tyrant. Oliver McDowell's heart hammered in his chest like it was about to explode. He watched the woman who had been talking a second ago crumple to the ground not six feet from him. All he knew he was next. He knew it as sure as he knew his red hair was receding and that his waist had swollen over winter. No work on his dad's fields made for a fat ollie. The former National Guardswoman Tara had just been shot in the chest by a man that was bounding through the snow directly at ollie. He'd burst through the door of an abandoned house in this empty city. They were on a suburban street in his hometown of Westfield, in one of the prefabricated developments that had grown right up next to his dad's farm. The entire city was now dead or gone, save for perhaps forty survivors. The rest had all been eaten by the living dead, frozen in the winter cold, or killed by each other over the meager scraps left behind by the living. Ollie knew the man running at him through the snow would kill him. It wouldn't be the first time a rogue survivor had killed someone in his group. Ollie looked ahead down the road and watched the pretty young blonde girl pull a pistol just like his from her waist. Moments before, they'd stopped to help the girl, and now it seemed they'd fallen into her trap. She pointed the gun at him and gave him the most serious face he'd ever seen a teen wear. Her long, wild blonde hair whipped in a sudden gust of late February air. His pistol hung limp in his hand. Once he realized he'd have no chance of raising the gun in time, he let it fall on the snow with a faint crunch. He was literally scared solid. The giant man reached the street, and Ollie realized the man was a brute. The stranger was over six feet tall and broad from shoulder to feet. He wore a black, tight-fitting cap, and his dark brown hair poked out from underneath. He looked much cleaner than the other survivors Ollie had met recently. Maybe he had soap. He pointed a military-style rifle at Ollie's chest and walked slowly across the front of the pickup, approaching the adult farm boy. Ollie could hear the woman, Tara, rolling around on the ground on the other side of the truck. She was whimpering in pain, and Ollie was sick deep down. He knew she'd die shortly. Watch him. The man barked out to the girl as he slung his rifle on his back. He reached underneath his thick winter jacket and produced a small bag of medical supplies. He attended Tara for a second, leaning her against the tire of the pickup, but she went quiet almost immediately. All he knew Tara had died from the gunshot. 
Now they had the horrible waiting. How long would it be before she stood back up again as the living dead? Sometimes it was a minute, sometimes it was several, but it was never long enough for Ollie. Fuck, the man yelled out. God fucking damn it, shit, shit, motherfucker. The big man stood and looked down at her. He continued his tirade of wretched language, looking down at the dead woman, angry that she'd died. Finally, he grabbed her handgun off the packed snow in the road and fished her two spare magazines out of her jacket pocket. She was armed the same as Ollie was. The large man abruptly reached his full height and came around the truck at Ollie. Ollie couldn't help but take a few steps back, fearful the man would punch him or stab him. Instead, the man reached down and scooped up the pistol Ollie had just dropped off the ground. He checked to make sure it was loaded and that the safety was on. The man slipped it into his jacket pocket with the magazines he'd just taken off of Tara's body. Hey there, you have any idea who the two of us are? The man asked Ollie. Ollie was completely terrified of this man. He was cold, hard, and his voice was unflinching. The wrong answer would get Ollie killed. He just knew it. Ollie swallowed and stammered out the response he thought was least likely to get his face punched in by the huge man. I... I have no idea who you people are. The big man cracked a smile. Ollie was reminded of the Cheshire Cat. I'm Adrian Ring. Your council leader, Sean Stockwell, attacked my people twice now. This was it. Ollie knew this was it. He'd lost all chance of getting out of this alive. His bladder started to empty as he spoke his thoughts aloud to the murderer that faced him down. Oh, oh, my word. You're the crazy man that killed all of our people at Christmas. You, you're a frickin' monster. You killed Tara, too. Oh, gosh, no. Oh, shit. When Ollie swore, it was serious business. Swearing was a behind-the-tool-shed-with-the-belt event at the McDowell farm. The man's face softened somewhat, but Ollie was still scared. This man had just said that he was the person Ollie's group had attacked when their people had been murdered a month prior. He was the murderer Ollie's council leader had spoken to them about. The Adrian man spoke again. Look, man, what's your name? Oliver, but everyone just calls me Ollie. Ollie was starting to slip into a state of shock. The smell of urine in his jeans almost made him blush. He hadn't pissed himself since middle school. Ollie, I am really quite sorry that this Tara lady got shot, but you can probably figure out that she was about to shoot me and I had to shoot her to stay alive. I'm sure as a reasonable man you can see that if you can shoot someone before they're about to shoot you, you need to do the same, right, Ollie? Ollie nodded. He couldn't harm a human being to save his life. Uh, yeah, sure, I guess. Excellent, Ollie. Here's what you need to know. We want nothing to do with any more violence. However, your leader Sean followed people on Christmas from here to where we live and then attacked us to get our food. Now, we're hungry too, and you don't just attack people and take their food. You start peaceful trade or barter, right? Yeah, I suppose, but Sean said you attacked them when they followed the people who left Westfield. They were trying to help those people, and you attacked them. Ollie was feeling a little more assertive now. He didn't appreciate being lied to. Ollie, that's complete horseshit. The man's face went stern again, and Ollie remembered he'd just pissed himself because of this man. He looked around nervously, hoping salvation would come marching by, but instead the man continued talking. If you know this Sean man like I know him, and you know he's feeding you a pile of bullshit... He'll tell you anything to get your people to hate us. Shit, Ollie, your people blew up the gas station near where we're holed up the other night, and, and the next day they blew up a huge building in town, too. Over a hundred people have died because of Sean, Ollie. That's a lot of blood spilled over nothing. Ollie knew Sean was a politician before the dead took over the world, and the one thing his father had taught him about Sean was that he was a politician, and all politicians are not to be trusted. Ollie didn't know what to believe. I knew about it, us attacking that gas station, but we didn't attack any other building. That, that's news to me. 
Don't forget, sir, you shot and killed three of our people yourself that night. The three people with empty guns, you mean? Ollie had no answer. Why would they have empty guns? Why would anyone bring empty guns to something like that? Why would this big man lie to Ollie? Yeah, Ollie, they had guns, and I shot them because they were still there holding them. But when I checked, their guns were empty. Any chance those people that died that night were maybe against Sean's ideas at all? Ollie tried to hide his face by looking down at the ground. He noticed the expanding dark ring of urine on his jeans. He knew the three people who had died that night. They weren't fans of how Sean ran the school they were all living in. The remnants of the town, including a few members of the local National Guard armory, were all locked up and living in the old high school, the same one Ollie had graduated from just ten years ago. Ollie, how many spare pistol magazines do you have with you? The man asked. That question seemed like a bad one, and poor Ollie remembered he was probably going to die shortly. I've got the one in the gun you picked up, plus two more in my jacket pocket, sir. No sooner than Ollie had finished, they heard movement on the ground nearby. Adrian spun and looked on the other side of the truck where Tara's body was. He was twitching. That was the first sign that reanimation was imminent. Excuse me for a second, Ollie. I, I need to deal with this. The big man fished a small camping hatchet off a belt loop and walked around to Tara's body. He lined up the hatchet and brought it down into her head with a wet crunch. A fine spatter of blood hit the big man's chest, and he wrenched the small hatchet out. He flung the gore off the hatchet as Tara's body twitched a final time. Ollie, can you give me the two mags in your pocket, please? He extended a waiting hand, and Ollie got the two magazines out for the man. He dropped them in his big hand. Adrian put those with the other magazines in his pocket and drew Ollie's pistol. Ollie's heart stopped beating. Rather than shoot the red-headed man, Adrian dropped the magazine out of the pistol and cocked an arm back. He gunned the black pistol magazine down the road over the head of the blonde girl until it stopped about a football field's distance away. Before the magazine even stopped moving, Adrian had searched the cab of the pickup truck. He killed the still-running motor and took their radio and keys. Fortunately, the highway robber didn't take the crate of milk and fresh bread they'd just gotten from his father's farm not a half hour earlier. If he dug into the crate even deeper, he might find the two butchered chickens his father had cut up for the pregnant women back at the school. His dad said protein was important for babies. The big man returned to Ollie and spoke once more. Ollie, by now I'm sure you know that there's nothing stopping Miss Clara from putting all nine millimeters of her Beretta right in your head, right? He motioned to the young girl who still had her gun pointed at Ollie. When he and Tara had come up on the blonde walking down the road earlier, she'd said her name was Clara. Ollie nodded in response, suddenly remembering yet again that he was about to die. I don't want to hurt you, and neither does she. Furthermore, I don't want to steal your food. You've got pregnant women to feed, and I'm sure you've got kids there as well, right? Ollie had no idea how the big man knew they had pregnant women at the school. This man must be well-connected and have spies searching their town. Ollie nodded at him, too scared to speak. So, the food is yours. When we leave here, you're going to walk to the keys and the magazine down the road there, and then you come back to the truck. How you decide to tell the rest of your people what happened here is up to you, but I sincerely hope you tell them exactly what happened. Tara was shot when she pointed a gun at me, and I'm regretful it happened. You make sure to tell them I'm sorry for it, okay? Ollie realized suddenly that he was going to survive this encounter. He almost smiled and nodded again at the big man. The blonde girl started to lower the pistol she had been pointing at his fledgling round belly. The large man with the assault rifle on his back leaned in a little too close to Ollie for his comfort and spoke quietly. Now, you need to pass along a message for me, and I need you to understand fully that I am as serious as someone can possibly be about this. Okay. Ollie would not have said no even if his spine had been made out of cast iron. Yeah, okay, anything you want. If you need to, you can tell this to Sean. I think you'd be better off, though, if you told it to someone who didn't necessarily agree with Sean, okay? The man lightened up a bit, and Ollie wasn't quite as scared. 
Ollie nodded, hoping the message wouldn't get him into more trouble than he already would be. Sean has done wrong by me, and he's done wrong by my people. Now, this might no longer be a country made of laws, but justice will be served in this regard. I expect your people to understand that attacking my people for no good reason, blowing up a perfectly good gas station filled with fuel, and then blowing up a building filled with my friends, is entirely unacceptable. I've never done anything to you people here other than this today. All Ollie could manage was a nod. I want Sean, Sean and only Sean. He pays for his crimes against me and my people. I want nothing to do with hurting anyone, but mark my words, Ollie. I will tear your school down brick by bloody brick until that man is brought before me to pay for what he's done. Ollie's bladder found more urine to fill his pants with. Oliver was not the brightest man in the world, but he was blessed with the powerful sense that his father was a wise man. After the tyrannical holdup in the suburbs, just a mile or so from his father's small farm, he knew his first stop would be home. He had to tell his father what had happened. His dad knew something bad had happened when Ollie knocked and burst into the kitchen of their old farmhouse. Ollie stammered out the details to his aging father as he stripped in their bathroom. His father listened as he warmed some water in a tea kettle so Ollie could wash off. He didn't want to go back to the school smelling like he'd pissed himself. There was a pretty girl there Oliver was trying to court, and it just wouldn't do to smell like pee. Leonard McDowell was known around town as Lenny. He was tall and had thinning hair that was a far-gone gray from the ginger red of his youth. His skin was dark from years spent under the sun, and his hands were large and powerful. He was the man who was always called to get a bolt unstuck when it was rusted up. Lenny was a recent widower and the primary engine for the McDowell farm. Lenny and Ollie had lost dear Martha just a month and a half ago when Martha had been out trying to plow the driveway with the old farm tractor. She shouldn't have been out there in the first place, but Lenny had come down with a bug that had him laid up something fierce that day, and she couldn't wait for him to mend. They had to clear the driveway, otherwise the daily pickup of milk and bread would be messed up, and no one wanted to irritate the senator over at the school. Lenny didn't like that man one bit. Stockwell was a four-eyed pompous bastard in his book, like every other politician. His wife had gotten herself killed over fear of angering him, and Lenny had sworn up and down one day he'd figure out a way to settle the score with that worthless lump. Lenny listened to his mildly dim boy go over every detail, word for word, of the encounter. It was a shame the soldier woman got shot, but Lenny thought she was a dyke anyway. No harm in the big scheme of things. He chastised himself for thinking those thoughts. He'd have to pray for extra forgiveness at bedtime tonight. Right after he prayed for his normal forgiveness for blowing his wife's head off when she was trapped under the tractor in December. Ollie spoke 900 miles an hour when he was nervous and excited. Eventually, Lenny sat the young man down at their 50-year-old maple kitchen table and got him calmed down over a warm glass of fresh milk. Daddy, he was going to kill me. You should have seen his face. He was a scary man. Ollie was finally talking slow enough for Lenny to piece everything together. Ollie, that's nonsense. If he'd have planned on killing you, he would have done it right when he shot Tara. No sense talking to someone you're going to shoot. He even apologized to you after. This man sounds sensible. He also sounds like he means business. We could make good use of a man like that, you know. Lenny sipped on his own small glass of warm milk. He'd gotten it straight from the cow himself earlier. There was nothing better in the whole world in his mind. What exactly can we get out of a man like that? He kills people. Ollie was pretty well lost. He wasn't one for figuring out subterfuge or Nancy Drew novels. He said to get a hold of him on the radio at noon on the 15th, right? Lenny's sharp mind was turning a plan over in his head. This could be good. This could free what remained of the town from the tyranny of a pompous, lying politician once and for all. Yeah, what am I going to tell them about what happened to Tara? If Sean finds out, he'll want to go to war with those people again— it's time he'll set their houses on fire. Ollie downed the last bit of milk and wiped off the foam on his upper lip. Lenny hated to ask his son to do it, but he knew he had to. 
You tell them she was bitten. You saw a girl in the road. You got out to help her, just like what really happened. And Tara was a damn fool and got herself killed. I'll go get her body and get it buried proper as soon as you get going. You don't say a word to anyone about what happened today, you hear? Not one word of the truth to anyone till I talk to this Adrian fella on the 15th. Lenny pointed his leathery finger at his son like a Catholic school teacher would point her stick. Ollie nodded and went to fetch his jacket. Getting back into the school was easy. Surrounding the massive former edifice of public education, the survivors had organized a wall of vehicles. Parked bumper to bumper in the same fashion cowboys would circle the wagons in. There were two spaces where they'd parked vans offset from the full wall of automobiles, and those served as the gates to the Westfield compound. On the roof of the school, Lieutenant Daniels had two soldiers keeping watch for any undead that managed to get over the cars blockading the property. Every once in a while, a dead person would get lucky and fall just right onto the hood of a truck or into the bed and find themselves over the makeshift wall. But that was a rare occurrence. The former National Guard officer in charge of security had been very thorough about cleaning out the town of undead. It helped that he had huge diesel-powered military vehicles and giant off-roading trucks to tool around town, running over everything in. Those were gory times, Ollie recalled. He'd waved to the guard on the roof like normal, and one of the people inside the compound came out as he did a slow lap around the junkyard wall. That led the few lingering zombies to the other side of the compound. Once he was opposite the gate, he gave it some gas and sped around, leaving them far behind. He was inside and parked before the undead realized where he'd gone. They returned to their meaningless existence, reaching out, trying to claw their way fruitlessly through the wall of cars. Everyone asked Ollie where Tara was, and just as he and his father had discussed, Ollie told the lie. He knew he was sinning for telling the lie, but he also knew his father was a wise man and that a few extra prayers would help alleviate the weight of the lies on his soul. Some people cried when they talked to him. The soldiers got angry because they lost one of their own. They always got angry when someone died. It was their way. After he dropped the fresh food off in the giant school kitchen, Ollie ran upstairs to the art room and checked in on the pregnant ladies. He always liked saying hi to them. It made him feel better about the end of the world when he thought about cute babies. He secretly hoped one of them would be a redhead like himself. That would be neat. He also got to say hi to the girl he really liked, Melissa. She was a pretty girl and a year younger than he. She had pretty brown hair and wasn't too skinny. All he could think of when he saw her was his mom. All he sure did love his mom. Ollie told everyone the story and said hi to the pregnant ladies and Melissa. Ollie meandered his way over to the room he shared with Sergeant Mike and a few of the soldiers. Sergeant Mike was the second in command of the remaining National Guard soldiers from Westfield. They had mobilized in June when the dead people came back to life and helped get this group of people safe here in the school. Without Lieutenant Daniels and Sergeant Mike, Ollie was sure they'd all be dead. After all, they wouldn't have been able to empty the two grocery stores in town or the hardware store or all those restaurants for the food inside if it wasn't for the soldiers, not to mention the truckload of guns and bullets they'd stored here in the basement. Sergeant Mike said they had thousands and thousands of rounds of five five six, which apparently was a good thing. Ollie's experience with guns was limited to squirrel and fox hunting with his dad's twenty two and the few times he'd had to take the pistol out to shoot a dead person in the head. Luckily, Ollie had shot a lot of squirrels as a teen, and he had little problem shooting dead people in the head. As long as he said a prayer that night for them, he slept okay. Ollie plopped down on his cot in the classroom he shared with the other men. The room had the faint odor of sweat and dirty camouflaged uniforms were strewn all about. Just Sergeant Mike was there, laying down on his back reading a Spider-Man comic. Ollie had seen him read that same issue at least twenty times already. There wasn't much interesting to read any more, just what was in the library downstairs, and most of the soldiers wanted stuff with action and pictures, instead of long sentences and stories. Ollie, buddy, heard about Tara. I'm glad you were there for her when she needed you. 
Mike sat the comic down on his chest and propped himself up on his elbows. He was a big man, and Ollie always felt safer when he was around. Ollie looked up at the ceiling and tried to think of a clever way to lie to his best friend. In the end, he just closed his eyes thinking about it and started to drift off to sleep. Stay strong, bud. Get some rest. Sergeant Mike rested his head back down and returned to the exploits of Peter Parker. Again. Sean didn't fuck Melissa all the time because he was attracted to her. He fucked her because he could. She wanted more food, and for the low, low price of sucking him off a few times a week or bending over and letting him go to town for a few minutes, he was more than happy to make sure she got a few extra cans of food here and there. It was only fair. Besides, they had a million cans of spam and green beans. He sat on the edge of his bed in the empty classroom, filling up with morning sunshine, and watched her get dressed. She didn't turn to face him the entire time, and after slipping on his round eyeglasses, he fired up a cigarette. It was stale, but better than nothing. After a long drag, he leaned back on the bed and watched her adjust the sweater she'd been wearing when she snuck into his room late the night prior. The fading auburn-colored sweater fit snug over her chest. She was a thicker girl, and more than likely the sweater wasn't hers when the shit hit the fan. Plus, she had nice tits. There was no doubt about that. Melissa pulled her light brown hair back into a short ponytail and stood up. She slipped her feet into her small shoes and walked towards the classroom door to leave. From behind her, Sean called out softly, Hey, Melissa, you free the night after next? Sean exhaled a long stream of smoke out towards the cracked window in the corner of the room. Melissa tried to hide her disgust. I'll have to check my calendar, Sean. Well, try and keep that night clear. Your stuff is there on the desk. He pointed a finger on the hand holding the cigarette butt at the old teacher's desk. Four assorted cans of food sat there for her to take. Melissa nodded without saying a word and took the cans and left. It was just about the time for her to get down to the kitchen and help with breakfast. The trip down to the kitchen took only a few minutes, and when she arrived she sat the cans on one of the long stainless steel tables they prepped the food on. Truth be told, she only slept with him to get Sean to give them the right amount of food every day. Melissa thought if that prick was any stingier with the mountain of cans in the basement, they'd all starve. Everyone knew they had plenty of food to last into next winter. He was just holding on to the key to the storeroom to conserve his power. Melissa got to work and started opening cans with the other ladies. They chit-chatted, and as usual, they all hugged her like normal— on the day she forced herself to sleep with Sean. Every one of the girls in the kitchen knew she was doing it. It was their plan, after all. Stacy and Mary were too young to send to Sean, and Lindsay and Carol were too old. It just happened that Melissa was old enough, strong enough to deal with the constant sexual predations of Sean, and still good-looking enough to tempt the bastard. Every one of these girls would kick him square in the balls if given half the chance— he was such a tyrant, king of the playground sandbox. Half an hour later, after the food was all prepared, Melissa saw Oliver McDowell come into the cafeteria. She watched him casually through the small kitchen window. She kind of liked him. He was a sweet kid, but very much a farm boy. He was a little behind the curve socially, so to speak. All he saw her and lit up. He smiled ear to ear and made a beeline over to her. Hi, Melissa. It's nice to see you this morning. You look wonderful in red. Ollie blushed fiercely, bringing out the contrast of his freckles. Melissa smiled at him. Thanks, Ollie. Here's your breakfast. She pushed the cafeteria tray across the window to him. Breakfast was a serving of corned beef hash as well as a large cup of fruit salad. It wasn't much, but it had enough juice to keep a body going until dinner. What's for dinner tonight, Melissa? Ollie grabbed one of the stamped metal forks out of the silverware organizer and stabbed a slice of peach glistening with sugary syrup. He munched on it as she thought about her answer. Tonight we're having omelets with ham, but tomorrow night is chicken soup. The chicken your dad brought over will make for a delicious treat for us. Melissa smiled at him. I'm sure it'll be good if you're helping to cook it, Melissa. I wanted to give you this, by the way. I don't know if you remember or not, but it's Valentine's Day. I couldn't find you anything nicer. I, I hope you like it. 
Ollie reached into his back pocket and produced a small locket on a delicate gold chain. Ollie smiled in a genuinely warm way, handed her the locket, and Melissa couldn't help but smile back. Ollie turned bright red and walked away with his breakfast. Melissa opened the locket and looked inside at the little picture. It was a photograph of a single red rose, obviously cut out of a magazine. Melissa sighed. If they ever got rid of that asshole Sean, she might actually think about talking to Ollie more seriously about things. He wasn't all that bad looking. His dad ran the farm that kept them in milk, bread, eggs, and chickens. And Ollie himself was easily the sweetest man left in Westfield. She was doing a lot worse giving Sean a piece of ass now and then for cans of carrots. The next evening, the chicken soup had gone over like gangbusters. Girls, you've outdone yourself with this soup. If anyone here deserves a raise, it'll be you all for sure. Sean gave his slick politician smile to the kitchen staff as he set his bowl down on the window counter. He took his circular glasses off and polished them with a small cloth he produced out of his pocket. He put the glasses back on once they were spotless. Standing next to him was the leader of the remaining National Guardsmen, Lieutenant Jeff Daniels. To the girls, he was just Jeff. The senator's right. This is pretty great stuff. If we could just figure out a better way to go to the bathroom here, we'd be in hog heaven, eh? The girls let out a laugh. Despite being reasonably well-fed and warm from the giant school furnace, they still had to use buckets to go to the bathroom. Granted, the handier men at the school had built pretty elaborate toilet seats for them to sit on, but it still meant they had to throw out buckets of human waste every day. You know, Jeff, that's a great point. Come summertime, maybe we can look into getting some kind of working plumbing here. I'm sure we can rally some support for that work. We've got two little ones on the way, you know. Sean stepped right into the political support gathering for his project without missing a beat. That's Lieutenant Daniel, Senator. Jeff didn't care for the senator, and his forcing him to refer to him by rank was one way of showing his disrespect. And I'm sure we can get the work done. Ted had some experience working in plumbing. Hopefully we can work something out when the weather turns. Jeff was always cold to the senator. It gave Daniels the willies that no matter what, Sean's damn glasses always obscured his eyes. The two men constantly argued over decisions. Sean had done a tremendous job of organizing them early after the government and media had collapsed. He was charismatic, smart, and could talk like no one's business. He got the soldiers on board with securing the school and got all the food collected and stored as well. For months he was a hero and was loved by one and all. No one at the school cared for Sean much anymore. He still had a few of the flunkies from the town's old guard that supported him, but... They were waning in their support for him. Everyone knew that Sean's recent plan to torch the gas station near another group of survivors was a little dangerous. They'd lost three people on that attack, and no one was quite sure what they'd gained by doing it. One night around Christmas, Sean and two of his right-hand men were out doing what Sean called a supplies assessment in town. Basically, they were heading street to street looking for houses and businesses that hadn't been ransacked yet. When they were out, they saw fresh tracks in the snow heading out of town. According to Sean, they followed the tracks almost thirty miles to a private school that was pretty far out of the way. When they attempted to help the people who had left town, Sean said they were attacked by the people at the school. During the firefight, Sean said both of his men were killed by a group of attackers led by a mysterious man named Adrian. Sean rallied support over the next few days, claiming that if they didn't attack the people at the school first, they risked losing everything they'd worked so hard for in Westfield. He was convinced an attack would be made on them. Sean assembled a group of people to assault the school with. He attempted to get Lieutenant Daniels to make the assault with his men, but he refused. Jeff said there was no reasonable threat, and an assault without suitable intelligence was pure negligence. The two men battled for days over it, and finally Jeff conceded that he would ski ahead to the school as a point man and clear the road. The assault was a complete failure. The mysterious Adrian had set an ambush for them, and Sean rolled his entire group of people right into it. Jeff and Sean had gotten out alive by the skin of their teeth. They'd lost multiple vehicles, an arsenal of ammunition, and almost a dozen people. 
Since that day, Sean had steadily lost the support of people at the school in Westfield. He had led them into a war they had no interest being involved in and had botched the entire process every step of the way. Everyone knew it was just a waiting game for the next council elections. Many of the Westfield survivors wanted the young lieutenant in charge. He had the support of everyone that still mattered, the women of Westfield. Of the 39 survivors remaining at the school, 27 were women. Many had lost their husbands right after Christmas and Sean's failed attack. There was little love left for the man in the corner classroom. Presently, Sean forced a fake smile and thanked the women once more for their culinary prowess. He excused himself to deal with council matters and left. The women in the kitchen watched him leave with dagger-filled eyes. Lieutenant Jeff Daniels of the 809th Brigade Support Battalion was chilled at the women's expressions. Something had to be done about Sean, and he suddenly felt that they couldn't wait until the council elections in November. Mike, sit down with me. Jeff motioned for his second-in-command to pull up a seat at the teacher's desk in the small classroom he used as his personal office. The burly sergeant dropped his ass in the seat and propped his boots up on the corner of the beaten old wooden desk. Jeff poured two plastic cups of root beer out of a beaten-up seven-month-old bottle. The soda was flat, but it was the closest thing they had to real beer left. He handed one cup to Mike, and the two men sipped at the creamy sweet soda for a few seconds. Mike could see the younger officer was troubled by something. He made the veteran move and asked him what was going on. All right, LT, what's swirling in your noodle? You look like your mom just told you your uncle was your dad. Jeff smirked. Mike always had a colorful way of using the English language. Jeff swirled the cup of brown soda and replied carefully and quietly. You think we can keep going on like this here? Mike's eyebrows arched up. Like what? Eating MREs and shitting in trash barrels? I've dealt with worse. You've dealt with worse yourself in Afghanistan. Mike sipped quietly at his soda. Shut the door, Mike. Jeff tipped his chin at the open classroom door, and Mike hopped up and shut it. He trotted back and sat down after pulling the shade down over the small window in the door. Mike, this place is disintegrating over Sean's bullshit. He's gotten at least a dozen people killed, he's using food to get the shit he wants, and he's fucking at least three different women now. You know there's a rumor going around now that he's the father of Megan's baby? Jeff downed his soda in disgust. Mike sat forward and looked at his nearly empty cup. He took a deep breath and sighed. Look, LT, I'm not a big fan of that guy. I mean, he's a fucking pencil pusher. Before all this shit went down with the zombies, he was a trust fund prick. His dad owned a couple of fucking appliance stores. So what if he went to Yale? So what if he can talk the ear off of anyone when he wants something? He couldn't find his asshole with both hands and a flashlight in this world. Jeff weighed his sergeant's words carefully. They were damning, of that there was no doubt. Jeff himself had lost faith in Sean's ability to govern, and if Mike felt the same, then the rest of his men would likely follow suit. Mike, you think if push came to shove, the men would help us get rid of him? Shit, yeah, I think we'd have to beat them away with a stick to not help. Mike grinned wide and downed the last of his treasured root beer. I'm not saying we're planning a coup here, Mike. Let's make that clear. But if things don't get better, then we may need to speed along elections. Morale is low and going lower. That bastard at the private school still might make his move on us. What's his name? Andrew? Mike asked. Adrian. No last name. Jeff's face was wrinkled up with worry. He ran his hands through his short blonde hair and rested his forehead on the desk. So much worry to worry about. It's too damn bad Sean didn't get killed when you led them into that ambush. Yeah, I led them right into it, too. Shit in the road to blow the tires and everything. Mike, if it wasn't for bad luck. Jeff Sargent finished his sentence. We'd have no luck at all. Tell me about it, brother. Tell me about it. These fucking bitches are driving me up a wall, Chad. I tell you what, they have no idea how good they have it here. And you know what? It's all because of me. I got the soldiers on board. I got everyone organized. I got the election started. 
and I've kept us safe from that bastard at the school this whole time. I can see the way they look at me. No fucking respect at all. I know, Sean. No one understands what it's like to be in charge. One of Sean's few remaining friends was consoling him. Chad was a former golf buddy of Sean's before that fateful day in June when the world got flipped upside down. Chad secretly wished he could get a round in at Sunshine Meadow right now. He'd kill to get some driving range time in. The two men were in Sean's converted classroom. He had his office and his bedroom all combined, and the two men were sipping on small glasses of a fine single malt scotch. The smoky fluid burned the throats of both men as Sean continued to bitch and moan about how bad he had it and how good everyone else had it and how much they owed him for everything they enjoyed. Look, Chad, there are probably tens of thousands of survivors all over the place who are living in rat-filled shitholes right now. They're probably eating cockroaches and drinking toilet water. We've got plenty of food, tons of guns and ammunition, half a dozen National Guardsmen, a working democracy, and a damn farm that's giving us milk and eggs on the regular. So fucking what if we're struggling with fresh water from time to time and we have to shit in buckets? Fuck these people. Sean threw down the remaining scotch in his glass and slammed the glass down. Sean, even the most popular politicians have what, a 60% approval rate maybe? Look, man, they can't get rid of you. There's no one else that can motivate or organize people like you. Who's capable of dealing with all the crap besides you? Plus, you still have your dad's land to give away once all this blows over and the government comes back for good. Everyone wants a piece of that cheese. We just need to wait all this out. Chad sipped the scotch. Sean got up from his transplanted, comfy-wheeled office chair and went to the window. The world was a dull gray from the overcast sky. It looked like more snow was on the way. Ringing the school's vehicular wall was a small number of the walking dead. It looked to Sean that there were a few more outside than normal. He sipped from his glass of scotch and observed as one of the undead stopped and started to slowly beat on the window of an old Ford pickup. The senator watched intently as the dead and bloodied middle-aged man brought one clumsy hand after another down on the glass. After a few good thumps, the glass busted and spiderwebbed. John secretly cheered for the dead bastard. He admired the resolute morons. They could be predicted and almost controlled, if you knew how they worked. His mind drifted off into morbid plans of using the undead remaining in town as either a way to attack Adrian and his people at that damned private school, or as some sort of defense. Sean snapped back to reality. The undead man had frozen solid and was looking directly up into the classroom. He was staring straight at Sean. Slowly and deliberately, the dead man lifted one of his arms and pointed it directly at Sean. Sean's blood ran cold as he realized the dead man's fingers were shattered and bent in a dozen different directions. The politician downed his glass of scotch and continued to watch as the zombie lowered his hand again and slowly tapped the face of his black plastic wristwatch. Three times the destroyed fingertip came down on the liquid crystal of the cheap watch. Tap. 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 Bile rose in his stomach and he turned away from the window. His mind reeled from the idea of the dead people regaining any kind of intelligence. What the fuck was that, he thought to himself. He strode back to the desk and popped the cap off the scotch and downed the final mouthful straight from the bottle with a wince. What the hell, Sean? That was the last of the good scotch. Now all we've got is southern comfort and stoly raz, man. What the hell is wrong? Chad was fuming. That was damned good scotch. Sean swallowed hard to clear the burn of the scotch. He quickly thought of a lie. I'm fucking Melissa tonight, and I need to self-medicate. Chad smirked. He'd probably do the same. She certainly wasn't a top-shelf piece of ass. Yeah, well, it's too bad all the best-looking ones are gone, man. Sean looked over at the window again and thought of the strange zombie with the watch just a few hundred feet away in the snow. Yeah, it's a shame all the good ones are gone.
Mike drove the small Nissan pickup truck carefully down the hard-packed snow street. Ollie sat in the front of the truck next to him, nervously watching out the window for signs of zombies moving about. Since the snow had gotten deep and the soldiers had completed their umpteenth sweep of the city searching for undead, it had been pretty safe to move around. Of course, his fellow guardsman Tara had died just four days ago on a routine farm run just like this, Mike thought. Even a single zombie was dangerous if you made a mistake. Sergeant Mike was not one to make mistakes. He downshifted the truck when they hit some loose snow and they continued north towards Ollie's family farm. Ollie needed his clammy hands together, waiting for a good moment to tell Mike about the secret his father was about to let him in on. Finally, Ollie built up the nerve when Mike stopped the truck at the end of his dad's driveway. Ollie had to get out and open the fence, but before he did, he turned to Mike. Mike, I need to tell you something. Ollie was nervous, and his voice cracked slightly. Mike missed the emotion in Ollie's voice. He figured Ollie was about to tell him that he was going to ask Melissa on a date or something. He still hadn't figured out a way to tell Ollie that Melissa was fucking Sean for extra food for everyone. He couldn't bear to break Ollie's heart. Mike simply turned and looked at his friend, awaiting his story. My, my dad needs your help with something. Ollie's eyes were very serious. Mike perked up. He hadn't seen the redhead that serious in a long time. Not since Martha McDowell had died when the tractor flipped on her back in December. Mike was suddenly concerned. Okay, Ollie, what's up? Is something wrong with your dad? No, not really. You remember that guy that Sean attacked at the school back at Christmas? Adrian? Ollie asked the question almost as if he was afraid of the answer. Mike stiffened slightly. That man was bad news. He dropped the hammer on a dozen of their people that day. Yeah, why? Him and his people have been talking to my dad on the radio. They want to help us get rid of Sean. They want to kill Sean. He wants to kill Sean. Ollie rambled it all out like a steam valve getting opened. Mike could see the relief on his face. Initially, the sergeant was pissed off. His anger gave way quickly to opportunistic thoughts. Mike chewed his lip, thinking about the way things were and the way they could be. Ollie hopped out of the truck and swung the gate open, watching for any undead walking nearby. Mike slipped the truck into first gear and slid it into the driveway. Ollie got back in after he secured the frail chain-link gate. They drove the length of the gravel driveway and came to a stop next to the big white farmhouse. The two men knocked on the side door and let themselves in. Mike had no idea what to think or say. He knew it was high time to get rid of the prick trying to run the show, but, to be honest with himself, working with someone who he felt was the enemy was a very alien idea. It was like working with insurgents to get rid of a politician you didn't like. In fact, it was exactly that. Ollie's father, Lenny McDowell, sat at the kitchen table next to their massive wood stove. Mike always liked coming out here on farm trips because it was as warm as a blast furnace with that stove going. The school always had a chill in it. It didn't hurt that there was fresh milk all the time, and every other day the place smelled of Lenny's fresh-baked bread. Mike pulled his winter cap off when he said hello to Lenny. Lenny rested his tobacco pipe on the table and motioned for Mike to take a seat. Ollie joined the two men as Lenny cleared his throat to speak. Oliver, you tell the sergeant here what I asked you to? Yeah, I did. I didn't tell him everything, though, just like you asked. Lenny took a full measure of Mike before speaking. Mike, thank you for coming out with Oliver today. I have not been a good democratic civilian of the so-called Westfield Council of late. I can't abide by a man like that Stockwell fella. He turns the milk in my stomach when I think about him. Mike didn't say anything back. He knew Lenny held a major league grudge directed at Sean over the death of his wife. Mike was pretty certain it was deserved, too. A couple of days ago, your girl Tara got whacked by accident when that Adrian fella tried to stop Ollie and her to ask some questions. She pulled on him, and he was playing old faster. He left Ollie with instructions on how to get a hold of them, and I've talked to them a few times now. Mike's hands balled up into fists. Tara had been shot by that asshole from the school. 
His mind raced with doubt and anger. Was Sean right all along, and they were starting an offensive on them? He had half a mind to get up and walk out. The lieutenant needed to know all about this. Calm yourself, son. It was an accident, and God help me, but I believe them. I've met one of their people already, an older gent named Gilbert. He's a right fine fellow, and if this Adrian man is half the man he is, I think we've been had by that bastard Stockwell. Mike looked long and hard at Lenny's face. Mike was great at seeing through bullshit, and Lenny's face was stone-cold sincere. He really believed that this Gilbert person was good to go, as was this Adrian character. Lenny, I don't know this man. Sean's a prick, but at least we can contain him. We don't know this guy from a hole in the wall. I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea of just, you know, throwing in with a stranger and helping to kill our rightfully elected leader. Seems a little undemocratic to me, Lenny. Lenny nodded slowly in agreement. I understand, son, although I think there are a few men in our history that got rid of their leaders and wound up being called patriots. Gilbert and Adrian want nothing to do with us. They want justice for the attacks that Sean made on them. Gilbert says that's all they want. They also said that if we don't, one way or another, Sean's going to die, and others might get hurt when it goes down. I don't know about you, but I'd rather go to sleep with a clean conscience knowing we put Sean to trial instead of letting someone else bring a war we don't want to our doorsteps. Think of it as an impeachment by force. This time it was Mike's turn to nod. Sometimes tyranny looks an awful lot like freedom. He thought about it all carefully before responding. We're talking about a coup, Lenny. Who would take over here afterwards? Well, the lieutenant could. He'd assume control until we could have another election. Then he's a shoe-in for the win. We just need to convince the lieutenant that we need to not mess around with these people, and we need to give up or get rid of Sean, and soon, before innocents get killed over Stockwell's paranoia. Ollie watched his father talk in fascination. His dad had such a rich voice that entranced. Mike shook his head. How would we do that? Lenny smiled. He clearly already had a plan ready. We fake another ambush. You two run back to Daniel's and tell him Adrian's people are just the cock of the walk and that until we give up Stockwell, they're going to keep hitting our supplies until we do. You tell Daniel's that they won't hit the farm here because they don't want to hurt the food source. They just want to hurt Stockwell. Now, because we're faking it, no one will get hurt. You tell Daniels that they took the stuff without violence and explain to him that they're powerful, and you tell him all we need to do is give up Sean, and from what Ollie says, getting him on our side won't be all that hard, and we get out of everything slick as a whistle. That might work, actually. I'm not a big fan of lying to my CO, though. One way or the other, I can't follow through unless I meet this Adrian asshole. I need to look him in the eyes, shake his hand, and see if he's the man you say he is. I won't put my relationship with the LT on the line for a complete stranger. I'd rather run Sean over with a Humvee myself before I shack up with that guy unconditionally. No way, no how. I gotta meet them first. Mike's face was stern. He was adamant. Lenny nodded slowly again, recognizing Mike's reluctance to deal with the devil he didn't know. Lenny grabbed the radio he used to communicate with the school and looked at Mike. I bet you a pint of ice cream he's in town right now. You up for a handshaking? Mike's eyes went wide, and he dropped his hand to the Beretta on his hip. If he's in town already, then he better come shake my hand. Otherwise, I'll go out there and shoot his ass for trespassing. Shit, I'll shoot his ass on principle. Lenny smiled again. You soldiers, always so ready to fight. You know, you'll live a lot longer talking to folks. Learned that in the Navy. And with that, Lenny thumbed the walkie to try and hail Adrian, or his people. Mike, it was a pleasure meeting you. I really hope this works out and everything goes smooth. I appreciate the risk you're taking here to help get this resolved. Adrian shook Mike's hand. The two men were huge, nearly filling the entire back porch. Adrian had a slightly tense but friendly smile. He was alone with three Westfield men talking about murder. It was the definition of a sketchy situation. Mike shared a similar smile. The four men had just discussed an alliance to take out Sean Stockwell, and there was a lot of raw emotion floating around. 
No one had gotten heated, and just as Lenny had surmised, Mike thought this Adrian man was a stand-up character. He'd slipped out of the woods like a snow-covered ninja when he'd been summoned on the radio. Adrian had gotten to within ten feet of the porch before any of them even knew he was there. Mike knew immediately that he wouldn't have to exaggerate the martial prowess of these people. Adrian could have killed all three of them and been gone like a ghost if he chose to. But he hadn't, and Mike knew that the man had genuine concerns for further violence. Mike didn't like a lot of people, and a lot of people didn't like Mike. He hated drama, and he despised idiots. He'd known the big man for no more than thirty minutes, and he knew he'd eventually like him. At the very least, Mike knew Adrian was a lesser evil than Sean, and that was enough to go to war for. Adrian, I hope this all ends shortly. I can't tell you enough how much we appreciate your being civil about all this. I appreciate the fact that you didn't take my head off with that rifle you got there. Mike pointed at the heavy caliber hunting rifle Adrian had slung over his shoulder. Adrian smiled and nodded thoughtfully. Mike, I never wanted to hurt anyone. I'm good at killing people, but I don't like doing it. I'm having enough trouble keeping my own people safe from the dead folks trying to bite them, let alone living folks trying to bend us over, too. Trying to have a little more faith in humanity right now. Mike nodded in agreement as Adrian shook Ollie and Lenny's hand. Mike watched Adrian smile and knew the man was sincere. Sean's smiles reminded the sergeant of a snake spitting venom. He just couldn't trust the bastard. Good luck with your girl, Ollie. I'm glad you're living at the school for a good reason, man. Adrian gave Ollie a wink. Mike thought it was pretty funny that Adrian had assumed that Ollie was living at the school because he was being held hostage there. That line of reasoning did make sense, though. Why would a son not live with his dad? Mike supposed a girl was a damn fine reason. Take care, y'all. Someone will be around listening if you guys need help. Best of luck. Adrian left the porch. He walked slowly and confidently behind the barn near the farmhouse and, without a noise, was gone. Mike watched him disappear into thin air and then turned to his two compatriots. I like that man, but he scares the living shit out of me. Ollie smiled nervously. He scares me too, but I don't hate him like I hate Sean. And that just about summed it up. When Mike and Ollie returned to the school, they had agreed not to say a word to anyone else that night. They would think everything over, and if they were still on board with the idea of faking an ambush in the name of Adrian's people, then they'd do it tomorrow. Lieutenant Daniels would be approached after that with the information they'd discussed, and if they did it right, then Daniels would at least talk to Adrian about starting a coup. That was the night of February 17th. Forever after, Mike and Ollie referred to it as Checkers Night. The two men were not interested in being particularly social. They had too much on their minds and far too many secrets they could let slip easily, so Mike challenged Ollie to an epic Best of Twenty-One Tournament of Checkers. The two men wandered down to the cafeteria right after dinner, and they sat in the corner, sliding red and black plastic discs across the board for hours. When the kitchen crew cleared out for the evening, Melissa stopped over and sat a small bowl with a few pear slices in it next to the guys. Who's winning? Mike scratched his head in utter bewilderment. We're on game fifteen. Ollie is up nine games to six. Guy's a checker savant, Melissa. Melissa smiled and rubbed Ollie's balding head. Mike caught a glimpse of affection in her eyes and couldn't stop himself from smiling, too. He'd lost his wife of ten years in June when she didn't get home in time from the armory. She was eaten alive by one of their neighbors, and watching two young kids fall even a little into love, chipped away at the ice he'd let freeze around his heart. Melissa, why don't you join us? Ollie asked her. The brunette looked at her watch and frowned. It's late, guys. I can't stay up much longer. I just wanted to drop off some fruit for you and say hi. Thanks for asking, though. Ollie visibly deflated but remained smiling. Melissa ruffled his red hair again and walked away. She needed to get a few hours of sleep before she had to go see Sean again and satisfy his ego. Her stomach churned as she thought of poor, oblivious Ollie. The next afternoon, Mike and Ollie returned from Lenny McDowell's farm empty-handed. They weren't stolen from. They were following through on their plan to coerce Lieutenant Daniels into working with Adrian's people, 
to get Sean Stockwell the hell out of Westfield. The two men strode with fake purpose past the waiting women in the cafeteria door. The ladies usually took the fresh farm product straight from the men, but when Mike and Ollie walked by empty-handed and as serious as cancer, the women knew there was something amiss. Melissa made brief eye contact with Ollie, and she thought he looked almost happy. She wondered to herself why he'd be happy after returning empty-handed. She had enough to be worried about anyway, she thought. Last night she was fairly sure Sean tried to slip the condom off while he was fucking her, and she'd kicked him to make him stop. He hit her. The women in the kitchen nearly went upstairs with the entire knife drawer to make sure he'd never need a condom again, but Melissa stopped them. More bloodshed would only make things worse. Mike and Ollie took the steps up to the second floor of classrooms two at a time. They needed to get into Jeff's office and shut the door before anyone could ask too many questions. By the time they reached the converted classroom that Daniels used as a bedroom and war room, they already had a caboose filled with people asking what was up. Mike opened the door without knocking, and as soon as Mike was inside, he shut the door and pulled the shade. Lieutenant Jeff Daniels sat at his desk cleaning his service pistol. He had it disassembled and was meticulously going piece to piece, ensuring it was clear of dust and debris. The best soldiers know you maintain your weapon before your body. LT, we need to talk. Now. Mike dragged a second chair over in front of the desk. He spun it around and sat in it, leaning his arms on the back of the seat in front of him. Ollie slowly sat in the other chair and watched the two soldiers. Jeff put his oil-stained rag down and leaned forward, clearly worried at the urgency Mike was putting out. Problem, Staff Sergeant? I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is really good, and the bad news is only kind of bad. Mike seemed almost excited to Jeff. The young officer wasn't sure what to think. All righty, lay it on me, Sarge. Jeff leaned back in his chair to listen. Now, What I'm about to tell you is going to piss you off at first, so don't make any decisions until I'm done talking, okay? Mike gave Jeff a stern face. He wanted Jeff to listen to everything. Okay, no promises, though. Jeff bridged his fingers and rested his nose on the tips. Tara wasn't killed by a zombie the other day. She was accidentally shot in an ambush. We were also kind of sort of ambushed today, too. Mike said it as softly as he could, but... The words turned the officer's face ruddy red with anger. Who the fuck? Mike cut him off. Stop. I said, wait. I'm not done talking yet. Mike pointed a thick finger at his commanding officer. Jeff wasn't pleased at all, but he shut up for the moment. The guy from the private school a few towns over has been casing the town trying to find a way to get intel on Sean. After the gas station attack, he and his people decided they can't let Sean run the show here. They tried to get intel on us by getting Tara and Ollie to stop and talk to someone, but Tara drew on Adrian and he had to shoot her. How the fuck do you know all this? Are you in cahoots with this prick? Jeff sat forward, angry. He looked down at his disassembled pistol and suddenly wished it was together. Jeff, wait. They told Ollie to tell someone in charge to get a hold of them on Channel 5. Ollie went to his dad and... His dad has been talking to them for the past few days, and he says they're good people, and they're on the level. Mike almost whispered the words. He knew others were at the door trying to listen in. Jeff's eyes went wild. Lenny is colluding with these assholes? Are you shitting me? What's next? Jeff, relax. I met the dude yesterday myself. He has a team of people in town observing us trying to find out how to do this without killing anyone. They're legit, Jeff. They're good people. They didn't even take anything today. We staged it all to set something up. Mike tried to say it as sincerely as he could. What? Jeff let out an exasperated whisper. They're fucking here in this town right now? We're being reconned by the fucking enemy? Do you realize those people single-handedly killed at least 15 of our citizens, right? And you're fucking talking to them, working with them? You're a fucking terrorist, Mike. I can't believe this shit. Jeff stood up and paced the room. He eyed his M4 leaning up against his bed and for a moment debated picking it up. He was furious and he felt like he was surrounded by traitors. Jeff, 
Just the other day, you and I were talking about speeding up elections to get rid of Sean. This could easily be the chance we're looking for. We find a way to march his ass out into the open, and we give him an ultimatum. Tell him he can leave and go fuck himself, or we shoot his ass in the knees and let Adrian and his people know where he's bleeding out. No one needs to know what happened. Jeff stopped pacing and looked at his sergeant. His mind cleared when he thought of life without that tyrant Sean trying to run the place. All he'd done since Thanksgiving was gum up the works with petty power plays and stupid martial schemes to get revenge on these people from the school. This might actually be the best way to get rid of him. Jeff couldn't stomach killing an innocent man, though. Jeff, I gotta tell you, I met this Adrian man yesterday, and I think he's two things. First, he doesn't want to hurt anyone. He's sick of the bullshit, same as you and I are. He easily could have killed Lenny, me, and Ollie without thinking twice about it, and he didn't. He doesn't want to hurt anyone here. Secondly, he's serious about this, and I mean he's serious about making friends to get this done. And he's also serious about getting rid of Sean with or without us helping. Whether or not we're on board, the moment Sean makes his head available, they're going to blow it the fuck off. Mike's tone was quiet and deadly serious. Jeff bit his lip and nodded. What's in this for them? Are they going to make a play for taking over here? They want food, ammunition, what? This guy has to have an angle other than just revenge. Ollie answered. When he shot Tara at Jeff, he was real serious about getting justice for his dead friends. I think his angle is the fact that he's been trying to do the right thing and Sean keeps messing with all that. Like Mike said, one way or the other, Adrian's going to do this. I think we can make friends with him, too. He seems a lot like you guys. Hell yeah, Ollie. Look, Jeff, this guy came out of the woods like a goddamn special ops guy. He was ten feet from us before we knew it. And like I said, he could have just done us raw right there. If he didn't want to make friends, he doesn't have to. He'll just take this school out. Fucking kill everyone. Brick by brick, he said. Said he didn't want to, but... One way or the other, he'd do it brick by brick if he had to. Ollie looked worried. Sounds awfully fucking threatening to me, Jeff frowned. Sounds a shitload like a warrior to me, one hell-bent on protecting his people and taking out his enemy. You know this just the same as I do. If we get Sean outside somehow, either he'll freak and pull a gun and get shot, or we can just leave his ass there. Out there. Mike thumbed towards the window, towards the vast expanse of town that had innumerable undead wandering it. Jeff sat down and nodded. You've never led me wrong, Mike. I've always trusted you, and so far you've always come through for me. You vouch for this guy? I think you should talk to him yourself, but if you want my opinion, we go to Sean tonight or tomorrow and tell him we got hit by Adrian's people. Tomorrow's best. That way he can't run around spreading rumors all night tonight. We tell him that Adrian's people are going to hit the supply truck every day they can, and we need his help to stop it. I bet you a jalapeno cheese packet that motherfucker grabs his gun and goes out with us the next time we roll to the farm. As soon as he's outside and we're out of eyesight of the school, kabam, eviction notice, done deal. The officer thought about it, and the more he thought about it, the more sense it made. One way or the other, they worked with this other guy and got rid of Sean, or they risked others getting killed when they didn't hand him over. Plus, Jeff thought, it's not like they were asking for someone or something anyone here gave a rat's ass about. Tonight, you tell everyone that Lenny wasn't feeling good and that he didn't get around to milking the chickens or whatever. Make him think it was a little worrisome. Ollie... You go back to your dad's and pretend to take care of him tonight. Be back after dawn tomorrow. Don't bring any food back with you. We all sit down with Sean tomorrow morning and we tell him what's up. Depending on how that goes, we'll take it from there. Is there any way we can get a hold of this Adrian guy? Yeah, he's listening on Channel 5. Switch the radio and say something. Mike nodded over at the radio sitting on the desk. Jeff looked slowly at the radio, suddenly feeling like it was an enemy listening device. It felt like Adrian and his people were right there in the office, eavesdropping. This is mutiny, Mike. This is a coup. Jeff looked at the radio, then at his sergeant. This, sir, 
is a revolution. This is us escaping from tyranny and starting a new government where we're properly represented and not taking advantage of. We're patriots, Jeff, not rebels. Certainly not fucking terrorists. The next morning, Jeff went to Sean to test the waters for their rebellion. Sean, you need to sit down. Something's been brought to my attention. Jeff stood in the doorway of Sean's converted sweet classroom. Jeff's nose wrinkled as he caught the scent of stale cigarettes and sweat. It sickened him to think this asshole won an election to run anything. Is this about the elder McDowell being under the weather? No. Okay, Lieutenant Daniels, you win. I'll sit. Sean flopped down with his dress shirt still unbuttoned. Jeff thought he hadn't left the office in days. We've been attacked twice this week by people from that private school. Jeff kept his face emotionless. Sean stopped buttoning his shirt and looked up at the officer. Wait, what? The other afternoon when Corporal Tara Braley died, she, she'd she actually been shot by this Adrian person you've been dealing with. Yesterday afternoon, Staff Sergeant McCarthy and Ollie were stopped at gunpoint and had the entire farm run taken from them. We need to step up security on the runs to the McDowell farm while we discuss a more thorough strategy for bringing this threat to an end. Sean slammed his fists down into the desk, hard enough to send the pens and pencils on it six inches high. Jeff saw rage in his eyes. Motherfucker! With a powerful backhand swipe, Sean sent all the papers on his desk flying. Senator, now is not the time for rage. We need to think this through very carefully. We need to get over to the farm tomorrow and start discussing security there. Lenny can keep the farm safe from zombies, but if these assholes decide to take it by force, then we need to have a solution. I've sent Ollie and one of the men over there for tonight, but tomorrow, I think we should have a meeting about it. You interested in being there to lead it? Jeff was baiting him. There was no way in hell Sean would not be at a meeting like that. He wouldn't allow his opinion to be left out of any discussion. The furious senator licked his lips. Fucking right, I'll be there. Do you have any bombs, Jeff? Big ones, like powerful explosives. Can we fucking bomb that school? I'm so sick of this asshole. Jeff fought an epic battle to fight off a smile. We are currently out of explosives, Senator. We're also flat out of heavy machine gun ammunition. However, we might be able to plan some counterinsurgency missions once security at the farm is addressed. An insurgency, eh? Insurgents. That's perfect. They are terrorists, aren't they? That will play well with the people. Sean savored the word like the scotch he'd polished off the other day. We need to let the people know we're being attacked. We need to let them know they have strong leadership here and that we'll take good care of them. We don't need them panicking on us. Senator, with all due respect, they already know your leadership is strong. I also think that we'd be best served if we waited until after tomorrow's meeting with Mr. McDowell. If we tell them about what's going on now, we have no good news to tell them. Just bad news. After our plan is formed, we can gather them, and you can tell them what the plan is for our future. Plans are always good news, and good news is always popular. Yeah, that's true. They might start asking questions, and I don't want to deal with that. Thank you, Lieutenant. Your assistance is invaluable as always. When is our meeting at the farm? It'll start when you arrive. We're planning on convoying over at 3 p.m. You're more than welcome to ride with us in a Humvee, or you can take your Escalade, whatever you prefer. Jeff turned to the door and rested his hand on the lever to open it. Very good, Lieutenant. You're dismissed. Sean returned to buttoning his shirt, content in his control of the situation. Thank you for your assistance, sir. Have a good day, Senator. Jeff pulled the door open and walked out. Jeff walked down the hallway and rounded the corner into a stairwell to head down to the cafeteria for lunch. Mike was waiting on the landing. How'd that go? Mike asked his officer. Hook, line, and sinker. I just need to wipe all this shit off my nose. Jeff looked happy, but conflicted. Now what? Mike asked as the two men joined each other and started down the steps toward the smells of food wafting their way. I eat lunch, and then I try to get a hold of this Adrian asshole. If I get a good read on him, then we go forward with it. If not, then we come up with plan B. What's plan B gonna be? Mike asked. <laughs> and get the fuck out of his way? 
Jeff laughed. And you talk to him, sir, and you think this is worth it? Private Gavin Russell asked his lieutenant. Yeah, Private. There's too many of us that have met or talked to him that think he's being honest about it. Plus, he keeps pointing out things about Sean that are shady that I'm frankly kind of fed up with here. We lost people the other night for nothing when Sean hit that gas station, and I think we can avoid a big war if we just douche this fuck tomorrow afternoon, get rid of him, and run this place like we care about it. Gathered in the war room with Mike and Jeff were the ever-present Ollie and three other National Guardsmen. All were younger men whom Mike had personally chosen to be brought in on the plot to oust Sean from his position at the school. They were good soldiers and good people. Most importantly, they had no love for the senator. Like the LT says, I've talked to him, Ollie met him, and Lenny met him and another guy, and not one person says anything bad. Frankly, I think we'd be the assholes if we didn't do this. Mike added his two cents. The younger men respected the veteran sergeant and his opinion. The men started to nod in agreement. The logic was good, according to their leaders, and good soldiers do what their leaders tell them to do. Then it's settled. We leave in half an hour. I want full combat loads and gear. Prepare as if we're going to be hit by these people. I expect you all to be vigilant. I expect you all to select targets carefully, and remember, these aren't dead people goofing around. If this goes south, we'll be fighting living, breathing, and most importantly, thinking human beings. They're as smart as we are, so act like it. Hoorah, sir, the men yelled out in unison. Game time. Jeff dismissed his men and gathered his kit. Every time his unit rolled out of the school, they left it like they were going to war. Every man brought his M4, at least eight magazines for it, as well as their service M9 pistol, and three magazines for that. They wore full body armor, head-to-toe BDUs, and brought enough food and water for at least a few days outside the wire. By the time he was ready to roll, the half hour had passed already. His nerves were a little shaky, but he was committed. No time left to be scared. Jeff met Mike in the hallway once again as they headed to Sean's office to get him. When they reached his office, Sean was walking out into the hall wearing a heavy winter coat with a spare Kevlar vest on the outside. He wore it like he'd never worn a vest before, and Jeff thought that was a pretty fair assessment. Senator, you ready? Jeff held his helmet under his arm. Yes, Lieutenant. Chad will be coming along with us on the trip. I trust there's a space in the vehicle for him. Sean motioned to his asshole buddy stepping out of the classroom into the hall. This was a monkey wrench tossed into the works, but not a deal breaker. Jeff nodded immediately at the pompous asshole he wanted gone. Of course, there's room. It'll be a tight fit in the two Humvees. You're more than welcome to drive yourself in your SUV if you'd like more comfort. Sean quickly dismissed the idea with a smirk. Oh, no thanks, Jeff. I'll ride in the armored military vehicle, thank you very much. I don't want that Adrian asshole shooting me as I drive over to Lenny's. Jeff cursed to himself in his head. Smart idea, Senator. Let's move. Down the stairwell they went. The rest of the survivors inside the school building watched with worried expressions as the soldiers marched in procession down the halls and towards the foyer to exit into the parking lot. Jeff watched one of the Labrador retrievers they'd rescued wag his tail manically as all the excitement passed by. Mike gave the dog a pat on the head as they left the school and headed out into the cold February air. The Humvees were already running for them. Private Russell drove the Humvee that had the lieutenant, Private LaFrenz, Chad, and the senator in it. Once everyone was locked into the heavy vehicle, Lieutenant Daniels thumbed his helmet microphone and issued the command to roll. He didn't have many batteries left for his comms gear, either. Pretty soon, he'd be back to yelling out his commands the old-fashioned way. The two military trucks roared to life and plowed through the opening in the automobile wall when the van blocking the gap was backed out of the way by another one of the National Guardsmen. Exiting was frequently more dangerous than entering. The undead were harder to distract away from the gate from the inside. Sean always got nervous on exits. He always felt like the cookie jar lid was off when the van was moved out of the way. He just had the feeling that one day they'd try and leave and a horde of the dead would push their way in. As the convoy burst out of the barrier surrounding the school, Sean looked out the thick, bulletproof glass of the Humvee. Directly to his left, standing at the wall of cars, was the zombie that had stared up at him through the classroom window the other day. It stood impassively once again, 
watching the Humvee with Sean drive away, leaving him behind. As they pulled away out of the corner of his eye, Sean could swear the zombie was waving goodbye to him. Had to be an optical illusion, he thought. It had to be. Jeff stepped out of the Humvee and scanned the farm's surroundings. He'd noticed on the way over they'd seen more undead than was normal, and it put him ill at ease. He and his group of soldiers had spent months killing undead, and to have so many come out of the woodwork like this on a day like today was not cool. He didn't see any near the farm, and the undead would be hard-pressed to get over the cattle fence and through all the snow to be a danger to his men and their mission. He scanned the tree line as well as the chicken building and barn. Nothing stood out to him as being threatening, and he motioned for Stockwell and his flunky Chad to get out of the vehicle. The plan was simple. Lenny and Ollie would greet them at the door, and they'd tell them what was going to happen before he got inside. If something happened, everyone wanted it to be done outdoors. Gunfights and struggles in a house were definitely less than ideal in Jeff's mind. He looked over to the farmhouse door and saw it open. Lenny and Ollie came out and down the steps. The elder McDowell immediately fired up his pipe and took a few tokes as Sean and Chad made their slow way over to him. The two men had their heads on swivels looking for danger. They hadn't been out in the open since the attack on the gas station a few weeks ago. Mr. McDowell, so nice to see you again. How are things here on the farm? Sean put on his best face and strode towards the old farmer, extending his hand so Lenny could take it and shake it. Lenny did no such thing. He stood and looked at Sean impassively and puffed once more on his pipe. Sean's extended hand awkwardly got pulled back, and Sean looked at Chad incredulously. Senator, you can put your hand away. I have no interest in shaking it. Lenny's tone was flat and frightening. Jeff found himself just shy of amazed that the usually congenial and friendly old man had turned so sour so suddenly. Jeff began to realize the pain of Lenny's wife's death may have done some damage they weren't aware of. Something wrong, Mr. McDowell? Normally, you're a much more receptive fellow. Sean's smile did an abrupt change to one of confusion. He wasn't quite ready for that greeting. Jeff's men fanned out and formed a perimeter. Two went to the end of the driveway near the gate, and one went to the back of the farmhouse near the barn. Mike stood at the passenger side door of the Humvee furthest down the driveway, and Jeff himself stood next to the confused Sean and Chad. Ollie was behind his father. Mr. Stockwell, there's been some talk lately that you've been a piss-poor leader of men here in this town. Lenny's voice was emotionless. He was sharing information, not making an insult. I, uh, Lieutenant, what's this all about? Sean looked around at Jeff and Mike, trying to make heads or tails of the situation. Jeff nodded in agreement with Lenny's assessment of the situation. Lenny's right, Sean. We made a huge mistake electing you as leader. We thought maybe because you had experience in politics you'd be good for us, but all you've done the past three months is fuck everything up and get a whole mess of us killed. I won't even go into what you're doing to a few of the women at the school. We all know you're up to no good. Jeff hefted the weight of the M4 rifle hanging across his chest. It was a thinly veiled threat. Sean shook his head defiantly. You guys can't just do this. There's a system for this kind of thing. There's a process of appeals and... Lenny interrupted him. You're familiar with Backwoods Justice, Senator. Let me tell you how this works now. There ain't no courts. There ain't no police. There ain't no more system for this kind of thing and the only justice in law is that of God and men of character. You, sir, are neither. We were approached a few days ago by your friend Adrian, and he asked us for help in getting to you. Sean backpedaled in fear at the mention of his nemesis. He looked around like a rabbit fleeing from the shadow of a hawk soaring above. He looked trapped. Is he here? What the hell? That guy will kill me. He hates me. With no emotion, Lenny puffed once on his pipe as Chad grabbed Sean to steady him. He's here, and he's watching what happens right now, and what you decide right now determines what he does. Sean's eyes slowly widened in horror as he realized more than an election or debate was at stake. His life was suddenly on the line.
He jerked his head left and right, looking for the man he assumed would be pointing a gun at him. Don't bother looking, son. He isn't where you can see him, but I assure you, he can see you just fine. So, here are your choices. One, you about face, walk down that driveway and disappear. You walk until you find a place you're welcome. I assure you it ain't anywhere in this town. Or, two, you say no to that option. We call Adrian and he swings by and we give you to him. Sean looked like he'd been violated. You can't do that. He'll kill me or worse. Yes, son. I would say that he will kill you or do worse. Makes the first option awfully enticing, doesn't it? Lenny puffed again and cracked a smile out of the corner of his lip. Sean was silent as all eyes fell on him. He looked small and scared. The men gathered gave him a full minute to choose his fate. He kept licking his lips, looking back and forth between all those gathered to pass judgment on him. Finally, Jeff broke the silence. Shit or get off the pot stock, well, it's cold out here. Sean licked his chapped lips and swallowed nervously. Finally, he gave his answer in a meek voice. I, uh, I'll leave. I can keep my gun in the vest, right? I, I I don't have any food or water. Eat snow, asshole. Bounce, Mike said from behind him. Patience was now gone. Chad let go of his golf buddy and Sean took a few steps back. Ollie stood behind his father and grinned happily. He was elated that they were finally about to be rid of the man he and his father hated so much. Sean caught a glimpse of Ollie smiling so happily and venom spat suddenly from his lips. Quit smiling, you ginger faggot. Have fun trying to fuck that fat bitch Melissa. I know I've been enjoying fucking her. Ollie's face turned the color of his hair, and he lowered his head and charged the senator. Everything happened in an instant. The lieutenant took a fast step forward and threw his shoulder into Ollie, sending him sprawling on his face to the side. Ollie was a big strong man, and his bull charge was powerful. Sean's eyes flared up in horror as the red-headed missile came at him, and he drew the small pistol he carried. The fallen senator pointed the weapon at the space Ollie's lowered head had just been in, screamed loudly, and snapped off a few quick shots. Ollie had gone into the ground already, and the shots hit the lieutenant just below his body armor, right on the belt. Jeff doubled over and fell backwards, clutching the gunshot wounds to his gut. He let out a low moan as the roaring burn of pain set in. Mike lifted his rifle and brought the butt of it down on the back of Sean's skull, sending him face down in the driveway. Chad let out a squeak and stumbled backwards until he lost his balance and planted himself in a snowbank next to the house. The other soldiers came running to lend assistance, and thirty feet away, with a creak, the barn door opened. Adrian walked out, worry and anger on his face. Mike stood in the driveway with absolute rage on his face, holding Chad at gunpoint. Ollie had lost his breath when he smashed into the ground and he gasped, sucking air into his empty lungs. He looked at the lieutenant rolling on the ground next to him, eyes staring off into oblivion. Adrian took off at a run and slid on the ground on his knees next to the wounded officer. Adrian sat his own weapon down on the ground and started to rip off the body armor and uniform of the fallen lieutenant. Everything was slick with warm red blood. The white snow below had started to pool a thick sheen of it, and the scent of copper was strong in the air. Daniels gritted his teeth against the pain and looked up at the large stranger ripping his clothes off. He didn't have the strength to resist. Lieutenant, I'm Adrian. It's nice to meet you. The large man undid the front of Jeff's BDU pants and exposed the four angry red holes leaking blood above his pubic hair. Adrian ripped the white sheet off his jacket and tore it in half. He folded the white cloth and pressed down firmly on the four wounds, applying pressure to try and stop the bleeding. Hey, fancy meeting you like this. Don't act, you don't act a lot like an enemy. It was only through determination and willpower Daniels got any of the words out. Daniels' hand clutched at Adrian's wrist, holding on for dear life. Adrian forced out a tight smile. You and I have never been each other's enemy, sir. Adrian pressed down hard as the white sheet turned a deep crimson between his fingers, 
absorbing far too much of Jeff's blood. Jeff lifted his head enough to see how bad the bleeding was and let out a meager laugh. His head dropped to the driveway, sending his helmet skidding away. The soldiers stood around flat-footed, watching their leader bleed out. Private Gavin Russell, the lieutenant's young driver just minutes ago, flicked the safety on his M4 off and took purposeful steps around his leader to shoot Sean. No, not like that. Jeff gathered more inner strength. Adrian looked down at him, puzzled. Lenny, do you have rope? The old man holstered his revolver and turned towards the barn. He looked over his shoulder and saw Adrian's pretty young blonde friend poking her head out of the chicken coop. She looked on intently, and unless Lenny was an idiot, he thought she was eyeing that Private Russell. Sean awoke when the blinding pain in his knee hit him. He let loose a primal scream and reached down to clutch at the pain. His hands didn't move. He realized he was on the ground still and that there was something binding his hands. In the fading sunlight, he realized that his hands were tied together at the wrist. Bailing twine was tough stuff and, when wet, turned abrasive. In the few seconds Sean tried to twist his hands free, he'd managed to cut his wrists to ribbons and rivulets of bright red blood ran down his forearm. It was only then that he realized he was freezing. He was on the ground in a parking lot that had just been cleaned of snow. It had been done haphazardly, and he recognized the place almost immediately. It was the parking lot of Sunshine Meadow, his golf course. His knee had been busted with something. Just moving it sent stars across his eyes, and he had to let out a whimper. He'd been left for dead at his golf course. Hey, fucker, a voice called out softly from above. Sean forced himself to roll over, and he saw the lieutenant propped up against the wheel of a car a few feet away. Drawing a line through the snow from Sean's foot to the blood-soaked lieutenant was a length of rope. They were tied together, and Sean's knee was broken. I just thought it would be nice if we spent some quality time together, you know before I died. I thought it might be nice if you got to see what happened firsthand to people that died because of you. The slowly dying officer coughed wetly and clutched his destroyed stomach. I'd say we have maybe five minutes of quality time, then then I think I'll probably eat you alive. Sean screamed for the whole five minutes. Then... A little more after that. February 22nd. Mr. Journal, I have relief today, on so many fronts. I haven't felt this positive about anything in a long time. Refreshing, this positivity thing. I'm pretty much of the opinion that while things didn't go perfect in Westfield, they went pretty damn well. I'll recant that for you. After grabbing all the supplies we thought we might need, we made the trip to Westfield the morning of the 20th, just like we planned. For some reason, I brought the laptop, too. Still don't know why I did, but I just wanted it with me. Mr. Journal goes to Westfield. Where's next? I wrote my drunken entry after everyone started to fall asleep that night in Lenny's place. We sandwiched all four of us into the front of the plow truck, and while crowded, we had a good groove on. Everyone was pretty happy about what we hoped would happen. The trip was good, and we didn't encounter trouble worth noting. We parked at a house as close to the farm as we could get. Patty remained behind with the truck in the event we needed either defense on the car, or if she needed to zing in and rescue us. Abby, Gilbert, and I made our way to the farm at about 2 p.m. We met up with old man Lenny and his son Ollie, and they shook our hands pretty excitedly. He felt that this was a long time coming— I detected a pretty powerful sense of vindication off them, too, which told me a lot. Once we'd gone over the entire plan for the confrontation with Sean, I got the okay to set up in the barn, and Abby went to the chicken coop. She was not pleased to have drawn the building filled with chicken poop. I told her she was more than welcome to switch to the barn where the cow poop was, and she quickly changed her tune. (laughs) Chicken poo suddenly became fashionable. Gilbert drifted back into the trees and set himself up a reasonably comfortable position where he could cover us with his trusty AK. I had a good view through a space in the frame of the barn door. And then 
the waiting started. I think it was about 3.30 when they arrived. Two Humvees loaded up with people. A quick head count showed me Sergeant Mike and officer, turned out to be Lieutenant Daniels, plus three National Guardsmen. And with them was Sean and another asshole that looked like he'd previously been a big fan of polo shirts and golf. As soon as they got out of the Humvees, Ollie and Lenny came outside to meet them, and it started. I couldn't hear everything. From what I could see, Lenny and the lieutenant laid it all out for him, and he took it poorly. At one point, he looked like he'd shat himself and started looking all over the place. I think he was looking for me. I laughed. Weasley round eyeglasses wearing cocksucker. Finally, he went quiet when his asshole friend Chad held on to him to steady him. After a bit, it looked like we'd get out of it clean, but something happened. Sean said something to Ollie, and Ollie lost his shit. I saw Ollie charge forward, and the officer got in the way. I couldn't quite see, but there were four rapid gunshots, and the officer went down. I moved. I saw Mike coldcock Sean on the back of the head, and Sean went face down. His friend, who I later found out was Chad, backed up and fell into a snowbank. The guardsmen came rushing, and I went straight to the lieutenant. I ripped his clothes off to get at his wounds— and wound up tearing the sheet straight off my back to form a compress. I said hi to him, and he managed a hi to me. He was dying. One of the young privates went straight over to Sean and was about to kill his ass when the lieutenant managed to stop him. He asked Lenny for rope. Lenny got some bailing twine from the barn, and they hogtied Sean. His buddy Chad watched in just total horror as they did it. It was literally like watching a hog being prepared for slaughter. Everyone stood around watching Lenny do it. I mean, you could see Lenny enjoyed doing it, which told me even more about how he felt. The Ollie guy was all out of sorts and sort of wandered around. He knelt next to Daniels as I held the compress on, and Daniels kept telling him to forget what Sean said and do what your heart tells you. I don't know what Sean said to him, but it clearly broke Ollie's heart. I didn't ask. Once Sean was tied up, Daniels said to bring the two of them to the local golf course. I radioed for Patty to make her way to us, and she was there within ten minutes. Patty knew the way, and after I hopped in the truck, I plowed us a clear path a few miles out to the golf course. I cleared out the parking lot, and the soldiers got Lenny and the still-knocked-out Sean out of the Humvees. Daniels told them to tie him up to a parked car in the lot. They looped more twine around him and tied him so he could walk, but only about ten feet. They then tied Sean to Daniels, and Daniels seemed really pleased. I can recall the look on Abby and Patty's face when they figured out what Daniels had planned. Morbid stuff. The officer said a tearful goodbye to his men, and they were pretty broken up. He seemed liked by his men, and that's rare. Not a lot of officers are loved by their men. Anyway, they all said their goodbyes. I crouched down, and we talked for a few minutes. He said he was the man leading the assault that day, and he apologized for doing it. He was glad when I told him none of our people were hurt, and I apologized for killing their folks. It was a nice mea culpa moment. He seemed truly regretful, but a lot of people about to die are. I had a lot of respect for him. Before we left, I ran back to the truck and grabbed a full bottle of Jack I grabbed from the cafeteria and brought it back to him. I told him I'd brought it, and I said I'd hold him to his promise of helping me empty it. He took a swig with a wince and thanked me. I got a little blurry-eyed. When I stood up to leave, he laughed and asked me if I had handicapped Sean's golf game for him. He pointed at his knee. I said, sure, and I curb-stomped the asshole's leg right at the kneecap. He was still so unconscious he didn't wake up. Daniel seemed really pleased, and I left. The vehicles left the two dying men behind, and we went back to the farm where we'd left Lenny and Ollie behind with Chad. I'd cuffed Chad with the cuffs I found at the police station way back when. When we got back, I made all the men share a drink with me, and after a few rounds of that, I made all the women join in, too. Ollie and Lenny both took a swig, and before you know it, we were all fucking laying in the snow looking at the giant pool of blood left behind by Lieutenant Daniels. Weird moment. Bonding, no doubt. I don't know how to explain it. I mean, you go to war with someone, even someone you hate, and in the moment you hit the shit, you just understand that there's no one else you want near you having your back. And that was one of those moments. I just somehow knew, and I could see they knew that the same. 
Everyone let out the real them when we were three sheets to the wind, and with Sean out of the way, we had no barriers left to forming real friendships. Alcohol might be the key to post-apocalyptic diplomacy. Who knew? I really think these people are going to be my friends. I didn't ever think that about Brian and the Stig people. They were always, I don't know, untrustworthy somehow. Maybe it's because I met mostly ex-military folks here. I don't know. We wound up passing out that night at the farm. Lenny had plenty of space there for everyone, and after Mike sent a message back to the school that everything was okay and they'd all be back the next day, we settled in for a dinner and a drunken night's rest. I am displeased to note, Mr. Journal, that we had fresh-baked chicken out of Lenny's wood stove, and I don't remember eating a single bite of it. Figures, right? The things I do for the sake of human cohesion. Always taken one for the team. We passed out all over the place, and I must report a joyous awakening to the smells of fresh food cooking. Lenny brought in eggs for us and was cooking them up in various forms, and apparently he'd made fresh bread, too. Mr. Journal, I can't even describe to you how filthy, dirty, and sexy that food was. I seriously feel like I'm talking about porn when I think about the food. Fresh, baked, bread, eggs, protein and carbs. He also had butter. 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 (laughs) I think I need to rub one out now. Just... Wow. It was like when I got that deer back in, what, November? I forget. It has been so long, and I am still riding my butter high. I wanted to cut it up into lines and snort it. Filthy, dirty butter. Yeah, you bitch. Sexy butter. You should have seen Abby and Patty and Gilbert. Hilarious. They ate so much friggin' food. I felt bad, like we were stealing or something, but... Everyone else ate like pigs, too. This was our reward for doing the dirty work of dealing with Sean. Oh, and Chad joined in on the party, but he was clearly on the outside looking in. He spent the whole time looking on, watching, with a pained expression on his face. I felt bad for him. Oh, and there was a little romance, too. I definitely caught Abby and one of the privates talking a little too comfortably for me. Well, I mean... It's cute and cool and all, but I feel like Abby's my own kid now, and watching a 20-year-old hit on her was a little strange. Gavin seems nice enough, a little tall, a little gawky, but he seemed really nervous around her, and nervous guys are always better than cocky guys. We'll have to see how that pans out. A love affair between their people and mine might actually be nice, like a feudal lord marrying his family into the family of his rivals, bringing them together with blood relationships. Funny how things have rewound a few hundred years, eh, Mr. Journal? Like, for example, I'd fucking kill for a drawbridge and a moat for campus. If I knew a dude who could competently make bows and arrows, I'd feel hood rich. I mean, I can make a bow and arrow, but I'd be just as likely to hurt myself with it. So, during and after breakfast, we had the most honest conversation. Mike and Lenny, without doubt, were the leaders here, and I got the feeling they were the leaders for the most part back at the school. Mike was really adamant about making sure the women were brought on board, because up until that day, Sean had run the joint like a harem. He made sure to whisper that in front of me, too. He pointed at Ollie. Made me think about the girl Ollie said he had the hots for. Sucks. Anyway, Mike really wanted to make sure they were represented— After all, he said they had 37 people left, and of that, there were 27 women. Talk about Team Vagina. That's like League Vagina. A whole box's worth of vagina, if you will. I bet they're tight, but they might be loose, too. You can never tell till you get close to them. (laughs) Innuendo much? I wonder if any of them are my type. Naughty Adrian. No, bad boy. We left afternoon with the understanding that we'd be available via radio on Channel 4, the same one they used. We tested walkies, and ones we used are compatible. We also set a date for them to come visit us at the campus on the 25th, which is three days away. They said their biggest need was fresh water. I told them we could use more 5.56 ammo and more 9mm. Gas or diesel would rock, and any new sorts of food would be terrific, too. 
in town like they are there on town water, which has not pumped for them in months. They've been melting snow, but when the snow melts in spring, they'll be relying on rain, and that's random. I told them we have artisan water, and as long as we can work out a fair trade system for eggs, milk, chicken, and ammo, or medical care, we'd make sure they always had fresh water from us, at least until they could secure a more local supply. Mike and Lenny agreed that a trade system would be awesome until at least spring. We also talked about mutual supply concerns like gasoline and diesel. They said they'd gotten a lot of fuel, but their furnace at the school ran on diesel, and so did their Humvees. Double dipping sucks. The expression burning the candle at both ends comes to mind, and it's damned appropriate. After spring, we'd need to find something else to barter with, which is cool. I really like that idea. It forces us to be productive. Yay, work is freedom. Communism for the win. We've got farmland on campus, and between Lenny's fields and our fields, we can crop rotate to make sure we're always growing the important stuff, and we've always got trade material between the groups. It could really work out for everyone. Kind of exciting, actually. I feel a little dopey being a water seller, though. (laughs) We left them on a great note. The drive back was also amazingly easy, as we found out they had no patrols, no defenses, and nothing stopping us from simply rolling into town the whole time. Talk about wasted time, right? When we were able to drop the plow and clear the tougher spots on the road out, life was much easier. Trips back and forth will be pretty fast. We passed and killed three more undead on Route 18, and three more after that on Auburn Lake Road. It definitely seems like they're making their way from downtown to campus. I got a sick feeling sooner or later here we're going to be dealing with large numbers of undead. Makes me want to get some serious trades for ammo going on. Mike said they had a lot of ammo for their M4s in storage, and I would love to get a few hundred rounds. So, yeah, Sean's dead, I think. I told Mike I wanted him to double-check the golf course to make sure the lieutenant and Sean were both put down in the right way, and he said he'd take care of it. Once he confirms to me that Sean's dead, I might dance a jig. So, the plan now is to try and relax a bit and get some rest past ten days have been a motherfucker of stress and activity, and I desperately need to take it relatively easy here. We're not posting guard in Hall A tonight, and Gilbert's staying here in Hall E with us. Gilbert's worried his house will get attacked by too many zombies for him to deal with. Makes sense. His defenses are good for two or three zombies, but any more than that and he might have trouble. Hall E is pretty much a fortress versus the undead now. Go me. Gonna try and sleep in a bit tomorrow. Then maybe take the bow out and see if I can clear out some undead on Auburn Lake Road for archery practice. I need to get some bow time in. How do I spell relief, Mr. Journal? S-E-A-N-I-S-D-E-A-D. Adrian. February 25th. Long time no see, Mr. Journal. I needed to take a break from recording for a day or so. I'm tired, and the last couple of days haven't really been all that exciting around here. I mean, after the end of the world, what's exciting and what's normal is kind of fucked up, so I guess I should say things have been less exciting than they have been, but still much more exciting than would have been normal last year. Better. The last three days have been a mixed bag. It's mostly good because the stress of dealing with Westfield as a serious threat is largely gone. I mean, yeah, we're still worried to some extent, but the feeling of dread is gone, and we've got some serious hope now. Our first trade meeting today was pretty fantastic. More on that later. The unintended, kind of unexpected side effect of the Westfield situation having been handled is the fact that Abby and Patty seem to have come to the sudden and overwhelming realization their family is gone. A young boy and a father have been torn from them for a reason we haven't been able to decipher. I would have bet cash on Sean's people haven't taken the torch to Stig, but Mike over in Westfield says it couldn't have possibly been them. That doesn't leave a lot of targets to point fingers at. Patty now thinks there was an accident in the fuel area, which I guess is possible. It just seems too massive an explosion to be an accident. I don't know what to think. I can say there have been a lot of tears here lately, and some of those have been my own. It's so painful to watch a mother and daughter weep for those they've lost. 
It's hard to even describe how it feels without starting to get all emotional myself. Brings me right back to how I feel about Cassie being gone. I mean, it's hard to describe. I don't know how else to describe it. I, I miss my family a lot, too, when I watch Abby and Patty. I wonder if they're thinking the same things about me. I hope they're all right, and I hope that someday we can be reunited, but as they say, I don't think that's in the cards. All I can do is hope for the best, and that one day everything will be revealed in a positive light. Turn that frown upside down, right? Morose motherfucker, aren't I? So, what's been happening? Nice of you to ask, Mr. Journal. I've managed some pretty excellent sleep, which is a great change of pace. Dreams have been pretty straightforward, too, which is a lot of it. I'm sure the stress of the Westfield issue having passed over is a huge part of it, too. We've done some legwork here on campus, too, which is scary fucking business lately. As I've been saying for the past, what, 20 days? The undead from downtown have been trickling onto campus. It's usually two or three at a time, and we've done a good job of catching them at the bridge, but a few have gotten through when we weren't looking. Plus, there's always the chance that they're walking across the frozen lake. Come to think of it, I should check the lake for footprints in the snow. Anyway, moving about on campus is almost like it was back in June and July. There are undead all about, and we've instituted a no-one-alone rule. Gilbert has defied it at every opportunity to go home, but trying to tell Gilbert what to do is a lot like trying to herd cats. I can't be too worried about him. I did a fuel oil check on Hall E and Hall A. We're about halfway through the tank on Hall E, and Hall A is still almost full. Fortunately, administration had the oil topped off in the summer when the prices must have been lower. If we've gone through half the oil in Hall E already, then we've got enough to last the rest of this winter. That's great news. If we can find another wood stove sometime soon, then we can install it in Hall E, and between wood and oil, we'll be set for perhaps two or three winters just on the fuel we've got on campus, let alone the home heating oil and the houses in just this neighborhood. I didn't check the school building or the classroom-style buildings. Hall B, Hall C, and Hall D all had three quarters or better in their tanks. That's a lot of fuel. We should be all set for heating oil if we can figure out a way to siphon it up and out of the tanks. What does concern me is gasoline. Going back and forth to Westfield all those days did our fuel supply no fucking favors. I think I mentioned before that we'd need to look at diesel soon, and that's a harsh reality we need to deal with in a week or two. Well, I suppose we could check out the gas station that's a mile or two from the one we'd been using, but that's heading towards downtown— And frankly, I really do not want to head that way until we've got a plan to deal with the undead coming our way from that way. For the moment, our plan is to conserve gas. Simply don't go anywhere if we can avoid it. We've got plenty of food for the moment, and there's nothing pressing that we need to do downtown other than getting fuel. And we're better off picking off stragglers making their way up to campus than we would be if we made a trip back into a gigantic mass of undead and then leading them all back here in wholesale fashion. Come to think of it, that might not be a bad idea. Hall E is a fucking fortress, and with a little more work, we could make it basically zombie-proof. We could lead the whole fucking crew right back up here into some kind of trap, then take them all out with our own massive zombie eradication plan. Huh. Food for thought. So, the last two days were pretty mundane. Like I said, checking fuel and oil and making sure any zombies that made their way onto campus were killed and their bodies relocated to the now sizable body pile out near staff housing. We're trying to use the new bow and my longsword as much as possible, but we've broken two arrow shafts the past two days, and that seems shitty. So melee's the way, and Abby and Patty aren't that hot with the physical stuff yet. Abby's skinny as a rail, and Patty's getting near fifty. And with her healing ribs, she's still a little sore. Once again, Adrian's grunt labor to the rescue. But the occasional gunshot is actually a good thing, as it leads a few more our way. As long as it's small groups, this is very containable. Even a group of twenty would be fine. Makes me want to think about the whole leading a shitload of them up here plan. Earlier today, the Westfield crew arrived at noon. 
Gilbert decided he'd make a large dinner for them in Hall A, which I thought was a good idea. It's a neutral site on campus that shows we have our shit together, and yet still doesn't let them into our last bastion of strength, Hall E. Mike drove and brought one Humvee with him, which I thought was great. I was honestly expecting a large show of force, but that kind of goes to show you how he feels about us. If he didn't trust us, he'd have rolled in with two trucks. Binge drinking after the death of an enemy is a relationship builder, I guess. Gilbert had prepared some canned hams in the spirit of the ones I made for Valentine's. I didn't know we had so many. I'm wondering if he brought one from home or something. Not that I'm complaining or anything. He made a glaze similar to the one I made, which definitely made me think he had ham envy. Mashed potatoes, a can of cranberry relish, and a can of asparagus later, and we had a regular old feast. Mike brought three people with him. Gavin Russell, one of the soldiers who came out to the farm on the 20th, Lisa Goldman, their physician's assistant and resident doctor, and a chick named Mallory Malone. Here's my full take on the new people. Gavin is about 20 years old, and before the world shit the bed, he was probably always in trouble and joined the guard as a way to pay bills. Now with military skills and a fairly tough attitude, he's a keeper here. He's tall, an inch taller than me at least, and has a buzz cut. He's good-looking too, so Abby says, and incidentally the two of them talk the entire time. Romance is in the air. You should have seen Patty's face. <laughs> Murderous. But she also seemed happy about Abby talking to another guy. The plight of a parent, I suppose. Lisa Goldman is early to mid-forties, I think. According to her dinner table talk, she was a PA at one of the local Westfield clinics and was instrumental in getting it emptied of supplies. She said Westfield is well-stocked for meds and such, and in a pinch, they can bring a generator to the clinic for more substantial procedures. She's kind of nervous because there are two women due in spring over there. One is due in late April and the other late in May. Kind of neat to think about babies being born. Makes me want to go back to the grocery store and get the formula. I remember leaving a shitload of it there. Oh, she's got shoulder-length pitch black hair, is kind of pretty, and looks super Jewish. No cape or anything, but I can totally see her in Miami Beach. I like her. Mallory is my new favorite person. Mal, as she prefers, is maybe 25 years old. She's a hairdresser, very funny, very witty, sharp on her toes, and... From what I gathered at the lunch table, she had a pretty rough go of the whole surviving June thing. I think she holed up in her salon eating snacks for a few days and wound up quite literally fighting her way to the school using scissors. That is a story I want to hear more about. Mal has very nice short brown hair, no shit right, and is fairly pretty, although not in any special way. Mike brought them specifically for separate reasons. Lisa offered free physicals, which everyone gladly took up, and happily we all passed with flying colors. I am proud to announce, Mr. Journal, that a woman looked at my penis. It's been a while, and I'm pretty happy for myself. Patty's rib is tender, but we knew that already. Oh, and Gilbert is old. Surprise. Gavin demanded he be brought along strictly to try and talk to the hot chick, who we discovered was Abby. Abby was not informed of Gavin's desires towards her by anyone else, but for a fairly shy guy, Gavin made excellent headway talking to her. Abby is very forward, but also shy at the same time, and I really think they hit it off. Gavin was impressed by Abby's survivor story, I think, and well, she was impressed by him being the first guy to show any interest in her in... forever. Mallory came because, in Staff Sergeant Mike McCarthy's opinion, our personal grooming standards were sorely lacking. Mallory gave us all haircuts. I barely noticed that my hair was hanging in front of my eyes. I gave myself a haircut with a little trimmer back in September, but I have completely bricked doing it again. It was nice to have a professional give me a haircut. In honor of my boy Kevin, I had her give me a high and tight. The girls said I looked stupid, but it brought back memories. Mike seemed suitably impressed when I shared my ranger school info. Apparently, he always wanted to go, but never got around to it. I told him it was overrated. Lots of running around carrying heavy shit, swimming around carrying heavy shit, and falling down carrying heavy shit. Incidentally, that sums up almost all training in the military. As far as trading shit goes, we definitely sealed our first deal today. Mike said they desperately need fresh water, and he brought about ten empty-gallon jugs with him to show. 
I swear he almost cried when I felled him from the tap in the kitchen of Hall E. He watched me wash my hands, too, and I think he almost tried to stop me. I was wasting water, don't you know? So we put forth the ten-gallon jugs of water, and in return he dropped a dozen eggs and two bottles of milk. He's got a more or less endless supply of those, and we've got a more or less endless supply of water. Seems fair to me. Now, for stuff that isn't endless, we can haggle, and we did. He said they were getting really low on soap and toothpaste and general hygiene products. And wouldn't you know, I've got a shitload. I ponied up three tubes of toothpaste, four bars of soap, eight sticks of deodorant, some partially used, one container of gold bond medicated powder, and three eight-roll packages of decent toilet paper. These are all consumables. In trade, Mike offered up a crate containing two M2A1 ammo cans of 556 for my gun. For those of you with no military experience, that's 1,680 rounds of 556. Shaboing. Totally answered my needs for the M15 for some time. I felt like that was more than fair for the stuff I gave up. I told him we'd be super interested in getting chickens down the line, and he said he'd be super interested in eating some venison down the line, so I think I might spend some time in the woods coming up here. I'd kill for some goddamn chicken right now. I've got barbecue sauce coming out the asshole in the cafeteria, and man, just thinking about that makes me drool some. So the whole afternoon was positive, and the entire time no undead came on campus, which was nice. Made the campus seem a lot more secure than it has been lately. Mike complimented us on what he thought was a great spot and a job well done. He invited us to come visit them for a similar trade on March 1st, which we're planning for already. He said, if possible, to bring more water and venison if we've got any. He said they're really going through laundry detergent as well, and they'd be willing to trade for that too. I know I left some behind in the houses in the area, and we've got a bunch here too, so that'll be a nice trade for us. Certainly makes me want to hit more houses for their contents. Fucking zombies, though. Mike and company left and said they were having emergency elections on March 2nd, and we were more than welcome to attend, although we couldn't vote, which makes sense. I told him we'd be in Westfield for the first, and we'd see what happened that day. Who knows what the weather will bring. Shit, it's been almost 50 here in the past few days. Probably be 20 below next week. Fucking weather. And that was that. Everyone was really happy this evening. Gilbert seemed pleased with the meeting, and the lunch went over well. We're planning on having pancakes tomorrow, made with fresh eggs and milk. Oh, dear. Just, oh, dear. Adrian. February 27th. Hello, hello, how you doing? Oh, that's awesome. I'm fine, thanks for asking. How are the Knicks doing? I think they're all dead, Mr. Journal. What's that? The Red Wings? Yeah, probably skating on thin ice. Hardy fucking har. Yeah, not much going on here if you didn't get the drift. Like I said in the last entry, we're staying here on campus and just taking care of business. Undead roaming up the road have been worrisome. We're actually at the point where yesterday morning we're back to stationing someone in Hall A with the TAC-22 to take him out. It's a steady stream of the bastards now, almost two or three an hour. Abby got a marker board and put it up in the room where we're at, and we're currently keeping score. Patty has 14 kills, Abby has 11, and I've got eight. Gilbert claims to have killed 3,000, but we're pretty sure he's full of shit. Only pretty sure, though. You can never really tell with that guy, crafty bastard. Otis has been good, thankfully. He ran and hid when the Westfield folks were here the other day and spent a day or so in seclusion afterwards. He's been out and about lately and pretty affectionate. My haircut makes my head cold as hell. I've taken to wearing my little knit winter cap around everywhere. The girls keep telling me it's a lot better than having to look at the haircut. I've told them to eat my ass multiple times lately, and despite my insistence, they have yet to actually toss my salad. If they keep picking on my ranger haircut, I will be forced to retaliate with pseudo-violence. I might throw one of them down and force-feed them my stinker. That'll teach them. It's nice that we can joke about shit now. Seems like the humor here has been missing for a long time. Stress is such an asshat. Speaking of asshats, basking in the aftermath of the whole Sean is dead thing, I feel really bad about calling all those people asshats. So far, they've all been really good to me. That Chad guy seemed like a douche, but I think he was just a sycophant. 
I do feel bad lumping them all together with Sean. I'm happy, though, because in the big attack that failed here by Sean, we actually killed almost his entire base of supporters. His failed attempt to remove those three people who didn't like him during the gas station thing backfired, too. I think he did more to kill himself than anything we did, really. We were just the nudge. That's pretty much everything, and I've got an hour until bedtime. I kind of thought this would take longer to record, but as it turns out, there's fuck all to talk about, so... Yeah. How about I share a story from my past? Adrian's story time. Okay, Mr. Journal, I'm in a good mood, so I'll share a good story. Huh, what story? Ooh, remember way back when I mentioned that I had a friend shot in the ass and that the story was a winner? Well, here it is. In May of 2004, Kevin and I were in Baghdad doing counterinsurgency operations with our unit. Most of our days, we rolled around Baghdad in up-armored Humvees, sweating our balls off. Most days, we'd take small arms fire that pinged off the trucks, and half the time, especially towards the end of our tour, we'd get hit by some form of explosion. Most popular were IEDs and the occasional VBIED. Once we were hit by a DBIED, that's a donkey-born improvised explosive device. That made a mess, man. We were lucky on most of our patrols in 2003. We only had a few casualties and no deaths in our unit until December. In late April, I think, we started to do a lot of patrols on foot. Handshaking was important, and that was about when the real bastard part of the insurgency was kicking off. I remember it was about when the Blackwater bullshit went down and the whole Fallujah mess got rolling. Anyway, our unit was deployed on foot for about a 10-hour patrol, and Myself, Kevin, and a buddy of ours named Patrick suddenly took accurate fire from a sniper position. We'd been going down a street that was maybe 15 feet wide, and when we went for cover, the three of us dove into a tiny-ass alcove on the side of a building. All of the guys in our unit took cover, and for about two hours, our entire unit was pinned down, waiting for another fire team to maneuver on the sniper. So, about the time we were supposed to get some relief by the other fire team finding the sniper... They got pinned down about a block or two away by foot mobiles, and then we hear that we're about to be surrounded, too. Now, clearly, that's fucking bad. We're canned up like sardines and being hedged in on all sides by people who are fucking excited about hacking your head off. We're starting to discuss eating bullets instead of being captured. So finally, our LT decides we need air support, and the only thing he can get approved is a retasked Marine Cobra. But they were like 30 minutes away, and Patrick has to take a shit. Kevin and I are like, dude, just shit yourself. Straighten out a fucking leg and shake it into the damn street out the bottom of your pant leg. Patrick's all prissy and shit, and he starts getting loony about having to take a dump. He's already sweating from the heat, and I'm pretty sure his sweat started to sweat from having to take a dump. At this point, our whole unit, stuck in the street, is yelling at him to either hold it or shit himself. Do not go in the street. Finally, Patrick snaps and wiggles his fucking trousers down and quite literally proceeds to hang his ass out in the street to launch his load. Well, if you can picture it from a sniper's point of view, this snow-white ass cheek hangs itself out into plain view and starts to drop a deuce. What would you do? Now, for the record, anyone who shoots a friend of mine is automatically an asshole. I mean, that's pretty cut and dried, right? but I gotta hand it to the Haji with the rifle because he shot Patrick right square in one butt cheek, threw it right past his ass crack and straight on through the other butt cheek. Now, we saw the bullet whiz by because it was a fucking tracer round. The burning of the tracer instantly cauterized his wounds and just like you'd imagine, Patrick goes straight backwards and manages to fall right into the pile of turds he'd fired off into the street a few seconds prior. Now, He's shot in the naked ass, and he's fallen into his own shit smears on a Baghdad slum street. Our entire unit, to a fucking man, just sat there making the fucking O face. No one could believe that just happened. I mean, it was horrible and hilarious all at the same time. Patrick's feet are now pointed at Kevin and I, and almost simultaneously we grab his feet and drag him back into the tiny ass alcove we were in. The whole time, Patrick is screaming bloody murder. My fucking ass! Holy shit, my fucking ass! They shot me in the fucking asshole! Oh my god, my asshole! Hilarious. 
I grabbed Patrick's arm and got him turned sideways so his head was in the alcove, and wouldn't you know, Patrick wasn't done shitting. Luckily for me, Pat's business end was facing toward Kevin, and for the next five minutes, Patrick proceeded to empty his bowels out of his three assholes, two of them brand spanking new, by the way, all over Kevin's boots. Straight up fountaining bloody poop all over Kevin's feet. God, it was terrible, and the whole time Patrick is screaming that his ass is on fire, and holy shit, my ass. The LT manages to speed up the Cobra, and about five minutes later we spot the sniper's position, and the Cobra fires off some chain gun rounds and puts the fucking sniper down. While we're cheering on the marine aviation support we were getting, our LT calls for armored evac, and about 45 minutes later some Bradley AFVs and an Abrams show up and get us the fuck out of there. Patrick got taken to the hospital at Balad, and when we finally got to see him there a few days later, one of our guys donated a purple heart so he could have two, one for each ass cheek. Oddly enough, he didn't think that was funny at all. Having to be on his stomach all day for the foreseeable future, as, as well as having to eat a largely liquid or soft diet, kind of put a damper on his spirits. Funny part, too, is that when he was about to be removed for transport out— Balad got hit by mortars, and he had to run all stiff-ass to take cover. I mean, hell, how much worse could it get, right? Apparently that reopened his wounds and set him back at least a week on the healing. Poor asshole. <laughs> I heard from him a year or two later, and I'm happy to report that he healed up nicely. I hope wherever he is, he is keeping his rebuilt ass in one piece. I love that story. Tomorrow is another do-nothing day for us. I think we're going to chill out here and assemble a potential trade package to bring to Westfield. We need to get more water containers to transport back and forth, and I know elsewhere on campus there are empty jugs, milk, orange juice, etc. Not sure what else to bring other than what they suggested. I'm pretty sure they've got a lot of what we have as well, so it makes sense to not bring shit they've got extra of. I'd like to get some hunting time in. Maybe I can do that tomorrow with the bow. I don't have a tree stand, but if I get out there early enough, maybe I can snag a deer. Unlikely, but here's to hoping. I'll slap another entry in when I get some time and energy, Mr. Journal. Hope you enjoyed this short journey into Adrian's past. Adrian. March 2011. March 1st. Mr. Journal, there are a lot of people in Westfield. I mean, a lot. Well, there's less than 40, but that seems like so many people. It was insane. People everywhere. And they were nice, too. Can you imagine it? Nice people? Thought they'd all been eaten. Weird stuff. Yesterday, we had an all-hands meeting and decided that I would go to Westfield with Patty. Knowing what we know about the huge amount of women there, we felt it'd be a good idea to bring one of our own women Abby was too young, we felt, and Patty was pretty adamant on cock-blocking her and Gavin from talking again. Well, at least for now. Gilbert said he was feeling a little meh yesterday, and today he seemed kind of under the weather. I wonder if he's getting a cold from having met the new folks the other day. Nothing like a good old germ-sharing event to shove everyone's health into the toilet. It's all good, though. We really need to get those germs anyway. Otherwise, we'll get hit by some super germ down the road, and we'll all die or something. We got him some juice to drink, and Abby babysat him all day today. As for shit to bring, when we last met, Mike mentioned that they really needed laundry detergent and hygiene supplies. Obviously, I didn't get a deer yesterday. I did go out walking in the woods, but the damn snow is so deep I couldn't get anywhere. I'm thinking I might do a sip around with one of the snow machines to pack a trail or two so I can at least get around a bit easier. So, yesterday afternoon, Patty and I went the length of Auburn Lake Road and scavenged for laundry detergent. As it happens, I left behind eight things of it. Patty also grabbed an ass ton more clothing, as well as perfume and cologne, which wound up to be pretty fruitful. Mr. Journal, women love clothing. They also like to smell nice. They're also willing to trade well for those things. We found six more jugs of water to fill for them as well, and I grabbed another tube of toothpaste. Gilbert made us bring one of the containers of salt I got a while back, which also turned out to be a great idea. Auburn Lake Road yesterday and today was a little treacherous. The weather's been fine, a little cold maybe, but the real danger is the steady stream of fucking dead people. We had to kill six more yesterday while we were checking houses. Fortunately, they were really spread out, and Patty was able to pop them with her twenty-two. 
I wound up killing one with that little hatchet I have. I do not like using that hatchet, man. Got stuck in the head of that Terra chicken Westfield, and got stuck in the head of the dude I killed yesterday, too. I really need to source out a machete or a more substantial short sword. My kingdom for a kukri. The drive to Westfield was uneventful. We timed it to arrive right before lunch, like Mike asked us. I knew roughly how to get to the school from my recon trips before the Sean bullshit, and really, all I had to do was follow the plowed roads. They're only moving on a few roads, really, and they all lead to the school or the farm. Patty pointed out where her house was, and we stopped there after our visit. I'll share that after. Mike filled us in when he was on campus on how to get into the school, and we did what he told us to. They have two gaps in their vehicle wall that are blocked by a truck or van they can back out of the way. We pulled up to the gate, flashed our lights, honked our horn, waved, etc. Then we drive slowly around the school to lead the undead away from the gate. When we got to the opposite side of the school, we gun it, and by then they have the van moved out of the way. We pull in, they move the van back, and voila— We're in there like swimwear. The whole time, one or both of the guards on the roof have their rifles trained on the gate to shoot any stragglers that make their way inside the parking lot. We parked, and literally Mike came out to greet us with an entourage of people, mostly women, as advertised. I felt so popular. I think the women have been a little starved for fresh male meat, and I really think, as a tall, masculine fella, I was what the doctor ordered. I had to play hard to get all day from the flirting women— It was really weird getting hit on like that, too. It's been a while since I've been hit on at all, let alone treated like a piece of meat. Huh. Food for thought, right? Patty was well-received. She actually knew two of the women from around town, and once in with those two, it was like a gossip festival. During the lunch we shared, the girls just chattered on like squirrels sharing their best nut hideouts. They were talking so fast I could barely make out what they were saying. Prada this, zombie that. Tuned them right the hell out. Mike and I laughed. I met a lot of folks today, and to a one, they were nice people. I saw that Chad guy again, too. He kind of sat all by himself in the corner. I think he's fruits of the poisonous tree, if you know what I mean. Being Sean's flunky is no longer cool or beneficial for him. I think he was also one of those guys who had a job that's entirely useless now. Didn't seem to me like anyone even spoke to him the whole time I was there. I actually took the time to point out to Mike that he could be a problem if he was kept ostracized from the group. Social outcasts often lash out, and the last thing a place like this needs is an unhappy person with access to weapons. God forbid he got to their fuel or food supply and decided to exact some kind of vengeance. I suggested Mike or someone actively try and get him involved with their culture. No sense holding a grudge against him because he played the cards he was given. Not sure if Mike agreed with me or not, but at least I said my piece. I was thanked, a lot. I think they all really wanted to get rid of Sean. I seriously mean all when I say it, too. Everyone there seemed to hate the guy. Sometimes all it takes is a pebble to move a mountain, I guess. I'm glad no one seemed hostile towards us. Lots of talk as well rotated around their election tomorrow. It seemed Mike was the hands-down favorite to win it all, but a few folks suggested that Goldman, the doctor, take on the job. She's pretty smart. No shit, right? And personable as well. I think she'd do just fine. Gavin, to his credit, hung on Patty's ass the whole time asking about Abby. It's cute. He obviously likes her. He's also taken the initiative and is talking to Patty directly, which is pretty ballsy. I think some of the girls in the school went to bat for him as well, saying he's a really nice kid. Patty's stance on the cock blocking might be softening. We'll see when we meet him again. Mike gave me the tour of the first floor and most of the second floor as well. He pointed out all their housing areas, communal areas, and general resources. He said their food and weaponry were mostly stashed in the basement under lock and key and that I wasn't that good a friend yet. I had to laugh at him. I like Mike a lot. We concluded our day with the trade. Patty was our chief negotiator. She's really good at it, especially when it comes to selling the women the stuff they want. They were mega moist over the clothes and perfume, The laundry detergent went over well, too. When it was all said and done, Patty managed to score a crank radio for us to use, ten gallons of gasoline, two more bottles of milk, another dozen eggs, and a chicken. Luckily, it was a dead chicken, otherwise I'd have to kill it, and I really wasn't in the mood to kill a chicken. Don't get me wrong, though. I'll kill the shit out of a chicken right now if I have to. We're going to eat it tomorrow for dinner.
When we left, we agreed that we would meet again on the 7th at our place at about noon. Being able to sit down and share a meal, I think, is really nice. Eating together is a bonding experience. Plus, it allows us to shoot the shit about whatever before we get down to business. We stopped at Patty's family home on the way out. The roads weren't plowed, so I dropped the plow on our truck and cleared the way. Patty got pretty emotional as we got out of the truck. I had to be on guard doubly because we'd driven by undead to get there, and Patty was just checked out entirely. She was on autopilot hardcore. I had to give her a hug and just hold her a couple of times when we were inside because she just couldn't handle the memories. The house had been emptied of most of the usable stuff by other people, but she was able to get some pictures and mementos that meant something to her and Abby. Seeing pictures of Randy and Charles was sort of painful for me, and I can't even imagine what it was like for her. To lose them so suddenly and painfully like that, uh, awful shit, Mr. Journal. I lost myself there for a minute. Wasn't sure what else to say. It's tough talking about this stuff. I can deal with violence, I can deal with physical pain, and I can deal with gore, but when the emotional stuff is put on me, I can feel cracks forming in the Great Wall of Adrian. Maybe that's the part of me that's still human. Maybe that's the part of me I need to foster instead of hide. I don't know anymore. It's funny that I have these weird retrospective moments every now and then. Maybe that's just normal. I wish I had this life figured out. I want so badly to earn whatever time I have left, but it's like I'm being tested over and over. I try to do the right thing, but at every turn, it seems like I'm either forced into making a decision that no matter what, I feel terrible about after. Maybe that's exactly what's happening. This is all just a big fucking test. I should have gone to church as a kid, bottom line. After Patty gathered what she could from her empty home, we left. I had to kill a shambler in the yard, which was sort of ugly. It was a huge bastard, and Patty sort of freaked because it was one of her co-workers before everything. She was so out of it from crying and whatnot, she actually greeted the guy before she realized what was going on. I didn't want to mess around with the hatchet, so I just capped him with the Glock. Patty stood there in complete shock as he bled out into the driveway. We were off after that. Our trip home was uneventful, though we did hit five more undead on Route 18 and Auburn Lake Road. I feel more confident using the plow to hit them now that I've done it a bit. I can set the plow to the correct height, and I know about what speed I should be at to do it safely. It's still gross as balls, and I think we need to take the time to clear the bodies out of the road shortly. It's starting to feel like a morbid four-mile-long string of juicy speed bumps. Abby, as you'd expect, got really emotional when we got back and saw all the stuff. All of her stuff. She got really angry, too, at one point. She's definitely got a temper, that one. I guess her beef was about the fact that her mom essentially disturbed the sanctity of their old house. Almost like Patty was a tomb robber or something. I can see that, actually. I mean, some things are best left as memories, I suppose. Makes me start to evaluate whether or not forgetting might actually be an effective coping mechanism. Bah, forgetting isn't an option. My dreams will see to that. Next couple of days, I think I'm going to beat some snowmobile paths into the woods around here. I'm betting that'll draw more of the undead into the area, which might not be a bad thing. They continue to meander towards campus at this rate. They're just making it easy for us to kill them. If I'm a little lucky... I'll get some additional time behind the bow and maybe get a deer or five. I bid you adieu, Mr. Journal. Godspeed. Adrian. March 3rd. Something's wrong. Something is very wrong. I always knew there was something going on just behind stage left, and somewhere up above in this grand theater of life, someone has just started turning on lights... I tell you what, this isn't Romeo and Juliet. It isn't Cats, either. It's a fucking freak show. Campus has been sliding downhill since the explosion at Stig, and between last night and tonight, things have gotten much fucking worse. We can't leave Hall E right now. There are too many undead outside on campus. At about 3 a.m. last night, I woke up from an exceptionally fucking strange dream. In the dream, I was sitting in a fairly small white room with two other people in it with me. 
We were arranged around a small white round table, and in the center of that table there were three items. The first item was a gleaming silver sword. The second item was a small book. The third item was some kind of religious symbol. I think it was either a cross or maybe a star of David, but it could have been a statue of Buddha, too. I don't remember now. I just remember it was religious or something. I remember looking at the two other people sitting at the table with me, but I can't remember who they were. I remember now that they looked very familiar, but for the life of me, I, I simply cannot place their names or faces. We couldn't have been more than three feet from one another, but no matter how loud I shouted, they couldn't hear me. It was like there was a whole world between us instead of just an arm's reach. At some point, and it felt like forever, to be honest, the table slowly started spinning, and after a million slow revolutions, the table came to a stop with the three items arranged directly in front of us. The person to my left had the cross, or the crescent, or whatever it was in front of them, and the person to my right had the sword. In front of me was the book. The items slid all on their own a few inches until they were almost touching us, and then I woke up. When I woke up, I was here in Hall E, but things were different. The room I was sleeping in was larger than normal, and I was in a double bed instead of a single. In the bed with me was Cassie. When I woke up, I sat up like a bolt, and she rested her hand on my thigh, and I just knew instantly I was safe. I sat back and rested my head on the pillow, and she rolled over to face me. I'm crying, thinking about seeing her face just a breath away is breaking my fucking heart right now. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't think there's enough man left in me anymore to deal with this shit. I'm just not... I'm just not strong enough. She leaned in and kissed my forehead and rested against me, pressing her warm body against mine. I can can still feel her right now. My skin is still tingling with her warmth, and I have the scent of her hair fixated in my mind. I wasn't quite aware I was still dreaming, and for a moment I forgot about the way things really are. I know in my dream we sat there for what seemed like hours, but when she finally spoke again it was all taken away from me in an instant. Adrian, it's almost time to wake up. Her voice was like a spring breeze in the morning, right after the weather turns warm for the first time and, you know, summer's really coming. I I said back, no, there's still plenty of time left to be together. She let out the longest sigh I'd ever heard and said back to me, our time is over, baby. There's someone else out there for you. I remember opening my eyes in the dream and looking at her, I couldn't stop wondering why she would say that to me. We loved each other. I looked long and hard at her, and there was no anger, no malice, and no sense of disappointment. She looked at me with love and affection, and... Jesus, I can't do this. And she looked at me, and I knew she was dead. I I know it more than I know how to breathe. I know it more than I feel the guilt in my heart over not having gone for her that day. It's my burden to bear for the rest of my days, and I don't need to see her body to know it. When I looked at her again in the dream, I had tears rolling down my cheek into my pillow. She nodded at me. She knew what I was thinking. I broke down sobbing. She pushed herself against me firmly and draped an arm around me. If I think about it now, I can still feel it on me, that welcome pressure that tells you someone's there and that everything will be okay. You're safe. I have you. The last thing she said before I snapped awake was this. You must prepare yourself. Trials and tribulations are the way of the world now. Resting is not a part of what judges are worth. Everything happens for a reason, Adrian. Sometimes we don't understand when things happen, and sometimes we never understand. Just understand I always loved you, will always love you, and that you're needed by more than just me now. Someone must be the memory. 
I woke up to Patty and Abby standing above me trying to wake me. They tell me I was screaming bloody murder. They said I was screaming Cassie's name over and over and crying. I don't recall much of that because the girls got me sleeping again and I woke up with the dawn. My pillow was still damp from the crying and unless I've gone completely insane, my pillow smells like her. For a moment I sat there on the side of my bed cradling my pillow in my arms, inhaling deeply, trying to absorb her smell. Maybe I have gone insane. Patty and Abby couldn't sleep that night after waking me. They were too shaken by the sight of me screaming to get back to sleep. When I made my way downstairs to eat something, they looked at me as if I'd been stabbed. I guess I looked horrible. Patty gave me a glass of juice and cooked me an egg. I vaguely remember eating it. I think I enjoyed it. I don't remember, to be honest. At some point this morning, after I finished eating, I realized that Patty and Abby were sitting at the table with me. I guess I was so out of it, I didn't notice they were there. Patty slid around the table to me, and for a moment, I had a flashback to my dream. Three people sitting around a table, right? But something was off. This wasn't what I was dreaming about. Mother Williams put her hand on top of mine, and we sat there for a minute in silence. Finally, she asked me the million-dollar question. Adrian, what did you dream about last night? Her voice was quiet. Abby leaned in closer and rested her elbows on the table. I told them everything, just like I told you, Mr. Journal. While I was talking, they sat listening, and when I started to cry, they joined me. It wasn't pretty. Today was the first time I let everything out to someone about Cassie. The women were just wrecked. Cassie always used to say that the one thing she couldn't handle was watching a man cry. I think the Williams ladies might be in that same boat. I can only hope they don't judge me as I judge myself. I'm my worst critic. The hero revealed for his true nature. The coward. The sheep in wolf's clothing. Once we gathered ourselves and I'd purged the glut of emotions running through me, Patty took my hand in both of hers and got my attention. Adrian, there's something we need to tell you. I perked up and my head cleared. Usually, when someone says something like that to me, there's danger involved. What Patty said broke my heart, shattered it like glass, really. Before Charles died, he and I were having very strange dreams about people. She looked over at Abby, and then Abby spoke up. I've had some strange dreams as well. Not just like weird dreams, but like weird dreams. Abby looked very small and scared when she said that. Patty continued, Charles and I talked about them, and eventually we figured out that we were only dreaming about people we knew that had died. I didn't get it right at first, and I guess my expression told her I was lost. Adrian, have you had a dream about me at all? No. Have you dreamt about Abby? No. Abby chimed in then. What about Gilbert? Have you dreamt about Gilbert? I don't think so. It was starting to make some sense. Adrian, I didn't have a dream about Randy or Charles until after they were killed downtown. Patty let go with one hand to wipe her eyes. She was crying again. I can remember how red her eyes were. I started to nod, and before you know it, I was sobbing again. What a tough guy, huh? I don't think I can say this any more bluntly, but the living only dreaming of the dead. We sat at the table and cried and discussed it and cried some more. None of us have had a single dream about someone still alive in recent memory. It would seem as if our dreams made this switch right about the end of June, when all this started. Are we dreaming of ghosts? I can handle zombies. I can handle murderous survivors. I think, given enough time... I can even handle my guilt. I don't know if I can wrap what's left of my sanity around the idea that ghosts are in my head at night. I just don't think I can handle that. There's no real choice in the matter, though, is there? I either find a way to cope, I go insane, or I die. 
After our talk, we decided that there was no more that could be achieved on the subject. Now that it was out in the open, we could at least have dialogue about it. I geared myself up for campus patrol, and just as I was about to leave my bedroom, I caught sight of something moving outside. I hunkered down and went to the window slowly. Zombies in the middle of campus. Dozens. More than dozens. Maybe a hundred of them. Shambling, meandering, staggering, and looking directly at Hall E. I pulled my curtain aside to get a better look, and Abby burst into my doorway. She started to tell me what I already knew, but stopped when she saw me looking out the window. I grabbed my radio and called for Gilbert. He didn't realize it until he looked out a window, but his house was surrounded as well. I went down to the living room and looked out the windows over my barricades. I did a quick count, and just in the street and yard areas I counted fifty. They could see more down the way towards the bridge. The three of us all watched them out of the windows for what seemed like eternity. I don't know what to do. We need to kill them, but I'm not sure how we do that without leading all of them to our front door. I know Hall E is strong, but is it strong enough to hold back a few hundred hungry lost souls? One way or the other, I think we'll find out tomorrow. I'm very worried, though. Mike is coming here to visit us for another trade meeting the day after next. I don't want them to roll onto campus and straight into the fucking maw of doom. If they get killed now, after all we've just achieved, I'll be very, very unhappy. We've been devising plans all evening in the dark. There's enough of a charge in the batteries from the solar panels to keep the furnace going tonight. We were worried letting the gas generator run would attract them to us, but I think that's silly. They're all standing still, looking straight at this building. I just looked out the window again. They're still there, and they're still staring straight at us. I cannot even begin to tell you how creepy it is to look out the window into my formerly safe home and see a mob of undead illuminated in milky moonlight. Surreal. Tomorrow, we're going to start doing something about this. Wish us luck, Mr. Journal. With any luck at all, I'll live to record again. After I save this entry, I'm going to finish packing up everything I need if we have to relocate in a hurry. Campus might not be an option anymore. Adrian. Oh, I almost forgot. They're all holding books. Every single one of them, just one book each. And from what we can see, there's no rhyme or reason to the books. They're each simply clutching a book. Something is very wrong with the world and that's saying something this has been midnight adrian's undead diary book three volume three written by chris philbrook narrated by james foster copyright 2011 by chris philbrook production copyright 2014 by chris philbrook Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.